Parasite Eve is a 1998 survival horror action role-playing game developed and published by Squaresoft and released for the PS1, and this year marks its 20th anniversary. The game is a sequel to the Japanese novel of the same name, written by Hideki Sena. This is the first game in the Parasite Eve series. The video game adaptation was part of a resurgence in popularity in Japanese horror, sparked by the original book and was released alongside a film adaptation and two manga comics, one based on the book and the other based on the video game. The story follows New York City police officer Aya Brea. I think I'm saying that right? Over a six day span in 1997 she attempts to stop the Eva, a woman who plans to destroy the human race through spontaneous human combustion. Players explore levels set in areas of New York while utilising a plausible real-time combat system along with several role-playing game elements. Movement in the world map, which is a map of Manhattan, is limited to specific destinations. Upon the player walking over a hot spot, there is a chance of a random encounter. Enemies materialise and attack players on the same screen that they move AO around on, with no battle mode or screen being used. In battle, the game uses a plausible real-time combat system with an active time bar that sets the time that must be waited until the player can take their next action. Once the game is complete, a new game plus mode is available called the EX game. To my knowledge, this is one of the first experiences of a new game plus style mode being added into a game once you've finally completed it. Although it should be said, I never actually completed my second playthrough. It's different from the normal game in various aspects. The player has access to every item that's stored within the police station, the game begins with the final weapon and armour that the player had before ending the first game, but returns to level 1 experience. However, the biggest difference from the novel game is the addition of the Chrysler Building, a brand new location with 77 floors containing mostly random content, leading to a final boss battle with Aya's older sister, Maya. Parasite Eve received generally favourable reviews. IGN praised the game for its beautiful graphics and cinematic sequences, as well as its mature tone, but noted the game's linear plot structure. GameSpot said that the game had a cinematic look and had an astounding level of detail for real-life locations. The lack of any voice acting or singing, however, hindered the dramatic scenes, such as the opera and the subsequent mass combustion of the entire audience at the game's start. Reviews also cited that although the game broke many RPG gaming conventions, it suffered from having little replay value. The combat was compared unfavourably to Final Fantasy VII, which featured a dynamic camera instead of a fixed one. Although, it's interesting to say that if you look at the combat system they employed in Parasite Eve, how some of those elements ended up in later Final Fantasy games. So it very much was the messing around and seeing what worked and what didn't work. It just so happened that it was released at a time when people weren't really ready for this type of combat. I think it was Final Fantasy XII that finally implemented this style of combat in the Final Fantasy series. Unsurprisingly, that's one of the main Final Fantasy games that people are very much split on whether they like or dislike the combat. Parasite Eve was Squaresoft's first M-related game, and the first major American and Japanese developed collaboration for the company. And we are still to have it released in fucking Europe. Parasite Eve was followed by two video game sequels, Parasite Eve 2 in 1999 and The Third Birthday in 2010. And all three games are on the US PlayStation Network. Annoyingly, not the European PlayStation Network. Hello, ladles and jelly spoons. So, since I was sort of doing this little bit of an anniversary look into Parasite Eve, one of one of my favourite games from the 90s and you know the PlayStation age, uh, I thought I'd do a little bit of gameplay of it and sort of telling a little bit about my experiences with the game. Can we skip the intro? Although, can I just say, like this intro is probably like one of the best. I remember, I remember, like in 1998, I was watching it and I was absolutely like blown away by it. I was like, God, this is amazing. But let's skip. Anyway, Parasite Eve. Press the start button. I can't remember it. I genuinely can't remember it having a tutorial. Uh, new game. Thanks. Yeah, there we go. So. For those of you that don't know, so Parasite Eve came out in 1998 uh, in the US. Now, it never actually came out in Europe, and to this day, it still 
has never been released in Europe. I knew quite a lot of people who have played it. I played it myself because I had uh, an imported PlayStation and I could get games from several places. Uh, a place in Nottingham called Another World. It sort of did imported it sort of specialised in sort of geeky sci-fi stuff, but it also had a bit of a sideline on importing games consoles from uh, the US and Japan and stuff, and you could get imported games and, and things like that. Um, I, there was a guy at school who is interesting, who I got Parasite Eve off. Hey, 1997. And finally, there was a, a dodgy shop near where I lived where you could get imported games from and he was forever being closed down and reopened, let me tell you. Forever being busted by the police. Which was interesting because selling him, I think he used to sell chipped games as well. Um, my god, look at those graphics. I remember like when I first saw it and actually looking at it now, it has character model-esque wise, it has very Final Fantasy VIII uh, overtones, doesn't it? What's wrong? You're the one who wanted to come to the opera name. Aya Bray. Bree? Bray? Bray? Aya Bray. Age 25. Occupation NYPD officer. Oh, I forgot you could rename the main character. Let's rename her to Jeff. There we go. Jeff! Jeff Bray. 25. <laughs> oh dear. Chief. <laughs> I don't know. I just. You're right. I'll try to have more fun. You go to the opera, love. It's not fun. Aren't you glad you decided to go out with me? I even had my dad get the best seats for us tonight. So lighten up. You're gonna have a great time. You'll see. Right, oh, it's me in control. Right, can I get out of here? Do I have to go on this date? Get out of my way. Shit, no. Can I throw myself into the road? Anything to not have to be with this kind of obnoxious twat. No, I'll just run inside. Ooh. I don't remember the being circles around the base of my character. I think that might be a graphical, graphical, graphical glitch. So my uh, experience with uh, Parasite Eve. Um, yeah, I got it from this guy at school who could uh, get you imported games. Let's go in. Let's go in and watch the opera. And um, he sort of. He go, and he was like, oh, if you, if you like Resident Evil, if you like Final Fantasy, this is, this is the game for you. You'll enjoy this. And looking back on it now, I think he was only giving me his copy to borrow, but I've still got it. Um, oh, the opera. I remember this bit. It's pretty awesome. Father, please give me permission to marry Eva. I forbid it. You know well what happens if you do. Those who succumb to her beauty all die in horrible ways. You do not understand. She is the one who has suffered after the death. Swamp well, people who died alone. She is evil. God's grab her and burn her at the stake. Father, if you are sentencing her to death, then I ask that you take my life along with hers. It would. I will now sing. Yeah, because I could be wrong, but isn't it an operata if it's in English? It can only be counted as opera if it's in Italian or Spanish. I can't remember. Um, Italian, yeah. I think that's I could be wrong, but anyway. If you know, put a comment down below. Um, oh, 
Do you know what? I remember being blown away by this uh, F and B. She is evil. Look at her eyes. They're all mottled and brown, and now they've turned green. Instant evil. Oh, he's on fire. They're on fire. Yep. <laughs> now the audience realise, oh, that wasn't meant to happen. Quick, quick, my family, leave. Oh, I thought that was going to be a date. Oh. <laughs> Didn't seem that bothered. The game going to continue. Oh, get out of the way, Eve! Or oh, Jeff! Get out of the way, Jeff! Also, where's your date? He's scarpered. Say, douchebag. But yeah, I remember, like 1998, little me. Oh no, he's still there. Jeff! Jesus! Ah! Don't wanna. Oh my god! Ah! Ah! Go! Get out of here! Now! It's the best thing she's done to that tape. Oh, hang on. Hang on, let me take the slow walk up to the stage. So, yes, um, I got it off this guy. I played it. I was absolutely amazed um, by it. I think I, I think I basically just like, played it to death. Um, but back in 1998, obviously I didn't have the internet and didn't have, or didn't have such good internet and didn't have um, access to, uh, you know, sort of walkthroughs or, or anything like that. Jeff, freeze in my beanie! Humph! You're the only one who seems to be fine! What? You should be awakening soon! What, what are you talking about, Wiz? Listen, your cells are trying to communicate. They're calling out. And what do we say? We say, bloody hell, my cells are talking. Oh, oh, combat, combat. Okay. Bang, bang. Ha 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 ha! What's happening, my buddy? It's, I'm get, it's getting hot. I'm getting hot. Just as I thought! Oh, just as I thought! What is this? What did you do to me? Oh, shit! Come on! I mean, I'm not getting very far. Our bodies are communicating with each other. What? Communicating? What? What do you want? The more you use that power, the more you will become like me. Power! What power? Who are you? I haven't really decided on a voice for Jeff. Eve. Eve? Eve. I'm surprised you don't know me, Jeff. You should know me well. What? Flashback, I'm guessing? Yeah, it's flashback. What the? What is this? What was that? Ha 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 ha! And she's off! Wait, where are you going? I'm not through with you yet. Hang on! I'm coming after you! Hang on, this might be my only chance. Oh, Oklahoma in the wind! <laughs> I think there's a hidden something um, back here, is it behind the... I can't remember now, is it behind the statue? Yeah, I might be wrong. Anyway, yeah, um... So, also, because Parasite E was never released in, uh, in Europe, they um, 
there was not really there wasn't really a lot of buzz about it. It never really got covered in any uh, magazines or anything like that. Police have turned up, and it was a really re well relatively unknown game. Like uh, a couple of people that that I knew uh, knew about it, but no one else really. Ooh, a ghostly child. Are you alone? It's dangerous here. You should go. But I, interestingly enough though, I absolutely adored this game and when Parasite Eve 2 came out, um, which came out the year, the year after, I really wanted to play it and I still never have. Um, yeah, it is really daft, I've never got around to playing the sequel. Um, or the one that came out on the PSP, the third birthday, but I was so totally out of it by then. Um, I'm going to end this gameplay, but I'm just going to end it with this is my uh, this is my lasting memory of Parasite Eve. So imagine I was a, a young boy, it was about 15, 16 at the time, uh, playing this, and uh, got to this this bit, and here I am going down here. I think you can go into some of these rooms. But I'm just going to keep going down here until this cutscene kicks in. Okay. Yep, and my dad walks into my room whilst uh, playing this, whilst I'm playing this, and he sees this cutscene. Bear in mind, my dad is not a, a games fan. He even dislikes Sonic the Hedgehog. He saw that and he just looked at me and he just went, oh, that wasn't very nice. Uh. Woohoo! Anyway, Lails and Jelly Spoons, I'm going to leave it there. Um, yeah, if you can check out Parasite Eve, uh, if obviously if you're in America, it's on the the PlayStation Network. Um, if you're in the UK, it is a little bit more difficult to come by. There are ways that you can come by it quite easily. Hint, hint, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. I think you know what I'm talking about. Um, but yeah, if you get the opportunity, definitely try it. It was, it is an amazing game. Um, it is quite Resident Evil like in its setting and the gameplay mechanics but obviously there's a good bit of uh, Final Fantasy uh, RPG elements in there. Um, I have been Kai Mathy, I hope you've enjoyed this video, I hope to see you in the next one. Please by all means if you've played Parasite Eve leave me a comment down below and let's chat about the game. I'd love to talk to some other people who actually ever played it. I think in my group of friends um, like me and I think yeah, do you know what? Like, thinking back on it, I think it was like literally I was the only person that ever played this game back in the day. Um, yeah, so I'd love to talk to some other people about it. Um, leave us a comment, have a little bit of a chat. Uh, subscribe to the channel if you haven't, and I will see you next Wednesday at 6 o'clock. Bye for now. And for those of you that know nothing about the Tomb Raider series, let alone Tomb Raider 3, here's a short history lesson. Tomb Raider is now a recognised media franchise that has grown up in forms of film adaptations, comics, novels and video games. But it all started back in 1993 in the city of Derby in the UK by the British gaming company Core Design, that was formerly owned by Eidos Interactive and then by Square Enix. The success of the first Tomb Raider game prompted Core Design to develop a new game annually for the next four years.
The game focuses on fictional British archaeologist Lara Croft, who travels around the world searching for lost artefacts and infiltrating dangerous tombs and ruins. The gameplay generally focuses around action-adventure exploration of environments, puzzle solving, navigating hostile environments filled with traps, and fighting numerous enemies. The first game in the series was released in 1996 for the PC, PlayStation and Sega Saturn, and the second game, Tomb Raider 2, launched in 1997, again for the PC and PlayStation. And in 1998, Tomb Raider 3 launched, again for the PlayStation and PC. At the time of writing, Tomb Raider games have sold over 63 million copies worldwide, and the series is noted as one of the pioneers of the action-adventure genre. Lara Croft herself has become one of the most recognisable video game protagonists in existence, and has won numerous accolades and earned places on the Walk of Game and the Guinness World Record. And this year, Tomb Raider 3 turns 20. <laughs> Tomb Raider 3, The Adventures of Lara Croft, as I'm sure you can guess by now, is an action-adventure video game developed by Core Design and published by Eidos Interactive. It was released for the Sony PlayStation and Microsoft Windows on the 20th of November 1998. The story follows Lara Croft as she embarks upon a quest to recover four pieces of a meteorite that are scattered across the world. A corporation called RX Tech excavates the crash site of a meteorite that landed in Antarctica millions of years ago and finds strange Rapid Nui-like statues alongside the grave of one of HMS Beagle's sailors. Meanwhile, Lara Croft is searching for an artifact known as the Infada Stone in the ruins of an ancient Indian Hindu temple, once inhabited by the Infada tribe. After taking the artefact from a researcher working for RX Tech, Lara is approached by RX Tech scientist Dr. Willard, who explains that the Polynesians came across the meteorite crater in Antarctica thousands of years ago and found that it held incredible power. Using rock from the meteorite, they crafted four crystalline artefacts, one of which is the Infada Stone. Then they fled Antarctica for unknown reasons. But in the 19th century, a group of sailors travelling with Charles Darwin came to Antarctica and rediscovered the artefacts. The four artefacts were distributed across the globe, and Dr. Willard has been able to track the artefacts using the diary of one of the sailors. Lara agrees to help him find the other three. Planets, sculpted by Polynesians, distributed by goons. Our excavations and investigations have led us to this. A sailor's diary from Charles Darwin's expedition on the HMS Beagle. August 14th, 1834. This voyage is getting too boring for me to go on with this journal. Me adventures at sea are an embarrassment. The player must explore five locations, India, the South Pacific, London, Nevada and Antarctica. Once the player completes the first location, India, the following three, South Pacific, London and Nevada, can be played in any order, before the final location, Antarctica, closes the game. Each location features a series of enclosed levels that include solving puzzles, jumping over obstacles and defeating enemies. Most puzzles involve rearranging items, manipulating switches and pushing objects. Most of the enemies require the player to use a variety of weapons including dual Uzis, a Desert Eagle, a shotgun, an MP5, a grenade launcher, a rocket launcher, a harpoon gun for those underwater sections, or Lara's iconic dual pistols to keep them at bay. Lara has a certain amount of health that decreases if she falls from a great height or when she's attacked. If Lara's health is fully depleted, the player must start the game again from a previous save point. Saving player's progress in the PlayStation version of the game requires and consumes a save crystal from Lara's inventory that can be found throughout each level and do not require the player to save the game at pickup spots. It should be noted that this is probably the one thing I dislike most about Tomb Raider 3. I don't know why they decided to bring back the save crystals from Tomb Raider 1. Just let us save anywhere like we could in Tomb Raider 2 and like we could in the PC version of Tomb Raider 3. Tomb Raider 3 was designed to be more in line with the puzzle solving gameplay of the original Tomb Raider as opposed to the more shooting orientated style of Tomb Raider 2. Although the game received generally favourable reviews, it didn't fare as well as its two predecessors, with critics generally agreeing that the game failed to change the same tried and tested formula. Reviewers also noted the game's difficulty and unforgiving gameplay. IGN said that Tomb Raider 3 solves none of the original's dilemmas, and as it stands now, the exploration adventure genre, one that was revolutionised by Tomb Raider, is in exactly the same spot as it was two years prior. Games Revolution explained that, whilst in previous Tomb Raider games, instant death came about if you were trying to rush through an area and that you did something stupid. But every step in Tomb Raider 3 is a potential threat of instant death, no matter how careful you're trying to be. Electronics Games Monthly criticised the game for being rushed and highly frustrating, noting that it has too many instances of cheap deaths. The magazine also remarked that the stealth elements in the Nevada levels were ineffective, especially when compared to Konami's Metal Gear Solid that came out in the same year. 
My personal feelings around Tomb Raider 3 pretty much echo reviews and critics at the time, although I do feel that I enjoyed playing the game more than they seemed to. Yes, it was a lot harder than the games that had come before it, but as I'd grown up with the series, this didn't bug me as much as it seemed to bug reviewers. My only gripe with the game was that to this day I still get lost and frustrated in that opening India level, and as I've already stated, the reintroduction of save crystals. But this was probably more from an inconvenience of having to have enough crystals in stock that when your mum calls you for tea you could save the game. And I actually think this game is one of the driving reasons behind me buying an action replay for my PlayStation. The Tomb Raider series is still going strong today. After Tomb Raider 3 we got Tomb Raider The Last Revelation in 1999, and in 2000 we got Tomb Raider Chronicles, and many many more after that. Indeed, later on in this year, 2018, we will see the release of Shadow of the Tomb Raider, the conclusion of the most recent reboot of the game series that started in 2013 with Tomb Raider 2013. Welcome, ladles and jelly spoons. Wasn't that exciting? Oh, we've gone straight into demo mode. Much like with Parasite Eve that I did before, I'm going to do a little bit of a gameplay. I will be doing, obviously, Lara's Home because obviously, as I've just stated in my little uh, review slash retrospective, the first level of Tomb Raider 3 set in India annoys the ever-loving shit out of me. Welcome back to my humble abode. Feel free to take a look around. Hello, Judith. Judith Gibson there, uh, reprising her role as Lara Croft from Tomb Raider 2. I don't believe she wasn't, it was Shelley someone in Tomb Raider 1. Um, and I think it was someone else in The Last Revelation as well, although it sounds very similar. So, for those of you that don't know, uh, the uh, Lara's Home levels in, in the early Tomb Raider games, Tomb Raider 1 through to 3, I don't th there wasn't one in Last Revelation. I don't think there was one in Tomb Raider Chronicles. I uh, can't remember. Off the top of my head, I've just remembered I've completely forgotten to pick something up in here. Oops, uh, I apologise about the. Um, oh God, I apologise about the lag. There we go. Hello, just nip into here. Oh, you've done your cupboard up here. Nice to you. No, you've changed it somewhat. So, yeah, so for those of you that don't know, um, in the end, uh, early Tomb Raider games, they would give you this level as a bit of a tutorial slash training level. You could uh, work out the controls for yourself you to see how Lara moved. Press and hold the look button. Then press in the direction you want to look. Uh, so I'm going to do that now for you. There you go. Looking around. Uh, hi, Winston. Hi. Um, yeah. Uh, so avid Tomb Raider fans know exactly what I'm about to do to Winston. Come on, Winnie. Come on. Come on, I don't want the entirety of this video me waiting for you to get downstairs, Winston. Um, for people who have um, very uh, no Tomb Raider knowledge whatsoever, have never played a Tomb Raider game before, I should say, what are you doing with yourselves? Get get out there and uh, and play one. Go on, Winston. I was just sticking some music on while I waited for you. Come on, you know where we're going. Now, come on. Come on, we're like, we're deep into this, Winston. I'm just sat here waiting for you. Come on, come on. The first time I ever played this game, which I'll tell you in a minute, Winston stopped right there and didn't come in, and I was genuinely convinced that the programmers had uh, programmed him not to come into the freezer anymore. So the first time I played Tomb Raider 3, my entire experience was Winston just not getting into the freezer. See you later, Winnie. Everybody does that. Uh, it has to be said that the Tomb Raider 3 soundtrack is probably not one of it's my uh, all-time favourites. Yeah, she won't fall off. 
So yeah, the this part of the Croft Mansion is basically the sort of training area to get you used to the controls and the various things that Lara does, anything new that she's got. In this game I think it was the Crouch and the Monkey Swing, which is over there. Um, she gives you little introductions into each thing and how to do it. I'm probably just going to go... So that was it. The jump is too far for me. Oops. Run, run the ledge, save, save myself, now I'm nasty. Uh, on to the next one. Walk the edge next to the white line, but I won't go any further. Yeah. Then press jump. Immediately followed by forward. Press forward and I'm That's it. I'm not. I'm not going to wait for you. I know exactly what you uh, what you want me to do, Lara. Yeah. Running jump time. There we go. Running jump. Now you would obviously think, as I thought when I first played it, that the obvious thing to do is to jump onto that block, but it's not. Press and hold the jump I won't actually jump until the last minute. Is to fall off and go up here. Bless her, she is, she is unfortunately going to okay. tell me how to do absolutely everything. Maybe this was a little bit of a mistake sure to, um, <laughs> to go through absolutely everything. But, there we go. Yeah. We're almost done, we're almost through it. Yeah. Okay, fancy a swim? I do indeed fancy a swim. There's a, but obviously if you've never been to the Croft uh, Manor before, I have no idea where the pool is, but luckily I do know where it is, so off we go for a swim. The jump button and the, dire and the directions move me around underwater. Thanks for that. Uh, we're just going to. We're going to open this little uh, little Easter egg secret uh, secret room. There you go. We'll go. Possibly go through that in a minute. Um, let's, let's have a quick jump, swan dive into the water. Couple of laps around the bottom and up. Just use forward, left, and forward, left, and right. right. Let's go and play outside. Play outside. Um, it's just nip outside and head for the assault course, which I think would be a much better thing to do and probably more interesting video. And I can tell you, can tell you my uh, stories of my experiences with Tomb Raider 3 and we haven't got to put up with uh, Lara chatting, uh, talking at me. And then maybe we'll come back and do the uh, quad bike. My experiences with Tomb Raider 3. Uh, how did I get it? Well, it came out in the November of 1998. I was a small 15, was that 15 year old? 15 years old? 15, 16, 15, 16 year old boy. Um, I had played Tomb Raider 2 to death. I had played uh, Tomb Let's Raider... See how the assault course can be completed. Are okay. you ready? I am. Nice. But uh, you did sort of interrupt me there, Lara. Just get into the middle here. Uh, yes, I was a young 16 year old uh, boy, 15, 16 year years old. I um, had played Tomb Raider 2 to death. Uh, I had played Tomb Raider 1. I think, I, I think I'd only played it the once. And, and I was desperately hungry for another Tomb Raider game. I'd heard that 3 was coming out, I'd followed quite a lot of... Uh, oh, doesn't... I don't know if I've ever actually done that jump properly, ever in the history of me playing this game. Yes, yeah, sorry, I'd... Uh, can I was desperate for it to come out, uh, it came out sort of around about Christmas, it was obviously on the Christmas list. But, uh, close to uh, Christmas, close to November, it's release week, uh, myself and my mother were going into town to do some last minute Christmas shopping, and I'd worked out that I had just enough in my piggy bank uh, that I could afford it. So I was like, ooh, excellent. Uh, why don't I go and get it? So I'd said to my mother, I was like, oh, do you know what? Uh, we're going shopping. And she was like, oh, you've got all your presents sorted for everybody. And I was like, yes. Uh, but I'd also like to just nip into Electronics Boutique, because it was still a thing back then, and pick up the new version of uh, or the new Tomb Raider game. And she was like, mm, OK, OK. And 
she, she was being a bit coy about it, and I was like, okay, it was just Momo. I was like, it's just typical Momo. She's not really much of a video gamer, so I was like, okay, that's just her being her. Uh, we went into to town and uh, went past Electronics Boutique, and I was like, oh, okay, I'm going to nip in there now and pick up the new Tomb Raider game. She's like, oh, 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 we don't have time, we don't have time. And I was like, oh, bags of time, what are you talking about, mother? Bags of time. And she's like, no, oh, no, 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 no time. And I was like, oh, she's like oh, we've, got, we've got to get to these other shops. So I just said to her, I was like, okay, well, uh, how about you go to your, your shops, I'm just going to nip into Electronics Boutique and uh, I'll catch up with you. It won't take me uh, more than a few minutes to get I was, oh, oh. Pay attention, pay attention, Matt. What am I doing? Zip lining. Woohoo! Oof. Straight in. Duck. Come on. And here the, here the ghost of Winston. In fact, this is where they pulled a very good bait and switch on us. I'll get back to my story in a minute. Because you crawl out of there with guns, you're like, oh my god, there's going to be a shooting gallery. There is. time I have played this, please, please put a comment down below if you know why. Every single time I've played that I either get a 20 second penalty or a 30 second penalty for, for shooting and I cannot work out what it is. I, I, think, I think it's 30 seconds if you hit Winston, but usually it's 20 seconds. I cannot work out how... Yeah, Winston, Winston is back. He's out of the freezer. It's all right. He's not dead. But I do like the fact that he's come back in his little World War II uh, garb. But yes, back to the story. So uh, basically, we'd gone off Christmas shopping. I was going to go and pick up uh, the game, and Mum was being very, very coy about it. I said, "Oh, fine, okay, I'll catch you up. I'm just going to nip into Electronics Boutique and buy it." And she was all like, "No, Matthew." And basically, what happened is. She had to basically come please to say, no, someone has bought it you for Christmas. I was like, oh my god, really excited, thinking, oh, it must be mum. I was like, I can probably twist her arm to get her to give it me uh, to play before Christmas, because I was desperate to play this game. And I was like, oh, is it you? She's like, no, it's not me. It's your grandmother. And I was like, ah, oh, shit. Knowing full well that my grand would never go for giving me my Christmas presents, like, this early. Again, this was like mid-November, I thought, bugger, uh, I'm going to have to wait until Christmas Day. Uh, now, just pointing out, I'm just going to go and get the, uh, whoops, the, uh, the key for the, the quad bike area, so if people wonder what I'm doing. Yeah, so, pants, and I had to spend a really, that was a very, very fraught Christmas, uh, because it was at my uncle's, and he wasn't a video game player and my cousins weren't really into video games at all so I was like oh bugger I'd spend uh, I got it on Christmas Day I was really excited and then was trying to do absolutely everything uh, to keep my mind off the fact that I was gonna have to wait till we got home to play it um, and my 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 aunt and uncle aren't even board game players so I couldn't you know didn't even have the sweet release of maybe a family game of Monopoly to get frustrated over or um, or Scrabble, but you know, Trivial Pursuit or anything like that. And I think we got home, uh, Mum and I got home at about 10 a.m. And I was like really chomping at the bit, and I was like, I'm gonna get a bit now, and thinking, no, I'm gonna go home and play this video game. <laughs> Fucking run, Baron! Bloody hell! I haven't got time for you to piss about. And again, and again, come on, come on, I don't want to miss it, 
I'm through. I'm through. Phew. Phew. Pick up those. Here we are in Lara's Fortress of Solitude, where she can read, sit down and look at fish, and also look at why some idiot has clearly put a key in the water. What a twat. Winston, you're fired. But we're going to go and get that key. Oh yes we are. Uh, yeah, so Christmas day, night, boxing day, morning, uh, I was there at home playing Tomb Raider and I deliberately only played this level um, just because I didn't want to get fully into the story because I knew if I did I'd probably be like basically playing it all night and I had quite a few run-ins when I was younger with my mother about playing video games like um, in the wee small hours. Right, Winston, you best not be in my fortress of solitude. I will, I will smack a bitch if you are. Come on, let's pick up that key. That's another thing that I really disliked about uh, Tomb Raider 3 over Tomb Raider 2, and indeed Tomb Raider 1. When you picked items up, it didn't give you like a little picture of them. Just by um, the, the bottom left of the screen, or the bottom right of the screen. That that annoyed me, because I'd always have to like double check my um, inventory to find out what the hell it was I just picked up. So yeah, so that was that was my fond memory of uh, my first playthrough of Tomb Raider 3. Or well, my first experience of Tomb Raider 3, getting it at Christmas. Um, yeah. And it took, to be fair, it took me a long time to realise how to, hey, to, to do this. I like this. the look of this. To yeah. jump on, walk up to the vehicle and press the action button. Okay, what they don't tell you is how to get off the damn thing. I kid you not, I was, the first time I played this game, I would, get on it Lara, come on. There we go. The first time I played this, um, I... Let's go as fast nope. as we can. Back, back. No, back, 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 back. <laughs> I was trying to do the rev up, but I can't remember what I can't. Is it? I can't remember what the rev up is. Okay. Let's go. Now into the corner. Whoa. The idea is try not to hit a side because you tend to lose an awful lot of speed. You can actually blow the uh, quad bike up as well. Um, if you fuck something up. So, let's try and be... Yeah, I've just lost an awful lot of speed there. Yeah, Ooh. oh no, cocked it up, cocked it up. Oh, I've cocked it up at the end. Oh, 43.70, okay. So there we are, ladles and jelly spoons. Tomb Raider 3 is 20 years old this year, in November. Maybe I should have done the video in November, but... If you like this video, please hit the old like button. If you've got any Tomb Raider stories yourself, please by all means put them in the comments down below. We'll have a little bit of a chat. Maybe Tomb Raider 3 is your favourite game. And, uh, you know, by all means tell me why. Because uh, of the original five, it's it's up there, but it's definitely not my favourite. Anyway, I'll uh, finish here where we uh, started. I'll just nip into the bathroom. She can have a... She can get in the bath. Splish! Lovely. And I'm going to leave it there, fellas. Um, yeah, okay. I shall see you next Wednesday at 6pm. Bye for now. The magazine also remarked that the stealth elements in the Nevada levels were ineffective, especially when compared to Konami's Metal Gear Solid that came out in the same year.
Metal Gear Solid is an action-adventure stealth video game produced by Konami Computer Entertainment Japan and released for the Sony PlayStation in 1998. The game was directed, produced and co-written by series creator Hideo Kojima and serves as a sequel to the MSX2 video games Metal Gear and Metal Gear 2 Solid Snake, which Kojima also wrote and directed. The year is 2005. You take on the role of Solid Snake, a retired legendary infiltrator and saboteur from an elite government team known as Foxhound. When six of Foxhound's top operatives, Psycho Mantis, Sniper Wolf, Decoy Octopus, Vulcan Raven, Revolver Ocelot, and the leader of Foxhound Squadron, Liquid Snake, form a terrorist organisation, they gain control of a secret genome army of next generation special forces and take over the nuclear weapons facility on Alaska's Fox Archipelago, codenamed Shadow Moses. From there, they threaten the United States government with a nuclear attack from the ultimate killing machine, the nuclear-equipped walking battle tank Metal Gear Rex. Metal Gear... it can't be. Snake's former commander, Colonel Roy Campbell, puts the whole situation in Snake's hands. Snake has two mission objectives. First, he must rescue the hostages, DARPA Chief Donald Anderson and Arms Tech President Kenneth Baker. Secondly, he must investigate whether or not the terrorists have the ability to launch a nuclear weapon. They say if they don't accede to their demands, they'll launch a nuclear weapon. Sweet Jesus. Is it possible? It's possible. Kojima originally planned the third Metal Gear game in 1994 for the 3DO. After the 3DO was discontinued, development shifted to the Sony PlayStation. The game was titled Metal Gear Solid, rather than Metal Gear 3, due to the fact that the MSX2 versions of the previous Metal Gear games were not widely released, particularly Metal Gear 2 Solid Snake, which was only released in Japan and was not ported to any other platform at the time. A different sequel, Snake's Revenge, was released for the NES in the West instead. The word Solid was chosen due to the switch from 2D to 3D computer graphics. Development for Metal Gear Solid began in mid-1995, with the intention of creating the best PlayStation game ever. In the early stages of development, the Huntingdon Beach SWAT team educated the creators with demonstrations of vehicles, weapons and explosives. Weapons expert Motosata Mori was also tapped as the technical advisor. Developers aimed for accuracy and realism whilst making the game enjoyable and tense. Kojima stated that if the player isn't tricked into believing the world is real, then there's no point in making the game. To fulfil this, adjustments were made to every detail, such as individually designing desks. Kojima wanted greater interaction with objects and the environment, such as allowing players to hide bodies in storage compartments, and additionally, he wanted a full orchestra next to the player, a system which made modifications such as tempo and texture to the currently playing track, instead of switching to another pre-recorded track. Although these features couldn't be achieved, they were implemented in the sequel Metal Gear Solid 2 Sons of Liberty. The characters and mecha designs were made by artist Yoji Shinkawa, based on Kojima's concepts. According to Shinkawa, Solid Snake's physique in this particular instalment was based on Jean-Claude Van Damme, while his facial appearance was based on Christopher Walken. Metal Gear Solid was shown to the public first in E3 of 1997 as a short video, and it was playable for the first time at the Tokyo Game Show in 1998, and released that same year in Japan and North America, with an extensive promotional campaign, and an estimated 12 million demos for the game were distributed in 1998. The player must navigate Solid Snake through the game's areas without being detected by enemies. Detection is triggered by the player moving into an enemy's field of vision and setting off an alarm that draws enemies to his location. This also triggers alert mode and players must then hide and remain undetected, at which point evasion mode begins and once the counter reaches zero, the game returns to infiltration mode where the enemies are not suspicious of Snake's presence. To remain undetected, the player can perform techniques which make use of both Solid Snake's abilities and the environment, such as crawling under objects, using boxes as cover, ducking or hiding around walls, and making noise that distracts enemies. An on-screen radar provides the player with the location of nearby enemies and their field of vision. Snake can also make use of items and gadgets, such as infrared goggles and a cardboard box to sky. Just a box. The emphasis on stealth promotes a less violent form of gameplay, and despite the switch from 3D, the game is still primarily played from an overhead perspective, similar to the original 2D Metal Gear games. However, the camera angle will change during certain situations, such as corner views when Snake flattens himself against a wall, or in first-person mode when crawling under tight spaces, or using certain items such as binoculars or a sniper rifle. Ah. 
Progress is punctuated by cutscenes and codec calls, as well as encounters with bosses. To progress, players must discover the weakness of each boss to defeat them. Snake, Meryl's in danger. Find a sniper rifle so you can shoot back at Wolf. It's the only way to save Meryl. Player controls and strategies can also be accessed via the codec radio, where advice is delivered from Snake's support team. For example, the support team may chastise Snake for not saving his progress, or explain his combat moves in terms of which buttons to press. The codec is also used to provide exposition on the game's backstory. Cinematic cutscenes were rendered using the in-game engine and graphics, and voice acting was used throughout the entire game. So you killed the chief, you bastard! Liquid? No, you're not. Don't move! Is this the first time you ever pointed a gun at a person? Your hands are shaking. <sighs> Can you shoot me, rookie? Metal Gear Solid to this day is critically acclaimed, and at the time Metal Gear Solid was well received, shipping more than 6 million copies and scoring an average of 94 out of 100 on aggregate website Metacritic. PlayStation Magazine declared it the best PlayStation game ever made, unputdownable and unforgettable. IGN said Metal Gear Solid came closer to perfection than any other game in PlayStation's action genre, as well as saying it was beautiful, engrossing and innovative in every conceivable category. Computer and video games compared it to playing a big budget action blockbuster, only better. GamePro called it this season's top offering, and one game no self-respecting gamer should be without, but criticised the frame rate that occasionally stalls the eye-catching graphics. GameSpot was also critical of how easy it is for the player to avoid being seen, as well as the game's short length, calling it more of a work of art than an actual game. Metal Gear received an excellence award for interactive art in the 1998 Japan Media Arts Festival. The Academy of Interactive Art and Science nominated Metal Gear Solid for its 1998 outstanding achievement in character or story development, although the game lost to Pokemon Red and Blue, and to this day it is regarded as one of the greatest and most important video games that's helped popularise the stealth genre. Its success prompted the release of an expanded version for the PlayStation and PC, Metal Gear Solid Integral, and the GameCube remake, Metal Gear Solid The Twin Snakes. The game has also spawned numerous sequels, prequels and spin-offs, including several games, a radio drama, comics and novels. My name is Roy Campbell, rank Colonel, service number 621-49-5671, date of birth. Still want to play games with me, do you? <laughs> <laughs> Metal Gear Solid helped popularise the stealth game genre. The idea of a player being armed and having to avoid being seen by enemies rather than fight them has been used in many games since. It's also sometimes acclaimed as being a film, as much as a game, due to the lengthy cutscenes and complicated storyline. The game is often considered as one of the best PlayStation games and is often featured on best video games lists. In 2002, IGN ranked it as the best PlayStation game ever, saying that just the demo itself had more gameplay in it than most finished titles. IGN also gave it Best Ending and Best Villain awards. You've been talking to me, dear brother. Liquid, how the... You've served your purpose. You may die now. Guinness World Records awarded Metal Gear Solid with a record for the most innovative use of a video game controller for the boss fight with Psycho Mantis in 2008. In 2010, PC Magazine ranked it as 7th in its list of most influential video games of all time, citing its influences on such stealthy titles as Assassin's Creed and Splinter Cell. Metal Gear Solid, along with its sequel Metal Gear Solid 2, were featured in the Smithsonian's American Art Museum exhibition of video games in 2012. During 2015, Eurogamer reanalyzed the game's technical and overall impact, and claimed that Metal Gear Solid has been nothing less than the first modern video game. And in September of 2015, Metal Gear Solid was voted as the best original PlayStation game of all time by PlayStation blog users. Hello ladles and jelly spoons, hope you enjoyed that little retrospective. As is tradition with this little series of mine, now that I've talked about the game I'm actually going to play the game and recount some favourite memories of mine. 
from the first time I played Metal Gear Solid way back in 1998. And indeed I did play way back in 1998. Uh, some more eagle-eyed or let's just say more knowledgeable video game fanatics might be saying, but Kai, uh, Metal Gear Solid didn't come out in Europe until 1999, February I believe it was. Well indeed you are correct. And how did I get to play it in 1998? Well, watch on and find out. So let's get stuck in. Uh, let's just go for a normal game. Now, for those of you that are not so au fait with Metal Gear Solid, um, and indeed the Metal Gear series, um, it is a very, let's call it bombastic series. Um, they tell an awful lot of the story through cutscenes and through codec radio calls and they do take up an awful lot of time. For the sake of this playthrough, I'm going to be cutting an awful lot of them out. Uh, indeed, as you can see what's going on on screen now, this is really the sort of introduction into just the first section of the game, this dock section that you've got to get yourself out of. I'll show you a little bit of how uh, exposition can go on for a, little bit too much, for a little bit too long in a second. So here we are, the intro to the game. Let's just uh, pick up a ration there. Ration effectively being your uh, your health items. Yeah, let's equip them just in case we get seen by a cheeky guard. Uh, the guards, can we see them at the minute? Yep, yeah, there's one uh, just there. There's another one over there somewhere. Uh, we, the Obviously the emphasis of the game is to try and sneak past them and not to injure them. You can just go up to them and pick a fight with them and buff them in the face. And uh, sadly you can't take their guns off them, which was always a little bit of a disappointment to me when I first played the game. Yeah, um, I'm going to warn you now, that little Kodak ringing thing happens an awful lot in the opening sections of the game, especially this opening section that we'll be playing. So I apologise about that now. Yeah, another ration. We'll do our maximum of two. Uh, we can get more as the game progresses. What I'm going to do is I'm going to just sneak this way. Oops. Sneak around there. Uh, now that's water in front of me. If I go through that, uh, oh yeah, he's, he's heard. He's going to go around that way to investigate. Thank God for that. Um, I have got to wait for the lift to come back down. There isn't anything I can do to get it to come back quicker. That's exactly what that Kodak call is trying to tell me. You've got to wait for the lift, Snake. You've got to wait for the lift. You can't force the lift, Snake. You've got to wait for it. A shocking impression of Colonel Campbell there. Um, for those of you that haven't uh, worked it out because you're not particularly a film buff or maybe you've just never seen the film, Colonel Campbell is quite obviously based on the Colonel from the Rambo films, particularly Rambo First Blood. See me. There we go. Oh, come, fucking come on, elevator. I suppose it's like back in the day when I originally played this, the elevator probably came like came down way too quickly, but now you know I know exactly what I'm doing. I'm just sat here waiting, waiting for the elevator. Here it is. And it's bringing with it another guard. That's alright, because we're going to just sneak past them and uh, not worry about it. Come on. Is he look this way. Yep, he is. And he's going to go off down that way. So I'm just going to do that. Go in there. And there we go into the elevator. Uh, while this little bit of exposition plays out, this little cutscene, uh, let me tell you about 1998 and my experiences with Metal Gear Solid. So, official PlayStation magazine released an uh, article about Metal Gear Solid and a friend of mine had it and brought it into school to show me and I was amazed, I was blown away by this what looked like a big budget blockbuster film only it was a video game. I was genuinely really excited to play it. And at the end of the review it said yeah, our American cousins and people in Japan are already playing it but we have to wait till February. Well I thought uh, I wonder but 
Back in those days, I had what was known as a region-free PlayStation, which meant I could, also, I could play imported video games from Japan and America. I could also play chipped games as well, and I promise I never did that. Honest. Uh, and I happen to know a guy that could get his hands on imported games. So I uh, read this article, and one day after school I nipped down there and I saw So I went uh, so I and said, oh mate, can you get this game? And he said, yeah, I can, give me a couple of days, and come back and I'll have it for you. I was like, oh, amazing, absolutely brilliant. In a couple of days, came back, I seem to remember it was a weekend, uh, I got it on a Friday night and came back and I think I literally played it for the entire weekend. Literally started it Saturday morning, sort of late Saturday morning, do, you know, sort of took breaks for you know, breakfast, lunch, dinner, sleeping, although I think that was I think my first my first playthrough of Metal Gear Solid was definitely one of those times when uh, I got a little bit told off by my mother for staying up until 4 in the morning playing video games. Um, but yeah, absolutely adored it. The idea of what the exposition and storytelling is like in the Metal Gear series, uh, let's just sit back and have a little bit of a watch, shall we? Oh, no, uh, no, still exposition going on, if sorry. If you want to get in. And about to play in the game. Whew. So, yeah, so that should give you a rough idea of what uh, the exposition dumps and the storytelling is like in the Metal Gear series. Uh, series. Uh, I'm not joking, that was a small example. Um, it can get pretty ridiculous. Do I need the other rations up here? No I don't. Okay, so let's see if I've still got what it takes to avoid the security uh, spotlights. Uh, probably not. In fact actually first thing I'm going to do is go this way and <gasps> surveillance, a secure, camera? A surveillance camera. Yeah. Now I could go into the compound uh, that way, through there, let's just put the scope up, I can't actually remember what the, uh, the things are for, right? yeah, that's it. yeah, I could go that way but I'm not going to, um, I am however going to get myself a gun, there's one in the back of here, there we go, and now let's see if I can remember, or Let's see if I can still do. Oops. No, 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 no. It's the other way around. It has to go the other way. That way, and I have to go that way. There we go. Excellent. Got the chaff grenades. Now the chaff grenades effectively are what you use to take out uh, electrical equipment. It's, it just stuns. Stun grenades stun people. Uh, chaff grenades stun. Electrical things. Oh, that guy's going that way, so I'm going to go this way. Stairs. Come on, move, 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 move. Oh, shit. To be fair, I just want to say, I think this shot here just shows 
Okay, graphics are a lot better in this day and age, but in 1998, this genuinely blew my mind. I was like, oh my god, it is, it is like playing a film. Uh, the Kodak's going to go off and it's basically going to say, there's a thing to crawl through there, snake. Yeah, I know, I can, I can see it. Well done. You laugh, builders. Right. And that indeed is where A, the game starts to really sort of open up and B, get a little bit more weird. But unfortunately that is where we're going to leave it today, ladles and jelly spoons. I hope you have enjoyed this little look at Metal Gear Solid uh, 20 Hi, years this is McDonald Miller. It's been 20 years time. old Master, this year. What are you doing? Um, if I by all means you enjoyed this video, please so hit the old like button, maybe even subscribe for new videos every Wednesday at 6pm like British Standard like? Time. Dude. Silent Hill is a third-person survival horror video game for the original Sony PlayStation. Published by Konami and developed by Team Silent, a group within Konami Computer Entertainment Tokyo, it is the first instalment in the Silent Hill series, a series that is now eight games strong. And 1999 marks the 20th anniversary of Silent Hill. The question is, will Konami do anything to celebrate? Probably not. Released in North America on January the 31st, 1999, and in Japan and Europe later in the year, Silent Hill tells the story of Harry Mason as he searches for his missing adopted daughter after a car accident in the mysterious town of Silent Hill. While searching, he stumbles upon a cult conducting a ritual to revive a deity it worships. Depending on various actions that the player makes during the game determines which of the five possible endings you'll receive, including one joke ending. Unlike earlier survival horror games that focused on protagonists with combat training, the player character of Silent Hill, Harry Mason, is an everyman and cannot sustain many blows from enemies and gasps for breath after sprinting. Have any of you ever played Silent Hill? If so, did you play it back in the 90s or did you come to it as a retro title later in life? I'd love to know how many of you at home have actually played it and whether you liked it or not. Was it right up your street and you played it again and again to get all five endings? Or was it just really not your cup of tea? Were the clunky controls and the dodgy textures just not really doing it for you? Fun fact, I actually used to know someone who used to feel sick whilst playing Silent Hill. He put it down to Harry's movement and the textures messing with his head. Either way, I'd love to hear some of your Silent Hill stories in the comments down below. Obviously, Silent Hill was compared to the Resident Evil series. Jill Sandwich! People saying such things as a shameless but slick Resident Evil clone, and saying that Silent Hill was Konami's answer to Resident Evil. But whereas Resident Evil took a visceral, action-orientated approach to horror, Silent Hill wanted to induce fear into its players by attempting to form a disturbing atmosphere with the use of fog and darkness along with grainy textures, although it was noted that these were heavily used to disguise the limitations of the PlayStation hardware. Reviewers did feel, though, that this actually worked in the game's favour. Music also added to the atmosphere. The engrossing and ambient audio was praised by critics, saying it will set you on the edge. What was less well received though was the voice acting. Aside from it being very wooden and sounding like it's the actor's first time reading the script, it's accompanied by pauses between the lines that spoil the atmosphere. Glad to hear it. You from around here? Why don't you tell me what happened? Wait a second, I'm just a tourist. I came here for a vacation. I just got here. Some critics did say that the voice acting was better than that found in Resident Evil 1 and 2, but that wasn't really saying much. Silent Hill was commercially successful when it was released, and it was reviewed positively. Even back in 1999, reviewers and critics considered it to be possibly one of the greatest video games ever made, because it emphasises atmosphere and psychological horror over the B-movie horror elements that made games such as Alone in the Dark and Resident Evil popular. With me. Silent Hill is played mainly in third person, although occasionally the camera will switch to a fixed angle for dramatic effect. 
You wouldn't think it now, but at the time this was a massive change for the survival horror genre that had, up to the release of Silent Hill, stuck with constantly shifting through a variety of static camera angles to create a level of tension, such as not being able to see what was just around the corner. A staple of the survival horror genre that Silent Hill didn't change was that you have no heads up display, or HUD for short, meaning that the player must use the inventory screen to check things like ammunition and health levels. Throughout the game the player must confront a variety of monsters with both melee weapons and firearms. Because of the game's emphasis on the everyman protagonist, Harry is inexperienced in handling firearms and therefore the player's aim is often unsteady. To assist with avoiding monsters, early in the game the player finds a portable radio that alerts you to danger with bursts of static. Along with the radio, you'll find a pocket-sized flashlight to help you see through the fog, but the light only illuminates a few feet. To help you navigate the town, the player can collect tourist maps of each area, but they can only be viewed when you have sufficient light. As you explore, the map is updated with places of interest and inaccessible paths. As well as maps, the player must find keys and solve puzzles to navigate through Silent Hill. Now, the dream of this life must end, and so too must the dreamers within it. For over 20 years this game has denied its own fate. For 20 years it has lied to its own console. But now is the end of days and I am the Reaper. Konami started developing Silent Hill in 1996 with the aim of making a game that would be successful in the USA. They were looking for something with a Hollywood-like atmosphere. Akira Yamaoka, the composer on this and other Silent Hill games, said that the personnel and management team of Konami had little faith in the game's developers due to them being slow and the team not really knowing how to get the Hollywood feel out of Sony's little grey box. In the end, the developers decided to ignore the profit-orientated approach of the parent company and the limits that they had put on them, and instead introduced a fear of the unknown as a psychological type of horror. Silent Hill would be a game that appealed to the emotions of the players instead. The game director, Karichiro Toyama, hadn't had much experience in horror games at the time, but he did have an interest in the occult, UFOs and enjoyed the films of David Lynch. Over time, he thought up the game's scenario and made the plot vague and contradictory to leave its true meaning in the dark. The game's artist, Takayoshi Seto, corrected the inconsistencies in the plot and designed the game's cast of characters. The game was shown for the first time to the public in E3 of 1998, where it was met with high praise and applause. Sato said that the game's development team intended to make Silent Hill a masterpiece rather than a traditional, stales oriented game. They opted for an engaging story that would persist over time. Oh God, what have I done? <laughs> Spoons, it is that part of the video where I play a little bit of the game that I've been talking about and give you my uh, experiences with it and share some fond memories, shall we say, of uh, when I played this game. Um, we are obviously playing the NTSC version, the North American version of Silent Hill, as shown here by the fact that you've got a uh, photograph with a shadowy figure in it. And we're obviously going to start by playing the introduction to the game, which I love. The music in it is brilliant, and I think it sets up the story beautifully. So let's go. Start.
Okay, so we've obviously just seen that. Uh, again, it shows the uh, game. It sets the story brilliantly. Harry and his daughter driving off, and suddenly they swerve. They're in a little bit of an accident. That's, that's obviously the beginning setting. So let's go for a, a normal playthrough. Ooh, I'm getting a little bit of uh, echo. I don't know if you, you chaps are getting it on the actual video, but I'm getting a little bit of audio. Okay. Here we are, so Harry wakes up after the car accident. He doesn't quite know where uh, Cheryl is. Cheryl? Can't see her in the fuck. And this is obviously meant to represent him running into town, but it's actually a cleverly disguised loading screen. <sighs> Interestingly enough, um, Silent Hill is loosely based on an actual place in America, um, somewhere in Pennsylvania, I think it's Centrilla or some, something like that. Um, the idea is that, uh, the idea around Silent Hill is that there's uh, a mine that has caught fire underneath the town and that is throwing up all this ash into the atmosphere and so into the clouds and it's raining down upon upon the town and exactly the same thing is, has happened in this place in Pennsylvania um, a mine caught fire and apparently to this day is actually still burning see Cheryl there running after Cheryl uh, yeah it's apparently still burning to this day and uh, it's still causing Cheryl. ash to sort of rain down uh, on the town and it is a little bit of a ghost town although apparently I think people still do live there it's a little bit of an odd odd place it's one of those places you kind of think Where are you going? kind of would like to go and visit it at some point but um, I don't hey wait I don't, stop no, maybe not anyway sorry I just got to run after my daughter Cheryl come to daddy come on now come on come on run 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 oops here are footsteps, I'm going to run down here. I think if I stop now, see the, the whole thing about the everyman, he sort of uh, pants after having to sprint for any amount of time. Oh, there she goes. It's through there. Beware of the dog. Let's go after it. But oh no, it looks like the dog. Something's happened to the dog. What the? What is this? Now, th this this introduction to a horror game is, I think, one of the best ever done. So, can you hear in the background there? You can hear the um, the sort of uh, alarms going off, and you're sort of pushed into this very tight uh, corridor, still sort of obviously looking for your for your daughter, and you're not quite sure which way to go. So going down there and you're noticing that oh it's getting a little bit tighter and also is it getting a little bit darker hmm why yes it is that's strange it's getting darker Harry has a bit of a shuffle and he finds some matches now um, what the game is actually doing is it's leading you into what is known in the business as a meant to lose confrontation yeah. a broken wheelchair what's this doing here the point is you have to lose this next confrontation to progress with the game. Um, I'm going to see how long I can last. Oh my god, what's this? See, a bit more sound. This horrific thing, blood all around, a random wheelchair, a hospital trolley, uh, you know, sort of Dutch angles. Uh, it's, you know, it's a bit more sinister music. as we go down here, even more blood, bits of body parts. What is this? A strung up, What's disemboweled body. Here? And here we go, right. Ah! Oh, get off me, get off me, get off me. Go on, get off me, get off me. Woo! Run, 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 Harry, run. Let's see how long I uh, last. Woo! Oh, no! Got me, got, got me legs. Got me legs. Now the controls are a bit of a bastard in. <gasps> oh my god! Run back! Run! No! 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 Come on! I'm gonna! I'm gonna be able to get around you! I'm gonna be able to get around you! Oh dear! I didn't. Uh... 
Uh, I don't know how long it lasted, I'll flash it up on screen. <laughs> but the idea is you're meant to lose that fight. And then all of a sudden, wake up in a diner. With the policewoman on the motorcycle. Oh my god. Now I do think it's very odd in this next scene that he never sort of brings up the, the motorcycle. Was bit. I dreaming? He must have been dreaming. How do you feel? Well, I've just been slashed by little babies. Oh, like I've been run over demon by a truck. zombie children or but demon already, babies. Yes. Interestingly enough, they are um, one of the main, in fact, I think the only uh, main change in the European and Japanese release Wait to the just North tourist. American release. A lot of people back in the day, um, sort of early 2000s, when this gone. game sort of got a little got a little bit of cult following, people always used to say, oh, have you played the censored, the uncensored version, when they actually meant the North American like version was never an so. uncensored version of the game. Um, for some reason, uh, the European and Japanese versions of the game uh, changed the little stabbing uh, demon babies that we saw there into uh, sort of similar things that just had like big claws that sort of Sorry. slashed you so it wasn't, wasn't so much of a stabbing Maybe motion, it was more of a kind of like slashing you. motion. Effectively it was the same, is same creature. Um, other than that, and me. a I think it's a newspaper article towards the end of the game that doesn't appear tell. in the it's American, soft. the North American version, which is sort of a bit of an appendix That's newspaper right. article. Um, they're hmm. the only sort of major changes, so I never really What's understood why people sort of said that the European Harry. version was the censored version and Harry Mason. the American version was uncensored. It was Sybil like, Bennett. no, they just, they just changed one of the monsters in it. I'm a police that. officer really all it was. the next town over. Anyway, back to, the, back to the game. Okay, so this is where you pick up the, um, the torch and the radio. The torch thing is over here. Uh, yep, yeah, yeah, flashlights, take it. Uh, some health drink or yakled. I don't know why. It's called DX, which I think is uh, roughly based on a Japanese um, energy drink. I th think that's right. Oh, that's how you save your progress. Someday someone might experience these bizarre events. Hopefully they will find my notes useful. I'm not going to save, don't worry. Uh, whoops, sorry, Harry. Yeah, go this way. Um, uh, you also pick up. Melee weapon, which is fucking useless, but we'll take it anyway. And uh, another health drink, and the radio here. Now the radio, uh, he points out the radio is broken. He can't hear anything. Um, go outside. So we're going to equip the gun. There we go. There. Ready up. Go outside. I didn't mean to do that, Harry. <gasps> What's that? Huh, radio. What's going on with that radio? Walk over to it. And, oh my god! Uh, I've accidentally pressed the map button again. Run, 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 Harry, run! Oh, oh, oh! This is not a dream. What's happening to this place? Who knows, Harry? Who knows? So now it'll allow you to take the radio with you. There we go. And it will give off bursts of static. Uh, different types of static depending on what creatures are around you. Um, yeah. Okay, let's go outside. Where could Cheryl have gone? I guess I'll check that alley again. You can check the alley and I think it gives you a bit of a clue of where to go uh, next. Some stuff. Now, <clears throat> if we run up this way, and just outside the cafe, there we are, some more ammunition for the gun. Lovely. Uh, yeah, there's my handgun bullets there. I'm, just, I'm going into the convenience store, don't mind me. Yeah, when I played um, 
starting off for the first time. I I didn't. I found it very. I found the controls, if anything, in late in in the later game, very um, frustrating. In fact, I think a couple of reviewers even sort of mentioned that that realistically, it's a it's um, it is just frust they are just frustrating. They are very very tank controlly, and it sort of makes. Uh, as you saw with me trying to avoid those creatures in the alley, you can't really make sort of pinpoint uh, sort of movements. You sort of just roughly in the way you sort of think. Oh, that's an interesting jump there, Harry. Uh, and the way you think you need to go, you just have to sort of go that way and, and hope for the best. Uh, so I don't need to save because I'm not going to save. I think I've stripped this of everything. So it wasn't until I think I played it. Uh, quite a bit. It got to a point where I got frustrated and then put it down for probably the best part of about nine months or so. Woo! I'm gonna run off here, you're not gonna get me! I'm running off! Screw you, motherfuckers! Back down this alley, we're gonna run down here. Um, There it is. There it is. Put you down. And now what I should actually probably have done is... Um, oops. I've gone to the map screen again. I mean to do that. Oh, shit. No. Oops. Reload. There we go. Dog down here, I think. Demon dog. Oh no, there's another flying thing. There it is. Don't get up. Don't get up, doggy. Don't get up. Uh, there's another doggy down here. Yeah, you get over there. There we are. Stomp him to death. <sighs> right, beware the dog. I fear no demony dogs. And yeah, back down here. To school! Is it the Cheryl sketchbook? Hmm. She's at the school. Mm. But yes, anyway, Lels and Jelly Spoons, I think I am going to leave it there. Uh, that's given you a bit, hopefully, given you a bit of a rough idea of what, Res uh, what Resident Evil, what Silent Hill is like. But the sweat was running down my arms and onto my camera, which is why I've taken this thing off. But now it's cold, I'm cold because it's so sweaty. <laughs>《《》》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》
an enhanced version of the Infinity Engine, was used to create Baldur's Gate Enhanced Edition, the first new release for the franchise in nearly nine years. Baldur's Gate was developed by Canadian game developers Bioware, a company founded by practicing physicians Ray Musica and Greg Zashuk. The game was initially entitled Forgotten Realms. According to Musica, our head programmer had actually read every one of the Forgotten Realms books. Everything. Every single one of the short stories and paperbacks. He made a point of it. He really wanted to immerse himself. The game's development was spent simultaneously creating the game's content and Bioware's Infinity Engine. The primary script engine for the game, used mainly as a debugging tool, was Lua, and DirectDraw was used for the graphics. The game Wasteland was a major influence on Baldur's Gate, particularly its design philosophy of having more than one possible method of achieving each goal. Unusually for the time, the graphics were not built from tiles. Each background was individually rendered, which greatly extended the amount of time needed to create the game. At the time the game was shipped, none of the six-member team had previously participated in the release of a video game. Time pressures to complete the game led to the use of simple areas and game design. Ray Musica said that the team had held a passion and a love for the art. He believed that the game was successful because of this collaboration with Interplay. Baldur's Gate was released on the 30th of November 1998 and published by Black Island Studios, an internal division of Interplay. Baldur's Gate takes place in the fictional world of Ed Greenwood's Forgotten Realms setting during the year of 1368 DR, in the midst of an apparent iron shortage, where items made from iron inexplicably rot and break. Focusing upon a western shoreline of Faron, the game is set within a stretch of the region known as the Sword Coast which contains a multitude of ecologies and terrains, including mountains, forests, plains, cities and ruins. With the story encompassing both the city of Baldur's Gate, the largest and most affluent city in the region, and the lands south of it, including Cloud Peaks, the Wood of Sharp Teeth, the Cloakwood Forest, the town of Burgotts, the village of Nashkel, and the fortress citadel of Candlekeep. In addition to the region, a variety of organisations from the Forgotten Realms settings also feature as part of the game's main story, including the Xantarim, the Red Wizards of Thay, the Iron Throne, the Flaming Fist, I serve the Flaming Fist, the Chill, the Black Talons and the Harpers. The player takes the role of a young and orphaned ward of the Mage Gorion. The two live in the ancient library fortress of Candlekeep. Abruptly, the ward finds themselves ordered by Gorion to prepare to leave the Citadel together during the night, with no explanation. Nevertheless, you now stand before the Candlekeep Inn ready to purchase what you need for an unplanned and unexpected journey. On the night of leaving Candlekeep, a mysterious armoured figure and his cohort ambush the pair and order Gorion to hand over the ward. Hand over your ward and no one will be hurt. Gorion refuses and dies in the ensuing battle, whilst ensuring that his ward can escape. In the morning, the ward encounters Emowyn, a childhood friend who is an orphan like them and also lived in Candlekeep, who has followed them in secret. With no safe hiding place available, Candlekeep no longer accessible without Gorion's influence to circumvent the admission fee, the ward resolves to investigate the cause of the region's iron crisis. Baldur's Gate had low sales expectations from Interplay, and Bioware's internal sales goal was around 200,000 units, a number that PC Zone's Dave Wood said would justify work on a sequel. However, the game was a financial success. Within its first two weeks of release, the game sold 75,000 copies worldwide, and this pushed it to the number one position of the computer game sales charts in France, Germany, Canada, the United Kingdom, and the United States during this period. Its global sales totaled more than 500,000 copies by February of 1999, nearly 700,000 by the June, and roughly 1 million by the November. GameSpot described Baldur's Gate as an unprecedented commercial blockbuster. Global sales reached 1.5 million copies in 2001 and ultimately surpassed 2.2 million by 2003. I adore Baldur's Gate. This is the last edition that I bought of it uh, back in 2000. It's the PC DVD version that they released. I do think I have the original PC CD-ROM version that they released somewhere in my collection of old PC video games, but I don't actually have that in my studio, so. Baldur's Gate for me was actually the first introduction, although I didn't realise it at the time, into Dungeons and Dragons. It wasn't until probably after playing it and waxing lyrical to a friend of mine that they said, that's based on Dungeons and Dragons. I think I was aware what Forgotten Realms was back in 1998, but I wasn't into Dungeons and Dragons as it were. I love Baldur's Gate apart from 
one, one tiny caveat, and it's the thing that always, every time I try to replay it, because I have tried to replay it in the past a few times, but it's the one little thing that always just really... <clears throat> Luckily it's quite close to the beginning of the game, so I just need to throw it and then I'm all good. But at the very beginning, once you have decided to try and resolve the iron shortage that's happening along the Sword Coast, you have to go to an iron mine, and that iron mine is just a pain in the ass the first time I played it, I found it a pain in the ass the second time I played it, and every single time I've tried to replay Baldur's Gate in the last few years I've got to that bit and I have just gone, no, just can't be folk, there isn't enough time in the world, I'm leaving it. Which is a shame because there's so much more after that bit that's just so good and really fun to play. I can definitely recommend it if you've never got into Dungeons and Dragons and sort of want like a little bit of a, I suppose like a light introduction to it. Baldur's Gate is a great place to start. And actually Baldur's Gate is a great place to start if you've never come across Bioware either. They are obviously responsible for some really brilliant games, probably most famously obviously the Mass Effect series. I've had enough of your snide insinuations. and the Dragon Age series. Just so you know, if the king ever asks me to put on a dress and dance the Remigold, I'm drawing the line. Which are both brilliant games. One sci-fi fantasy, the other's sword and sorcery. Stand and deliver, that my hamster might have a better look at you. Some people in this city are too rich for their own good. Lucky they have me to give them a hand. Thief the Dark Project is a first-person stealth video game developed by Looking Glass Studios and published by Eidos Interactive. It was released in November in 1998 and this year marks its 20th anniversary. Set in a medieval steampunk metropolis called The City, the player takes the role of Garrett, a master thief trained by a secret society who, whilst carrying out a series of robberies, becomes embroiled in a complex plot that ultimately sees him attempting to prevent a great power from unleashing chaos on the world. Thief was the first PC stealth game to use light and sound as game mechanics and combined a complex artificial intelligence to allow immersive gameplay. The game is noted for its use of the first person perspective for non-confrontational gameplay, which challenges the first person shooter market and led to the developers to call it a first person sneaker, whilst it also has influences in later stealth games such as Splinter Cell and Hitman. The game received critical acclaim and has been placed on numerous Hall of Fame lists, achieving sales of over half a million units by the year 2000, and making it Looking Glass Studios' most commercially successful game. Thief was followed by Thief 2 The Metal Age in 2000, and Thief Deadly Shadows in 2004, and a reboot of the series in 2014 simply titled Thief. Thief takes place from a first person perspective, in a 3D environment, with the game's story taking place over a series of missions in which Garrett is able to perform various actions, such as leaning, crouching, swimming, climbing, running, fighting, amongst other abilities. The levels are largely unscripted and maze-like, which allows for emergent gameplay. The NPCs may either remain stationary or walk around on patrol routes, and players have the freedom to choose how to get around the obstacles in the level's environments in order to complete a specific task, such as getting through a locked door. In each level the player is given a set of objectives to complete, such as stealing a specific object, which they must complete in order to get to the next level. The player can choose to play on one of three different difficulty settings before starting each level, which they can change in between missions, with higher difficulty levels adding additional objectives, such as not killing human NPCs or stealing a certain amount of loot from the amount available within the level, changing the amount of health the player character has, and changing how sensitive the NPCs are to their environment. In some missions, players may find objectives being changed or new ones being added due to certain circumstances they encounter, whilst failing a key objective or dying will fail a level, forcing the player to either replay it or load up a previous save. As the game's emphasis is on stealth, players are encouraged to focus on concealment, invasion, distraction, misdirection and subtle takedowns rather than all-out confrontation. The player can engage in sword-based combat when the need arises and can perform three attacks as well as a parry, but has limited proficiency and damage resistance in such circumstances. 
Players must remain aware of their surroundings to assist them in remaining hidden. A special meter on the HUD in the form of a gem helps the players indicate their visibility to NPCs. The brighter the gem is, the more easier it is they can be visually detected. Thus, sticking to shady dark spots where the gem is dim ensures the player remains hidden. Although NPCs can still find them if they get too close in front of them. To remain quiet, players must be careful of how much noise they produce, as well as what surfaces they are moving on. Walking over soft surfaces like carpet or grass is preferable as footsteps remain quiet, compared to walking over metal floors and ceramic tiles that produce a lot of noise. NPCs also produce noise, either from whistling or walking, which can help players determine how far away they are from their own position. Noise can also be used by the player to mislead slash misdirect NPCs, such as throwing objects to lure them elsewhere. The game's NPCs feature an AI system that detects unscripted visual and oral cues. If an NPC sees or hears something out of place, it will react to this, depending on the level of its suspicion. If it's for a brief second, they will simply ignore it, but if it's for long enough, they will become alert to their surroundings and begin searching the area. NPCs will react to things such as clashing of swords or the reactions of other NPCs' voices, as well as to visual changes to their environment, such as bloodstains, open doors, or fallen bodies. Players can avoid leaving visual cues by cleaning up, such as hiding bodies. <coughs> NPCs are divided into three categories, guard, servant and non-human, whose reactions all vary. Guards will call out an alert if they spot the player and attack them, servants will run for help if they spot the player or a body, non-human NPCs will merely pursue and attack the player. To assist them on each level, the player character carries with them a few pieces of equipment. A blackjack that can incapacitate human NPCs, a sword which can kill NPCs, and a bow which can be used for ranged combat as well as as a tool. The player can use a variety of arrows with their bow, each varying in properties, for example. Water arrows can be used to douse torches and any other sources of fire, as well as clean up bloodstains. Rope arrows can attach a climbable rope to wooden surfaces. Moss arrows can cover an area with moss and muffle footsteps, and fire arrows that can relight torches and do considerable damage to NPCs. Who said that? Other tools that are also available include a lockpick, flash bombs, and potions. The player can cycle through the inventory of weapons slash arrows and tools through their HUD. In addition, the player can purchase additional arrows and tools in between levels with the loot they have acquired and find additional items during a level. The player can also find books and scrolls that contain information about the in-game lore and find useful clues about how to get around obstacles within levels. They may also find food that can be eaten and keys that can unlock doors, chests and crates. I wonder if he reads them or if it's just for show. Thief began development in April of 1996 for the game's original designer and writer Ken Levine, credited as a key figure in the creation of Thief. Inspiration came from two of his favourite games, Castle Wolfenstein and Diablo. The initial concept was to make an action role-playing game, and Levine was given the job of designing the game's world and story. Levine said that the initial ideas and projects that later morphed into Dark Camelot before eventually evolving into the Dark Project included School of Wizards, Dark Elves Must Die, and Better Red Than Undead the latter of which was a campy story about communist zombies. The game was supposed to be a first-person sword-fighting simulator, but the marketing department killed the idea to Levine's disappointment. According to programmer Mark LeBlanc, the first proposal was Better Red Than Undead, a 50s Cold War game where the Soviet Union was overrun with zombies and you had to hack them to pieces as a loner from the CIA because bullets don't work on the undead. Doug Church said that the game's design was built out of the idea of having factions who you could either ally with or oppose or do things for or not. The next concept, Dark Camelot, still focuses on sword combat. Its plot, an inversion of the Arthurian legend, featured Mordred as a misunderstood hero, King Arthur as a tyrannical villain, and Merlin as a psychopath. According to Church, the game featured Morgan Le Fay as Mordred's sort of good advisor and Guinevere as a lesbian who would betray Lancelot and help Mordred to break into Camelot to steal the Holy Grail. The game's design combined first-person perspectives with action, roleplay and adventure elements. Warren Spector, who had recently left Origin Systems to found Looking Glass Studios Austin, became Dark Camelot's producer. Artist Dan Thorne said, For a good long time we had no idea what the game was about until somebody stumbled upon the whole Thief gameplay where you're not just running around trying to chop people up. Church recalled that the basic stealth model was just having the guards look the other way whilst you were going past pretty quickly. 
Paul Narrath had been pushing for a while that the Thief side of it was the really interesting part, and why not just do a Thief game? A previously unreleased trailer for Dark Camelot was uploaded to YouTube in 2013. The game's prologue sees Garrett, the protagonist, describing his youth as a homeless orphan on the city streets. He is caught while attempting to pickpocket a suspicious man who reveals himself to be a keeper. Impressed by Garrett's ability to see him, he offers him the chance to join his order. Garrett accepts, but later leaves in order to pursue a life of thievery. Years later, Garrett is working as a thief and is under pressure to join a crime ring. As punishment for his failure to pay a protection fee, he is targeted for assassination by the crime lord Ramirez. Garrett evades the assassination and robs Ramirez's mansion in retaliation. Following this, he is approached by a woman named Victoria, the representative of an anonymous client who is impressed by Garrett's theft from Ramirez. He is contracted to steal a sword from Constantine, an eccentric nobleman who has recently arrived in the city. After Garrett completes the mission, Victoria takes him to Constantine, who explains that he hired Garrett to steal his own sword as a test. Constantine offers him a fortune to steal the Eye, a gem kept within a sealed and deserted Hamrite cathedral. Thief takes place in a metropolis called The City, which has been noted to contain elements of middle age like dark fantasy and the industrial revolution. The project director said in an early preview, in essence it's this undefined medieval age, a sort of medieval Europe meets Brazil meets the city of lost children. There's some electricity, there's some magic, and there's some 19th century machinery kind of stuff. The setting has been described as steampunk, a fantastical setting where steam engine technology is predominantly used. During levels, the player must learn about the settings by finding notes and overhearing conversations Conversations. The city contains three factions, the Keepers and two opposing religious orders, known as the Pagans and the Order of the Hammer, or Hammerites. The latter two have been the city's representations of chaos and order, respectively the neutral, secretive Keepers strive to maintain a balance within the city. The Hammerites worship a deity called the Builder and believe in progress, craftsmanship and righteousness, and the Pagans have been described as primitive, almost animalistic, and worship the dangerous trickster god and value the natural world. That way. Not me, neither. In early 1997, Dark Camelot's name was tentatively changed to The Dark Project, and its design altered to focus on thievery and stealth. Nevertheless, some of the levels originally designed for Dark Camelot ended up in the final project. Jeff Yaris said, The goal is for everything to behave as it should. For example, things that will burn, will burn. And then it's up to the player to decide to burn things, whether we've anticipated it or not. I don't know what that was. <clears throat> the first draft of the stealth design was presented by Levine, and Levine said that inspiration for the idea of being powerful when undetected and very vulnerable when exposed came from the concept of submarine warfare, in particular from the 1985 simulation video game Silent Service. Multiplayer support was planned, including Thief Match, a pun on Death Match, where small teams of thieves competed under time pressure to steal the greatest value of swag from a territory of wealthy NPCs and their guard. Full-scale development on The Dark Project began in May 1997, with frantic work on a demo level and a trailer for E3 of 1997. Originally announced to come out in the summer of 1997, the game was delayed to the winter of 97-98. Thief The Dark Project received critical acclaim from The Washington Post, PC Gamer and Computer Gaming World, who wrote, if you're tired of Doom clones and hungry for a challenge, give this fresh perspective game a try. We were pleasantly surprised. The game's use of the supernatural and cave exploring elements did receive criticisms and several reviewers opted that a more realistic mansion robbing missions should have been used instead. Reviewers thought that the game's undead enemies caused the game to degenerate to the standard hack and slash sub Conan sort of thing that Heretic and Hexen and millions of other games had given us and that it amounted to an erosion of storytelling skills that Looking Glass had once had. Thief was the first 3D stealth game for a PC and its stealth gameplay in innovations influenced later games in the genre. The game has been cited as the first to use light and shadow as a stealth mechanic and the first to use audio cues such as the ability to eavesdrop on conversations and alert guards with loud footsteps. 
the game's use of sound wave propagation, which allowed sounds to travel around corners and through rooms, became widely considered by game developers. Thief's influence can be recognised in other stealth games such as Assassin's Creed, Hitman, Splinter Cell and Tenshu. Tenshu Stealth Assassins is an action-adventure stealth game developed by Acquire and published by Sony Music Entertainment Japan. Tenshu is known for its stealth gameplay and its eerie settings of feudal Japan. The boss sent them on a special errand. Some fellow he wants dead. A thief. Name a Garrett. I've heard of him. Garrett. Known to be trifled with. That's what I heard. Not anymore if he's had a visit from those two. Well, Lils and Jelly Spoons, I hope you enjoyed that little uh, look at Thief the Dark Project. And now, as is the norm with this series, I'm going to be playing a little bit of Thief the Dark Project and giving you my experiences and how I feel about the game. Uh, and my experiences and how I feel about the game can pretty much be summed up in this first level, Lord Bafford's Manor. Here we are in the briefing screen uh, the difficulty is normal however that's a bit of a lie because normal in the thief universe is actually easy uh, you've got normal hard and expert but at normal what you've got is you've got to sneak into Lord um, Lord Bafford's manor case the place um, it's saying there that you can get in through the well at the back of the house it's probably the best bet uh, you can blackjack or pickpocket the guards if you want that would be the quietest You've got to find the prize scepter and do it without too much commotion. Dead easy, dead simple, right? So let's go on to hard, again, sneak into the manor, uh, find the scepter. In addition, pinch 350, doesn't say 350 gold or dollars or pounds, it just says steal 350 worth of valuables whilst in the manor. Don't kill any servants, just servants because they're harmless, and once you've achieved your goal, you need to get back out into the street. If we have a look at Expert, um, again, it doesn't really change too much. It just says 700 worth of valuables, and don't kill anybody. No servants, no guards, nothing, and then make it out into the street. Um, we're going to go for Hard, which is technically normal, and we're going to go Continue. Should take us to, yes, the item purchasing place. Now. Um, healing potions is the first level of the game. I seem to remember it's pretty heavy on healing potions anyway, so we're okay. Or healing items, I should say, because you get a lot of apples and lots of cheese if you go to the right place. Um, water arrows. We will get more water arrows. In fact, we'll take all four of those. Uh, broadhead arrows. We definitely don't need any more of them. I don't see us using any more than about two or three. Uh, the swords obviously in the blackjack so there we are play the mission here we go we're in Woohoo! lord bafford's manor there it is right in front of us press m to hit the old m uh, to hit the to find the map i should say um do not try a frontal assault obviously not that's not what this game is about and yeah see so one guard well basement entrance uh, bafford's manor first floor Whew. Uh, oh yes, there is an arrow cache over there, so let's go and get that. If we go this way, we should trigger a conversation with the guards. Hey, I'm going to the bear pit tomorrow. You want to come with? No. Couldn't pay me enough. No, I, I'm with you, mate. Um, that goes on for quite a while about like the bear fights. I seem to remember it being quite funny, but uh, that's not what we're here to... You know, this video isn't about the various conversations you can have within the Thief games. Yeah, I'll just turn it. Oh, there's a uh, passerby. Evening! Oh, don't say anything to me then, you rude bastard. Let's just put them away for now. Let's walk around here. Uh, there's the sewer entrance. I believe you get out through the sewers. You can get in through the sewers, but it's been... I'm not going to lie, it's probably been about 10 years since I last played Thief the Dark Project. If you've watched my video on... Um, Ten game, sorry, five games I play each year. Thief 2, I play an awful lot of. Uh, I love that game. It is genuinely, it's, I mean, you know, it's such a brilliant game. How's it going? Okay, very well, my, my, my fine friend. I'm just going to go this way and see your drunk friend here. I'm going to run past you. And I'm going to 
crouch behind you, pickpocket you, use that to open the well, turn around, and lock the door. Lovely. Um, stand up again, and then jump. Here we go! Splish! Splash! I was taking a Milo out with a shotgun. Call back to an older video there. <laughs> yeah. Look at this very late 90s water. Oh god. But yeah, as I was saying, Thief 2, by easily the better game, just because it took out the supernatural element, which I was never a big fan of because it did just make the game a little bit too hack and slashy and you know that's not what this game is about it's not what it should be about um, I will say that I've only ever completed Thief the Dark project and played the levels of Thief Gold but I've never actually completed Thief Gold if that makes sense so yeah now uh, Bafford I'm just saying you've got this massive hole in the side of your mansion uh, there's uh, and some quite severe damage there and this is going to be doing nothing for your uh, house or your mansion value you know let's get in inside at last um, ever ever since I can remember uh, ever since I can remember first playing this mission I always for some reason do this right okay play this stupid little game okay and it's in that's one for one Oh no! Balls did up. Balls did up. That's two for three. Yeah, three for four. Not perfect, you know, it's been a long time since I played this, so, you know. Let's get in there. Oh. The sir could really beef up security. Look at me. See, healing potion. Well, I've been thinking we should watch the outside. That's stupid. People don't worry about their on the inside. No, then you catch them before they get inside, you taffer. Oh! Again, this is one of the great the things that I really loved about this game. It was about listening to for guards. There's no mini-map. There's no sort of... Uh, you have to do this the old school way of like listening to girls, listening to what they're saying, listening for their footsteps. It does get very intense at some points, as you'll probably find out later in this particular uh, mission. Oh, come on, I need to get behind you before you get into that room. There we are. No, I don't think anybody finds you if you're there. There's nothing valuable down here, is there? No, no. Anything up here? No. Okay. No. Like I say, it's been a long time since I played this game, I can't remember. And then through here, open that, one flash bomb, close that, since we don't want to accidentally throw a flash bomb, so, because I want that apple just there. Okay, so my experiences with Thief the Dark Project. Well, it will have started back in probably about 1998. Um, myself and um, a friend of mine were very avid readers of PC Format magazine, which is sort of like a tech magazine. I don't think it's still around, unfortunately, but uh, they used to, every month they had like a little demo disc with uh, software and games on it. And we were just going through it as we normally did, just checking all of the games out. And then there was this one, just simply called Thief. And we read the review in the magazine about it and we're like, my god, that sounds fascinating. And we installed it and I kid you not, we were both, we were like, this is fucking brilliant. Like, it was this, the demo was literally the Bafford Manor, but I don't, the objectives weren't the same, I don't think. Um, now, one of these has got something good in it. That's that As one. Since I'm in here, I might as well pick up something for myself. 
I hate to point this out to you, Garrett, but you have to. It's part of the uh, one of the objectives. You need to pick some stuff up. Oh, well, shut them as well. Make the place look tidy. Mm -hmm. okay. Don't want anyone to be suspicious. I think we're in the servants' quarters. Yeah, if we go this way, we should find a servant asleep there. This way, there should be some awake servants here. Lovely. Okay. But yeah, so. Oh, hello. Right, I hit that by mistake. Fucking pillock. I'm just gonna put you out here, mate. Don't, don't you worry. I'm gonna, I'm gonna take you back to your bed. Come on now, come on. That's it. Put you in here. Put you in here. Shh, shh. Don't, don't want to wake up your, uh, your neighbour. You can, you can wake them up, and the, the animation for them waking up is hilarious because they literally just go from being flat like that to being upright like that. Um, yeah, good old 1990s technology. Okay, go through here. Let's take that. See, I knew that was valuable. Okay, bits of food, excellent. A bit of cheese. Carrots, bit of bread. Oh, is that a? I don't know. Um, bit of ham. Lamb. Okay, there's be a note on here. Cedric, please speak to the cook about last night's dinner. Well, technically, the menu conformed to my instructions. I suspect that the lamb was somewhat older than this spring, and. I am in no way fooled by his practices of warming the salad to disguise wilting. If the cook is incapable of finding adequate ingredients, he can be replaced. And if he offers the same excuse about the stone market shortage, please remind him that the grocery budget is a good 50% above last year's figure, figures, I should say, and even he should be able to procure adequate victuals at those prices. Love and kisses, Lord Bafford. <laughs> but yeah, again, that's that's another thing that I absolutely adored about this game, it's stuff like that. It's, you know, you had to read those things to find out where stuff was. Yes, it could get a little bit irritating at times. Am I going the right way? Am I going the right way? I, right, okay, I'll be honest, I'm a little bit lost. Um, but I think it's this way. Yes. Ah, yes. Okay. Four. Let's take it. That. Let's take it. That. We're definitely in the castle now. Um, if you see the um, me spazzing out, uh, controls-wise, oh, there's a guard. Um, that is because the standard controls are W A. The standard controls are not W A S D. They are S. They are S Z, X and C, and W is the run button. Um, yeah, it's now he turns round. He gets to yeah. There he goes. Now these guys. Oh yeah, another drunk guard in here. So don't wanna, don't wanna give the game away that I'm in here. Yeah, there he 
it's a drunk guard. Who's there? No one, Is sorry. No. You were, don't worry about it. I mean, I imagine things all the time. Thunk. <laughs> As you can see there, hit detection boxes. Not top of the... Uh... Now, if I remember rightly, there is a guy that comes through here. Um, also, I do apologise if uh, the game seems a little bit dark. It is it is kind of awkward to show off a game that the idea about it is that you stay in the darkness. Ooh. Yes, no, yes. Don't try to keep an eye on both. <laughs> uh, but again... You know, this, back in 1998, you, although this kind of feels a little bit like, what, a, maybe a slower version of um, Splinter Cell or Metal Gear Solid, um, this, this genuinely was just like, oh god, this is the game that I've been wanting for years. you there put you there um yeah this was the game that like i i wanted like it wasn't just go going in going home and just killing things this was you know this was kind of like i always think that this this game was the one that sort of started the whole stealth done properly in a game right i need to remember which way i'm going Going this way. No, I'm not. I've gone the wrong way. I noticed there was a guard back there. I'm hoping he doesn't see me. I wonder if he reads them or if it's just for show. I like to think that he reads them all. Okay, that one's not worth anything. It's the gold ones. Papyrus again. You had to read these things to, you know, make sure they were of any use. Did, did the papyrus one actually say anything? Me lordy Bafford, speaks he to Ginny. Did you bid? Deckbow the Hammerheart hath been a foot, a sulk, a ferreting about. Gabbing many a one to vanish in the cold stone down below their forgy chained cells. Tooks they your dealer Tarquis in their clutches night past, and two patrons as well, name of Leslie and Rian. I think it's meant to be Ryan. Scupper, scup, scuppered, 
cupboard. As they left. And those not the first, cries Ginny. Little wonder, then, dith Deckbow if Deckbow grows, sparse come these days, of course. Alack, o oh, ye blame, to one hand, but then I gave Ginny a firm understanding ye. Blood and doom of the whole book. And so he'll be learning him... Hang on, Ginny's a him. Okay, I thought it was Ginny. Ginny Weasley. Anybody? No? Yeah? Okay, apparently. Apparently the Weasleys didn't know what were going on. No, hang on. Was this written about the same time as Harry Potter? Can't remember. Um, oh, I've lost me character now. So he'll be learning him all he can about how to turn the hammers off him. Never you fear. About your Victoria, nothing yet. Walk she an inch above the ground for all the dirt of her footprints I have found. That's obviously foreshadowing for uh, for later on. Because uh, obviously it's all about the last Victoria. Uh, right. I need to be... Oh, yeah, compass. Oh. be able to see just out there but you can't turn the lights off now these guys these badass mamba jambas this is why I've switched to broad headed arrows they are the elite guards so you know you're getting close to um, something important They will hear me. <clears throat> if I am not careful. And ideally what you want to do is you want to take them out. There's another one coming. What I see there. No, no, you don't. You definitely don't. <laughs> I heard something. No, you definitely Just didn't. The wind, I guess. Okay, like I say, I've not played this game for, for some time. I'm I'll, I'll let you decide what the uh, what the P stands for. Whew. Okay. Okay. So here we go. Uh, I need to pull it about now. And oh, oh well, I didn't kill him. Blood, hang on. I need, I need to pick you up. I need to pick you up. Get in that corner. Jesus Christ on a crutch. Right. Whew. Okay, so that was me a bit of murder. Um, I said I'd use about three arrows. <laughs> um, I'm not going to take this guy out because you know we don't. If we don't need to kill, we shouldn't. The only reason I kill that guy is because they've got hearing like a something that's got phenomenally good hearing so you know what oh shit I know you're around here somewhere no 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 other way other way other way yeah. 
just the wind, I guess. It was. It was indeed just the wind. I had a rushed lunch. I'm very windy. He's going to go that way. Oops, right. Come on, open. Uh, in there. Excellent, I've got enough gold or whatever. Yeah. I should have nabbed his key, because if, um, oh, I don't have, I've only got broad head and water arrows, I don't have any. rope arrows so I can't rope into the ceiling. Right, this guy is also a pain in the ass. You can hit the uh, gongs that I'm looking straight at at the minute, but they will also call the guy in the corridor. So yeah, you are a bit... Um... But again, this guy has got super fucking hearing. Turn around. Turn the fuck around, mate. Go on, turn around. You know you want to. Go on, look behind you. Almost. Almost. Just another 90 degrees and we'll be there. Jesus. on the precipice. Oh yeah, this is one of those games where you can't see your feet. Um, I am on, right. He needs to turn around and I need to, to go. What's there? Nope, nothing, nothing, nothing's there. Nothing's there. Seems quiet enough now. Yep. Oh well. Shit! You don't, you don't need to get... Hello? Anyone there? No. I guess not. <sighs> okay, we're just gonna we're just gonna move like this. I'm absolutely convinced that I am on. <clears throat> there we go. On the rug. Come on, you motherfucker. <laughs> Turn around. Turn around, you. Ah. Stop! Don't move! <laughs> I like the fact that basically he's gone in, he's done that, he's like, I, well, I don't know where this guy is now. He's like, I'm in a completely dark room and I ain't got a clue. I should have nabbed his key. Should have nabbed his key. He's off out. <sighs> right, 
Okay. <laughs> it's a throne room. How pretentious can you get? Quite pretentious, apparently. Um, but yeah, I've got this. I've got the scepter. I just need to get back outside now. I can't remember how the quickest way to do it is. We're going to go back the way we came. This way. And then this way. Oh god, bloody control scheme. This way, down here. Out into the streets. Woohoo! Done! <sighs> it looks like your party has been cancelled. Spooky, scary skeletons and shivers down your spine. Resident Evil 2, known in Japan as Biohazard 2, is a survival horror game developed and published by Capcom and released for the Sony PlayStation in 1998. The player controls Leon S. Kennedy and Claire Redfield, who must escape Raccoon City after its citizens have been transformed into zombies by a biological weapon two months after the events of the original Resident Evil. Jill Sandwich! The gameplay focuses on exploration, puzzles and combat. The main difference from its predecessor are its branching paths, with each protagonist having unique storylines and obstacles. Resident Evil 2 was directed by Hideki Kimia and produced by Shinji Mikami director of the first Resident Evil, and it was developed by a team of 40 to 50 people over 21 months. Resident Evil 2 received praise for its atmosphere, setting, graphics and audio, and has appeared on a list of several best games ever made. However, its controls, voice acting, inventory system and puzzles have garnered it some criticism. It is, however, the most popular Resident Evil game for a single platform, selling well over 1 million copies on the PlayStation, and it's also been ported to Windows, the Nintendo 64, the Dreamcast, the GameCube, and a modified 2.5 version was released for the Gamescom handheld. The story of Resident Evil 2 was retold and built upon in several later games, and has been adapted into various licenses of work. It was followed by Resident Evil 3 Nemesis in 1999, and a remake, also entitled Resident Evil 2, is due for release in January 2019. Get back! As a survival horror game, Resident Evil 2 features the same basic gameplay mechanics as its predecessor Resident Evil. The player explores a fictional city while solving puzzles and fighting monsters. The game's two protagonists may be equipped with firearms, but limited ammunition adds a tactical element to weapon use. On the status screen, the player can check the condition of the protagonist, use medicine to heal their wounds, and assign weapons. The character's current health can also be determined by their posture and movement speed. For example, a character will hold their stomach in pain if they're wounded, or will limp slowly if they're on the verge of death. The protagonist may carry a limited number of items, and may store other items, in boxes placed throughout the game world. Each protagonist is joined by a support partner during the course of their story, and these characters accompany the player in certain scenes, and occasionally become playable. Certain rooms contain typewriters that players may use to save their game, however each save expands one of the limited number of ink ribbons which the player must collect within the game world. The main addition over the preceding games is the zapping system, by which each of the two playable characters are confronted with different puzzles and storylines in their respective scenarios. After finishing the A scenario with one protagonist, a B scenario, in which the events are depicted from the other character's perspective, is unlocked. The player has the option of starting an A scenario with either of the two protagonists, resulting in a total of four different scenarios. Actions taken in the first playthrough affect the second. For example, the availability of a certain item may be altered. After each game, the player receives a ranking based on the total time taken to complete the scenario and the number of saves and special healing items used. Depending on the player's accomplishments, 
bonus weapons and costumes may be unlocked as a reward. The original version of Resident Evil 2 contains two standalone minigames, the fourth survivor and the tofu survivor. In both of these minigames, the player must reach the goal whilst fighting enemies along the way with only the default loadout. All later versions, except the Nintendo 64 version, added a third minigame, Extreme Battle, which consists of four playable characters and three stages. On September 29th, 1998, Two months after the events of the first Resident Evil, most of the citizens of the Midwest American mountain community Raccoon City have been transformed into zombies by the T-Virus, a biological weapon secretly developed by the pharmaceutical company Umbrella. Leon S. Kennedy, a police officer on his first day of duty, and Claire Redfield, a college student looking for her brother Chris, make their way to Raccoon City's police department. They discover that most of the police force has been killed, and that Chris has left to investigate Umbrella headquarters in Europe. They split up to look for survivors and find a way out. While searching for an escape route, Claire meets a little girl, Sherry Birkin, who is on the run from an unknown creature, and Leon encounters Ada Wong who claims to be looking for her boyfriend, John, an umbrella researcher. Sorry about that. Development of Resident Evil 2 began one month after the completion of its predecessor in early 1996. The first footage of the game was shown at the V-Jump Festival in 96. This early build, later dubbed Resident Evil 1.5, produced by Shinji Mikami, differs dramatically from the released version in scenarios, presentation and gameplay mechanics. Its plot follows the same basic outline of Resident Evil 2 and features a zombie outbreak in Raccoon City two months after the events of the first game. However, in this version, Umbrella had already been closed down as a consequence of their illegal experimentation. The development team sought to retain the same level of fear from the original game and thus introduced to the narrative two new characters who lacked experience dealing with terrifying situations, Leon Kennedy, largely identical to his persona in the final build, and Eliza Walker, a college student and motorcycle racer who was vacationing in her hometown of Raccoon City. Unlike the final version, the story paths of Leon and Eliza do not cross, and each character has two support characters instead of just one. Leon received help from fellow police officer Marvin Branner and a researcher named Linda, an early build version of Ada, whilst Eliza was aided by Sherry Birkin and a man named John, who appears in Resident Evil 2 as the gun shop owner Robert Kendo. There were also more encounters with surviving policemen, such as a superior officer to Leon called Roy. The police department in which Resident Evil 1.5 began had more of a modern and realistic design, and was smaller than the final build seen in Resident Evil 2. The number of polygons used for enemy models was far lower than the release version as well. This allowed for more zombies to appear on screen, a method of invoking fear in the player that recurred throughout Resident Evil 1.5. Furthermore, the game employed dynamic music and frequently applied alterations to the pre-rendered background in response to events during gameplay. The playable character could be equipped with gear such as protective clothing that enhanced their defences and enabled them to carry more items, and the character's polygon models were altered by the costume changes and the damage received from enemies. The development of the game was carried out by 40 to 50 people and was led by the director Hideki Kamiya. The team composed of new Capcom employees and over half of the staff of the original Resident Evil. Jill Sandwich. In the initial stages of the development, producer Mikami often had creative disagreements with Kamiya and tried to influence the team with his own direction. He eventually, however, stepped back to an overseeing role as producer and only demanded to be shown the current build once a month believing that the game's assets to be good individually, but not yet satisfactory as a whole. Mikami expected everything to come together within three months leading up to the projected May 1997 release date. Shortly thereafter, however, Resident Evil 1.5 was scrapped at the development stage of 60-80% to 80 complete, Mikami later explaining that the game would not have reached the desired level of quality for the aforementioned period, and especially frowned upon the gameplay and the locations for being dull and boring. The story of Resident Evil 1.5, with which Mikami plans to end the series, was criticised by supervisor Yoshiki Okamoto, who found it to be too conclusive to allow for further instalments. Instead, Okamoto posed the creation of a fictional universe, which would turn Resident Evil into a meta-series, similar to Gundam or James Bond, in which self-contained stories with a common element could be told. During a period in which the team made no progress rewriting the scenario, Okamoto was introduced to professional screenwriter Noburo Sugumara, who was enthusiastic about the game's story. Sugumara was initially consulted on a trial basis, but Okamoto was so impressed by the ease in which the writer came up with solutions to the problems that plagued the script, he soon asked him to compose the entire scenario for Resident Evil 2. 
One of the fundamental modifications to the story was the reworking of Eliza Walker into Claire Redfield, giving players that link to the original game. Only a few assets from Resident Evil 1.5 could be recycled, as the principal locations for the final build were made to look more extravagant and artistic, based upon photographs taken by the interiors of western-style buildings in Japanese cities. Apart from the graphics, one of the most important new features was the zapping system, which was partially inspired by Back to the Future Part 2, a time-travelling film sequel that offered a different perspective on a story from the original film. The voiceovers by the all-Canadian cast for Resident Evil 2 were recorded before the actual cutscenes were completed, with each of the actors selected from the roster of 10 people per role thereafter. The full motion videos FMVs, were created by filming stop-motion animations of action figures, which were then rendered into complete pictures with computer graphics CG tools. Ada's movie model could not be finished in time, and thus she's the only main character not to appear in a pre-rendered cutscene. Several changes had to be made between regional releases of Resident Evil 2, the North American version contained a more violent game over screen, which was removed from the Japanese Biohazard 2. Oh! After its initial release for the PlayStation in January of 1998, Resident Evil 2 was reissued and ported to other systems, often gaining new features in the process. The first re-release was the DualShock version, which incorporated support for the PlayStation's DualShock controller. Other additions included a new unlockable minigame called Extreme Battle, and Rookie Mode that enabled the player to start the main story with a powerful weapon and unlimited ammunition. The Japanese release of the DualShock version contained a USA version, a mode based on the difficulty level of Resident Evil 2's Western release. The DualShock version served as the base for the majority of ports, such as the Windows PC CD version Resident Evil 2 Platinum. Aside from retaining all the previous added features, the PC version ran at higher resolutions, and a data gallery was added to the main menu, allowing players to view movies, rough sketches, illustrations and 3D models. In February of 2006, a Japanese exclusive Windows XP compatible PC DVD was released that included higher quality FMVs. The Dreamcast version keeps all the additions from the PC release and incorporates a real-time display of the character's condition on the VMU, Visual Memory Unit. The Japanese edition of the Dreamcast port was given the subtitle Value Plus and came with a playable demo of Resident Evil Code Veronica. An unmodified port of the DualShock version was released for the Nintendo GameCube, and the initial PlayStation version was re-released for the Japanese PlayStation Network in 2007, whilst the North American counterpart received the DualShock version two years later. The Nintendo 64 version of Resident Evil 2 differs the most from all other releases. It is one of the very few games on the system to have FMVs, despite the limited storage space on the cartridge. Over the course of 12 months and with a budget of $1 million, Resident Evil 2 was ported to the N64 by a team of nine full-time people and one part-time person from Angel Studios, with further help provided by a staff of 10 from Capcom's Production Studio 3 and Factor 5. This version offers features that were not included in any other system release, such as alternative costumes and the ability to adjust the degree of violence and change the colour of blood, a randomizer to place items differently through each playthrough, and a more responsive first-person control system. Additionally, the port features 16 new in-game documents known as the EX files, hidden throughout all four scenarios, and they reveal information about the series lore and connect the story of Resident Evil 2 to other instalments, including some instalments that hadn't even been released at the time. A port was considered for the Sega Saturn and was in development at Capcom for a time, but technical difficulties led to its cancellation in October of 1998. But probably the most infamous port is the Tiger Electronics sprite-based 2.5D version for their Game.com handheld in late 1998. It includes only Leon's story path and removes several of the game's core features. Finally, in February 2013, an unfinished build of Resident Evil 1.5 was leaked onto the internet. Resident Evil 2 received critical acclaim, however, in Italy, Resident Evil 2 was temporarily banned in 1999, following criticisms from the political civil rights movement for its realistic depiction of violence, with law enforcement agencies seizing over 5,500 unsold copies. Sony Computer Entertainment asked for a re-examination of the seizure and the ban was lifted a few months later. The original PlayStation release holds an average 89 to 100 points on Metacritic, and the majority of reviews praised Resident Evil 2 for its atmosphere, setting, graphics and audio, but criticised its controls and voice acting and certain gameplay elements. IGN thought the game's atmosphere was 
dead on, claiming that the graphics, sound effects, music and level design all worked well to create a spooky, horror-filled world. GameSpot shared the opinion and found the game to be like a production out of Hollywood. They believed that it was a, more like an interactive cinematic experience than a video game. GameSpy and Eurogamer praised the zapping system for adding to the story and increasing the replay value of the game. They thought the idea of actions in the first scenario affecting the second was a cool concept, but said that it was underused in the game. Resident Evil probably has one of the most robust legacies within the video gaming sphere. We've seen comic book adaptations that try and focus on characters from the original game, such as Barry. We've seen romantic comedy takes on Resident Evil 2, focusing around Claire, Leon and Ada. We've seen a more direct novelization of Resident Evil 2, Resident Evil City of the Dead, written by S.D. Perry, who also wrote a series of novelizations for most of the Resident Evil series, all the way up to Resident Resident Evil Zero. There have been mobile games, Resident Evil Uprising that's a condensed version of the Resident Evil 2 story, Resident Evil The Dark Side Chronicles which was the on-rail shooter for the Wii released in 2009 which has a reimagining of the Resident Evil 2 plot. We've seen Resident Evil 2 audio dramas developed by Capcom staff, one focusing on Sherry Birkin straight after the events of Resident Evil 2 where she's separated from Claire after they're trying to escape from Umbrella Soldiers sent in to cover up and kill any survivors of Raccoon City. And finally, we have Spy Ada, which is set a few days after Resident Evil 2, and it deals with Ada's mission to try and retrieve Sherry Birkin's pendant that had the G-Virus sample in it, which is said to be in the possession of Hunk, and is probably one of the more fleshed out additional stories in the Resident Evil universe. Put on the battered desktop and looked at Wesker. You're sending Bravo in. The captain gazed back at him impassively, arms folded across his chest. Standard procedure, Chris. Chris sat down, frowning. Yeah, but with what we talked about last week, I thought... And finally, as I'm sure we're all aware, we have the Resident Evil 2 remake, due for release in January 2019. It was announced in August of 2015, and is set for release on the PlayStation 4, Xbox One, and Windows. Well, Littles and Jelly Spoons wasn't that interesting. Yes, you know the crack by now. This is the bit of the video where I play a little bit of the game, and give you my uh, experiences with it and my feelings on it. This one is a little bit different though, chaps, because today we'll be playing this. Yes, this is my copy of Resident Evil The Director's Cut that came with the Resident Evil 2 demo. Just because I have such fond memories of, of this game, uh, going away and buying it. So let's get into it. So whilst we get into the game, uh, let me tell you a little bit about my experiences. I've not played this demo disc since probably about 1997. Uh, there was a TV show in the UK called Games Master. Um, our American cousins might not be aware of it. I was very much aware of it. Look it, look it up. I'm not going to go into the details about it. But it was watching that uh, one day and they had this news section. They said there's going to be a sequel to Resident Evil. Uh, called Re Resident Evil 2 is due out next year. Um, there's going to be a demo released for it in the Resident Evil Director's Cut. And here it is, that's it, slap bang, yes, excellent, lovely. Anyway, might be a few glitches on it. I am playing it through a PlayStation 3. I remember hearing about it after watching Games Master. Uh, I immediately went out, I remember I went after school one day to pick up a copy of it and I was really nervous because it's obviously it's a uh, Certificate 15, if you can see there, and I was only just 15. So I was really proud of the guy behind the counter wasn't going to believe that I was 15 and wouldn't sell me. And I was like, oh, come on, come on, come on, come on. So I remember I sort of went in into Virgin Megastore, um, you yeah, know, remember them. Went, and to be fair, it was dead easy. The guy was clearly, it was clearly getting to the end of the day. And I'm in, and I'm in. And it was clearly the end of the day, and the guy didn't give two hoots about who was selling this game to. I think he just wanted to finish for the day. Still got it, still got it. Um, I appreciate, I think it is a little bit dark. Is there anything I can do about that? Oops, it is. Just, there we are, get through there. Bang in, through the door. Now, now you're going to see some of that classic Resident Evil bad act, uh, bad voice acting. Freeze! 
Who are you? What are you doing here? I mean, I've just clearly opened the door very well. Hold your fire! I'm a human! Interestingly enough, when if you Sorry. play the game as Claire, the first scenario as Claire, he um, he refers What's to her as Babe. So he's like, oh, "Sorry about that, Babe." I used to I used to think that was hilarious when I was a kid. I don't have a clue. Sorry about that, Babe. I think it became a bit of a saying between me and my friends. The entire city was infested with zombies. Right, so that's good old Robert Kendo. Um, now I don't know if in the this demo if there's the Brad secret, if you don't pick anything up on the way to the police station. Do you know, to say that I played this demo to death when I was a kid, I don't remember the I don't remember the this weird Yeah, I don't remember that. Is there an alternative at any room I can see my progress? Uh, thought there was another. Now, there we go. Ooh. Now, I can't remember if you can run in. Grab the shotgun. Grab the shotgun. Oh, I've been bitten twice. Grab that shotgun, Leon. Grab that shotgun. Come on. Run. Leg it. Leg it. Leg it. Yeah, I mean, I. I've, uh, I've played Resident Evil quite recently, Resident Evil 2. Um, I've played... Oh, can you... Can you get down the other side of this? Uh, oh yeah, because this, this layout's slightly different, isn't it? Yeah. There we go. Just, just. I did that one. I did that one for the kids. That one's for you. Yeah. So anyway, after I had uh, bought the the game from Virgin Mega Store, yeah. So bought the uh, game from Virgin Mega Store. So it wasn't a problem. Got it home. Actually popped in uh, Resident Evil first and played that for about an hour just to see what the game was like. And I was like, yeah, actually this is quite cool. Um, made the mistake. Of Picking Chris on my first ever playthrough, um, so that was a bit of a yeah, fecked up a bit there. But there you go. You can't get this one's locked. Isn't it? Yeah, got in here. Preview. Um, also, they don't have the uh, 180 quick turn in this, which is a pain. Locked the letter P is etched beneath the keyhole. Yeah, I think I have to go. And yeah, so played it for about an hour, was really into it, thought, yeah, this is this is quite cool. Uh, and then thought, right, now I want to see Resident Evil 2. I want to see what, what all the fuss is about. Put it in. I kid you not, I played this I played the demo, played all the way through it and immediately played it again like literally it finished and i was just like right i'm playing that again i'm playing that demo again that is awesome get off me you swine there we go Okay, the precinct key, it's the one that's got P etched on it, yeah. Uh, I am genuinely missing the, uh, the quick turn. Oh, you can, you can get in the bin, mate. It shows again, yes, I, I, 
To say I genuinely played this over and over and over again until Resident Evil 2 was actually released. To be fair, I mean, I've probably played Resident Evil more times now than I've actually played this demo. That I... Can you just... Let's go to yes. But I'm going to have to plug in my old, my actual PlayStation just to check that... To check if that squelching noise is a glitch. Oh, there should be a, should be a thing here. Uh, here it comes, here it comes. <gasps> what was that? <laughs> so, again, for, for people who have never played a Resident Evil game, oops, you know, this, this, this is as good as it gets. I'm not, I'm, ooh. Right, now, there's a guy there, clearly without a head. Seeing it seems to have... Oh, again, this is demo, this is original game-itis, this is. Yeah, sorry, I know what's coming. Um, in Resident Evil 2, you check his body again, he's got some bullets uh, on him. But clearly, not in the preview. Uh, Woo! Okay. Okay. Yeah, not so tough, are you now? You get the FMV sequence, obviously, in the full game, and um, it is it, it's a little bit more terrifying. Right, don't need to see you anymore, do I? Um, do I need to go into this room? Can I go into this room? It's locked. No, the letter L is it? No, the letter L. This is actually, you know, I'm sort of discovering, oh, I actually know fuck all about this uh, demo, because again, not played it for so many years. Um, bullets! Bullets! Cute. Don't think you get any more, sh I'm pretty sure you don't, you only get uh, that set of shotgun shells. Oh, I think this use. Oh yeah, yeah. There you go. One of the first puzzles. I don't know if you actually need a red jewel. Maybe you do. Do I need it for the? Hang on. Is that a map of the precinct? No, it's not. Oh well. I thought it was going to be a map of the precinct. Yeah, so for those of you who've never played Resident Evil game before, then, uh, by the way, I know I'm going back on myself, I'm just going back into the... Uh, main entrance to see if I have to put this somewhere. Do, 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 do. The red jewel. So yeah, it's like, this game has obviously got very strong undertones of like classic zombie movies in it and I just remember when I was, fifth, you know, when I was about 15 14, 15, 16, I was sort of very much getting into zombie movies and I was like, oh god, you know, these are these are amazing. So obviously when I saw this. No, okay, obviously. Was I meant to have checked the computer then? I know, I should have done this on my first. I should have done it on my first pass through. I know, I know. People are probably screaming at me going, can you make me do this? You should have done this. Oh. 
lovely. Again, every time you see me do like a little step back like that, it's because muscle memory is telling me to do the 180 uh, reverse, which, if I'm right, wasn't introduced until, was it the DualShock version of Resident Evil 2? Or possibly, actually Resident Evil 3. So I've played Resident Evil 3 quite recently. Um, I was having a bit of a... I was having a bit of a change up because I thought, do you know what, I've not actually... Where is it? It's up here. Having a bit of play of good old Resident Evil 3 there. Um, because I thought to myself, I've not played it for a while. If I don't think I've played through... Well, I've played through Resident Evil fairly recently, but I hadn't... Until then I hadn't played through it for a good couple of years. And I was like, oh, I think it's probably time to play through it again. Okay, clearly I need to put the gem... Either, either, either the gem is completely useless... Or I have to use it somewhere else. It's a lady zombie! Yeah. Let's see if we can get into it. It's locked. The letter S is... Oh, no, there isn't. Uh, can I get into here? I can. In the same room. That music. I am telling you now, that music. Oh, there is a chest in here. Uh, ditch that. Handgun bullets, yeah, I'll take them. First aid spray. I don't necessarily think I need another first aid spray. Uh, I could put that one in. Okay. Uh, and then what we're going to do is combine those two and then combine those two. Excellent. Don't think you get anything else in here. The other thing that the other thing that I, I loved about uh, Resident Evil 2 in particular, uh, which uh, the other the other thing that I love partic uh, particularly about Resident Evil 2 is if you've ever seen I think I did put it into the, uh, the video beforehand is um, the uh, yes this puzzle is still here the uh, trailer in Japan was directed by George A. Romero for the game and he was actually originally down to uh, direct the film, the Resident Evil films, but uh, there was, I don't, I can't quite remember the ins and outs of it, but basically it got shifted to uh, Paul W.S. Anderson, who a lot of people um, say did a bad job of the films. I think the first film is... The first two films I think are... The first two films I think are probably the best of a bad bunch. Um, they ain't great. I think everyone has to sort of admit that. I do have a... I have a little bit of a, a guilty pleasure for, for the first two. I was like, actually, do you know what? They're not horrendous. And I actually, to a degree, I actually agree with his standpoint on when critics say, why did you not just, you know, why did you not just do the plotline of the first game? And he was like, well, if you want to know the plotline of the first game, go and play the first game. It was like, he was his own take on it. And I still, I have a certain amount of respect for, for that. Okay, so you do get both gems. Okay. Yes, I will. Mm. 
Oh, well, there's more zombies in here. Let's see if I can. Whoops. Let's see if I can make it past you. There we go. I don't know if I need to. Is there one down here as well? Yes, there is. Let's go that way. Schooled him! But I'm gonna blow your bloody head off anyway. Oh, God! Again, I'm trying to do the. Hang on. Yep. Oh, Jeff's gonna get up. Excuse me. No. Ah. So now I can tell I'm genuinely on caution. I'll use the first aid spray, go on. Ooh. And so here we are in the Star's office, which I always, I, I like, do you know what, the minute I, because I, I had played the first game for about an hour, and sort of got the general gist of, like, the Star's team and, and whatnot, then actually to play this bit in the demo, I was like, oh my god, that's amazing, like, this is... This is where, like, the stars come from. It's to be a replica gun. It's probably a member of the NRA. I think that's exactly what is said in... Oh, no, that's exactly what it says in Resident Evil 2. I was thinking about Resident Evil 3. I was like, no, because Jill knows. And, like, one of these desks is Jill's. Uh, Chris's desk there. Take the diary. Chris's, di Chris's diary. I talked to the chief today once again, but he wouldn't listen to me. I'm absolutely positive that Umbrella conducted research in that on the T-virus in that mansion, but the entire mansion went up in that explosion, along with any incriminating evidence. Since so many people in this town are employees at Umbrella's chemical plant, no one is willing to talk about the incident. I'm just running out of options. August 17th, 1998. Recently, a series of strange incidents have been occurring locally. People say strange monsters are appearing at random... Uh, sorry, appearing at random throughout the city. This must be the work of Umbrella. With the help of Jill and Barry... Whee! I finally obtained information... Uh, I finally obtained information... Information vital to this case. Umbrella has begun research on a new G virus, a variant of the original T virus. What does this G virus do? We've talked it over and have decided to fly to the main Umbrella headquarters in Europe. I won't tell my sister about this trip. I won't tell my sister about this trip because doing so could put her in danger. Please forgive me, Claire. It's been filed. Uh, Chris's desk, I think Jill's desk is that one, and then I think Rebecca's desk is this way. In fact, I, what, what do you mean I think? I fucking know, alright? Another first aid spray, excellent, there you go, just in case. Uh, can I get... No, uh, the other shotgun is in there, and then... Tame the priest. <laughs> Ada Wong. Oh, there we go. The nightmare has just begun. I'm guessing he's going to say, "Oh, it's only just begun." So there we are, ladies and jelly spoons. That is the Resident Evil 2 demo. Uh, like I say, when I played this back in 1997, I immediately got to this bit and I was like, "I fuck that! I'm playing it again." Amazing demo. An amazing game. If there's ever going to be a game, I'm going to scream and shout from the rooftops to, if you have never played it, play it. Resident Evil 2 is it. But for now, ladles and jelly spoons, thank you very much for watching. If you have enjoyed this, please hit the old like button and subscribe to this channel for more random content. And I shall see you next Wednesday at 6pm British Standard Time. Bye for now.
Tenchu Stealth Assassins is an action-adventure stealth game developed by Acquire and published by Sony Music Entertainment Japan in Japan and Activision in North America and Europe. It was developed for the PlayStation 1 in 1998. So you know what lads, that means Tenchu is 20 years old. Tenchu is known for its stealth gameplay and its eerie settings of feudal Japan. It was one of the first games to incorporate stealth successfully, a very crucial aspect of ninjutsu, the martial arts style in the game. However, aside from featuring traditional martial arts in battle, the game incorporates elements of historical fantasy and Japanese mythology. The game features 10 levels, which are introduced in increasing difficulty. All of the levels take place at night to compensate for the technical limitations of the PlayStation. The game's high rate of redraw is reduced by setting the events at night and reducing the distance that the player can see. The player can pick either protagonist, Riki Maru or Ayame, as the playable character for each level. Their storylines vary considerably, yet they experience the same levels and missions. Riki Maru is the older of the two and is the primary character of the game. Armed with a single ninjato, he is stronger than Ayame, but relatively slower. Ayame carries a pair of Tanto and is faster and has more combos, but is the weaker of the two. You've been a bad boy. It's payback time! Both characters are armed with a grappling hook, which allows them to zip up to the top of buildings and freely move across rooftops, which gave the game a sense of verticality, which was rare amongst most action-adventure games of that time. Many of the bosses react differently to the two ninja based on their gender, highlighting the social attitudes of the time. Excellent. You will bring me great honor. Oh, Ayame! My father will be so very pleased with you! All missions, including the initial training mission, can be replayed an unlimited number of times, but mission 2 and onwards cannot be accessed without the previous chapter being successfully completed. There are three different layouts used to distribute enemies' obstacles and items spread over a level's map. On playing the training level, only several throwable deadly objects and the grappling hook are automatically selected as interactive objects. The weapons selection section contains throwing knives, kunai or shuriken depending on the game version, smoke bombs, cattle traps, poison rice cakes, coloured rice, healing potions, grenades and mines. Advanced items that you get for completing a mission with the rank of Grand Master are such things as super shuriken or kunai, lightfoot scrolls, Fire Eater Scrolls, Protection Amulets, Sleeping Gas, Ninja Armor, Shadow Decoys, Resurrection Leaf, Chameleon Spells, Dog Bones and a Decoy Whistle. These are optional to use in the mission, but are limited to a number of objects overall. The grappling hook is permanently locked into your inventory and does not consume an item space. If the player fails the mission, their character dies, sometimes being ridiculed by the boss, and the text Mission Fails will appear on the screen, in front of a grave of their respective character. All the items that he or she has acquired or taken with them are permanently lost until found in future missions. Therefore a player should not risk selecting a large number of objects to use in a mission. If a player is successful in a mission, they will be scored and ranked and their time will be recorded onto the game system and compared to previous attempts. The game takes place in feudal Japan introducing a pair of ninjas, Rikimaru and Ayame. They have been members of the Azuma ninja clan since childhood, and the two ninjas serve the heroic Lord Goda and work for him as his secret spies to root out corruption and gather intelligence within his province. However, an evil demonic sorcerer, Lord Mayo, seeks to destroy Lord Goda, and using his demon warrior, Unikage, wrecks havoc throughout Lord Goda's province. So weak. A video of an early prototype build of the game was featured in a later release, Tenshu Shinobi Hayakusen, showing a science fiction type ninja game, whose gameplay style was very different from the one in the final version. Famous ninja roles actor and martial artist Sho Kasuji and his son Kane were hired as motion capture actors for the game's combat moves. The original Japanese version of the game is somewhat different from the western version and a later re-release. The game came with 8 levels and each level only had one layout. The option screen, character select screen and level select screen all came with different graphics, the boss characters had different weapons, 
and before each level there is a small amount of Japanese dialogue that gives more detail into the game. The fighting moves were also different, whereas on the later versions mashing buttons for attack is all well and good, but this version each strike must be timed to get the full fury of the moves and the 180 degree reversal roll has also been taken out. So Tenchi was re-released in Japan in February of 1999 with many updates including the different mission layouts and all stages seen in the American and European versions. They also added four selectable languages, Japanese, English, Italian and French. The main feature of this version though was the mission editor which the possibilities for creating your own missions were endless and it generated a special edition disc with hundreds of the best missions created by Japanese players called Tenshu Shinobi Hayakusen. Hayakusen is an expansion pack for Tenshu and it was released in November of 1999 for the PlayStation. It's a standalone expansion meaning it did not require the main disc to play. Tenshu had achieved sales of over 250,000 copies in Japan by the June of 1998 before its release in the United States. Tenshu Stealth Assassins received favourable reviews according to video game review aggregator Metacritic and it was ranked 54th in the top games of all time by staff at Game Informer in 2001. They said, Tenchu Stealth Assassins shows the gaming world that it takes more than just dark clothes and pointy throwing objects to make it as a ninja, forcing players to learn and utilize stealth techniques, not only to excel, but to merely survive. Tenchu is a challenging, nerve-wracking game that leaves you screaming in frustration and then crawling back for more. Hello Littles and Jelly Spoons, this is normally the part of the video where you'd see me play through a bit of the game that I've been talking about and give you my experiences and my feelings on the game. However, this month I've decided to do something a little bit different and at the same time showcase another video creator chum of mine, Mr. Richard Dickey York. Uh, there's a link to his channel there if you would like to go and check it out and there's also a link in the description down below. Uh, see Dickey, that's how you shout out a channel in a YouTube video, just saying. A while back we decided to challenge each other to see who could complete the training mission of Tenchu Stealth Assassins with the best score and this is what happened. Enjoy. My name's Kai Mathy, better known as Dougie and this is my colleague Dickie. Hello and welcome to another of our DVD challenges. Thanks Dickie babes. Yes, Dickie has challenged me to the training level in Tenshu Stealth Assassins, the PlayStation 1 1998 classic. So Dickie, uh, what kind of prep have you done? I have practiced tiny little bit just to get used to the controllers because I'm used in my 360 controller. I'll tell you now, it's not a very good crossover. Fair enough, fair enough. Okay, Dickie's using the 360 controller. I have decided to use the PlayStation 4 controller. I don't know if you feel this gives me the unfair advantage. I've had a little bit of a practice as well. What I will say is a bit of an unfair advantage is uh, Dickie, 1998 Tenchu Stealth Assassins. That was my jam, son. I apologize in advance. Let's get into it. So here we, here go. we go. I'm of course gonna play the sexy lady. Yeah. And I have chosen Ricky Maru. I trained a little bit, I've just practiced on some of the controls just to get me used to it to see if they're working fine as well. Uh, so we'll just see. Uh, ooh, here we go, that's how you do this one. I struggled with a camera here, this is my own issue with this, this game, is the camera. Hey, you know what? They've done something right in this game. Straight into it. And did it. One thing I like in this game as well is the soundtrack. Uh, I actually started listening to a bit of the soundtrack recently. Okay, okay. Oh, hang on. Ooh. Okay, that was that was lucky. I thought I'd fucked up. Kill him. There you go. I want to saw your head off with a knife. Oh, I don't know if he saw me then. Right, this guy is a bit of a bitch. Is he? No, no. Turn around, turn around. There we go. Okay, can I pull this off? Oh, God. This spearman down here is bugger. He's the right bugger. I remember when he starts turning around and you run. Ha -ha! 
Oh, yes. Welcome to the pain train. Population you. Oh! Just too short. Didn't quite manage it. Okay, then. Up towards the wall. See me? Ooh, 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 ooh. Uh, he's gone facing the wrong way. Ah, in the back. I can't remember how bloody far this next. Yeah. Oh shit. That was a bit stupid. Come on. No, Mister. No, Mister Ninja. There is no woman running around hacking your friends up. I always mess it up on these corners. Oh, so still one hit on the back kills him straight away. Um, so yeah, just these two guys down here, which I struggle with. Right, these chaps. Now, as far as I can remember, the way to do these is basically to do them quite quickly. So let's, I'll go for him first. Crawl this way into this corner. If I remember rightly, a few years ago, what I used to do is crawl in this corner so you could see. Can I? Oh, get him. So the archer is looking away now. And then get the archer before he turns around. You'd think you'd have heard that, really, wouldn't you? Bows at me, bitch. Yeah. Oh, there we go. I'm showing off a little bit there. He's turning around. There we go. And dead. Show yourself. No, I've gone away. I've gone to get a cup of tea. Well, I think that was the hardest part here. It's the camera angles. Come on. Graphics in this game are amazing. Really are. That's it. Go, go, go. Come on, lady. Oh, God. <laughs> I wish you could do that move to me. Yeah, that that move. My God, I can't remember any of this. Excellent. You will bring me great honor. My father will be satisfied. Oh, will he? So there you go, um, Mr. Douglas. The conclusion of my uh, DVD challenge, Master Ninja. Um, six out of seven uh, undetected kills, one detected kill, spotted three times, which I think was quite appalling, really. Uh, total of 304 points, but did it in four minutes and 51 seconds. Boom! Grandmaster, one, one, one. Stick that in your pipe and smoke it. <laughs> oh, God. What have I done? <laughs>
as well as the rest of the world later that year, it is the 8th main instalment of the Final Fantasy series, and this year sees it turn 20 years old. And I bet we still don't get a PlayStation 4 release. Out of interest, ladles and jelly spoons, did you ever play Final Fantasy VIII? Do you have any Final Fantasy VIII fables that you'd like to share? If so, please pop them in the comments down below. I'd love to read some other people's experiences with the game. Myself, I seem to be the only person in my little small group of gaming friends that actually really liked the Final Fantasy series. Work started on Final Fantasy VIII in 1997, during the English localisation of Final Fantasy VII, by series creator and veteran Hironobu Sakaguchi, who served as the executive producer leaving the direction of Final Fantasy VIII to Yoshinori Kitse. Kitse wanted a thematic combination of both realism and fantasy. To this end, he aimed to include a cast of characters who appeared to be ordinary people. This made character designer Tetsuya Nomura and Yusuke Nora, the game's art director, to depart from the series' norm of super-deformed character designs for a more realistic proportioned approach. This in turn led Naora to enhance the realism of the world itself through lighting effects such as shadows and introducing rental cars for in-game travel. Final Fantasy VIII builds on the graphical changes brought to the series by Final Fantasy VII, such as pre-rendered backgrounds, 3D objects and the use of motion capture to give characters lifelike movements in the game's FMV sequences. However, it was noted that the team favoured manual animation over relying on motion capture. One of the main development obstacles the team encountered was having three real-time characters exploring an environment at the same time, as well as moving away from many Final Fantasy traditions, such as Final Fantasy VIII features a vocal piece as its theme music, and foregoing the use of magic points for spell casting. Final Fantasy VIII became the top-selling video game in the United States, a position it held for more than three weeks, making it the fastest-selling Final Fantasy title at the time. It was also a bestseller in Japan and the UK. As of December 2013, it has sold more than 8.5 million copies worldwide. Back in 1999, reviews praised it for its originality and visuals, and it was well received for the most part, but a few criticised some of the gameplay elements, and lack of voiceovers for its characters. IGN felt that the weakest aspect of the game was the Guardian Force attack sequence, calling it incredibly cinematic but tedious, a statement also voiced by Electronic Gaming Monthly. What's this, Littles and Jelly Spoons? Gameplay in the middle of the video? What's going on here? Yes, I'm going to play through a little bit of the game now and give you uh, some of my fond memories of Final Fantasy VIII and throw a couple of facts in there just for good measure. Uh, first fact is, did you know that when you select new game that you cannot skip this blooming cutscene? But it is an amazine cutscene. So picture back in 1999, young, fresh-faced, 15, 16, 15, 16, I can't quite remember. I must have been 16 because this came out later uh, in the UK. I wasn't too fussed about getting an American import copy of it, but I'll tell you about that later. Uh, putting this in, I think I, I definitely got this on release week. I don't know if I got it on release day. Um, putting it in and being absolutely mesmerised by this opening cutscene. Not just because of the visuals of it, because it was a lot better than anything else I'd seen from a Final Fantasy game at this point. Bear in mind, I think I'd only played Final Fantasy VII. Um, but also the music that I am talking over, I appreciate. Uh, just is amazing. I mean, just, just listen to it. I was lucky enough uh, a couple of years ago to uh, go to one of the Distant Worlds concerts, Final Fantasy Distant Worlds. Uh, if you ever get a chance to go, if you're a fan of the Final Fantasy series, if you're a fan of classical music, I would say definitely go and check it out. They are amazing. Uh, I was lucky enough to go to one a couple of years ago and they opened with Final Fantasy VIII and it just, oof, just got me right in the feels. I was absolutely amazingly burnt. I was just sat there thinking, oh god, you've started with like. Final Fantasy VIII. Just a bag of emotion. <laughs> that said, uh, I'm not going to uh, go into uh, which 
Final Fantasy I personally think is better. I'm not particularly interested in that argument. Final Fantasy VIII all, uh, will always and has always held a really special place in my heart for, for me, just because of the time in my life when I played it. Um, loved Seven, really liked Nine. Ten's good. Ten Two, a bit weird. Um, but yeah, I'm not getting that as much as I'm saying. I'm not getting into that conversation. Little of a bit of a fact for you. I know the. I think it's the art director deliberately designed Squall's jacket with uh, a fluffy collar to see how the. Or is it, it was either to see how the uh, animation team would animate it, or to see how to basically test the animation department to like see how well they could do it. I just, <laughs> I love that as you go like, yeah, I'm going to give you something really difficult to do. Dr. Kadawaki, are we saying? Well, I'll go with Kadawaki. Um, How are you feeling? I have just been hit by a massive sword and hurt and cut my face, so I'm going to go with my forehead hurts. Uh, my forehead hurts. I'll, I'll play myself as a, a very English gent, shall I? Oh, no kidding. Looks like your eyes are focusing. You should be fine. Say your name for me. How, how does saying my name help my eyesight? I, I mean, I'm not a medical professional. I don't know. Ah, so you think your name's Squall, do you? Well, you're wrong. I'll tell you what your name is. It's Darren. Christus, come get your student. Yes, yes. His injury is not serious. He'll probably leave us. I think that's fairly serious. I'm just, just saying. Right. Now, please come by. Good old. Uh, good old translation. I think I I remember hearing that. Um, isn't it like the American translation team had to use a game shark to access the text files? for the localization of the game because the oh hotty at six o'clock uh, because the um sorry because yeah like the there was a lack of communication between the american and the, the japanese departments working on the game yeah a little bit of a silly fact for you right quistis what uh, what kind of voice are we giving you now uh Come on, let's go to this field examiner. There seem to have been some rumours flying around since yesterday. Yes, the field exam for seed candidates will begin later this afternoon. Those not participating and those that failed last week's written test are to remain here in study hall. Field exam participants will have free time until the exam. Just be sure you're in top condition. I might need to... Uh just double check this, but I do believe that this game had a weird cameo uh, in the film Charlie's Angels. So, what did it look like? Uh, I don't know. It was like uh, all cool and stuff. You've never seen movie. Have too. Have not. <laughs> I've seen lots of movies. You're right. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, where did she go? I literally ran out just after it. Okay, so... Yeah, so this is the uh, fast travel panel. Um, it's quite difficult, it's weirdly difficult to navigate. Yeah, so we go to dormitories. Uh, we can just go straight to the front gate if we want uh, to see Quistis and get our uh, GF. Darren, you're forgetting something. You're GF. You great fool. Okay, listen up. You're here because you're not just the best, but because you're the best of the best. Now, 
to the mission. My ex-wife has decided to invade the Dalek dukedom, leaving Dalek with one choice. To hire you teenage mercenaries to go in there and kick out her invading army. Um, I'm, I'm not a teenager. You're wrong, boy. Do you know why you're wrong? Because we're all teenagers in seed. I mean, you're clearly out of your twenties. I ain't got time for this insubordination. Seeds, roll out. Okay, so we're going to get our first look at the, uh, the, the world map. Awesome. I love this world map. It's... Is it one of my favourites? I don't know. I, I, mm, you know it, it's definitely up there. Anyway, here we go. Okay, let's see if any of these chaps want to... Oh, no. Objective. To obtain a low-level chair, the seed member must support. Are you ready? I said I have tip-top condition, chaps. I'm ready for this. Oh, yes, I'm ready. Oh. And I'm support. Instruction number 14. Quist is trap. It's trap? Tra trap? Choose one suited to your abilities. Uh, so it's time limit. We'll go. For, we'll go for twenty. Actually, go on. We'll, so do, I think you you get something special. You get something special. You can do it. Do it. That's it. Time is about to start and go. I think you get something special if you can do it under twenty. Or is it under ten? You get something. Okay. Here we go. Okay, battle sequence, here we go, let's go magic. Uh, no fire is actually gonna. Oh, uh, I'll do it just so you can see what uh, the GFs are actually like. Here we go. Electric Bird Thunderstorm, here we go. I mean, incredibly cinematic, like summoning, but you have to watch it every single time, there's no shortened version of it. This is it. I didn't watch that for a while. Oh, come on, only 89? That's fair. Okay. Okay, come on, Darren. Cold laugh with the uh, with very little laugh. Oh, nice, 160. I think I'm gonna. Yes, they do indeed have shiver. Attack. Draw. See if I can draw from it. Oh dear, he's gonna use his fire attack. You don't use fire attack on a fire elemental because the effect you were going to do there is. Uh... Oh, oh, oh. Scans, excellent. So the scan spell effectively allows you to scan your your enemy. See what we're dealing with here. Okay, we've not even got it. We've not even got him down to half health. Come on, lads! Come on! We need to sort this out. I arguably say eight. 15, 18 years since I played this last. Okay. 
176, come on! Oh, I underest. Very well, I will join you. Yes! Get in! And then Ifrit became our friend and we became... Oh, did he get a watch to give me XP for that? That's... Hmm, Ifrit's card. Can get any XP for that? Set on an unnamed fantasy world with science fiction elements, the game follows a group of young mercenaries led by Squall Lionheart, as they are drawn into a conflict sparked by Ultima Sia, a sorceress from the future who wishes to compress time. During the quest to defeat Ultima Sia, Squall struggles with his role as leader and develops a romance for one of his comrades, Renoa Hartley. As with the Final Fantasy games before it, Final Fantasy VIII is made up of three main modes of play. The world map, a 3D display in which players can navigate across a small scale 3D render of the game world. The player can travel across the game map by car, train, airship, by foot or by series staple chocobo. The field map, made up of 2D pre-rendered environmental locations such as forest, town or other important structures in the game. Here you have control over 3D characters and you can have three of them in your party at any one time. And finally the battle screen where turn-based combat takes place. It is made up of a 3D render of the location your party find themselves in, such as a street, a room or a forest clearing. The interface in this mode is the same as previous Final Fantasy games, it's all menu based. Hiroyuki Ito designed the Final Fantasy VIII battle system around the idea of summoned monsters called Guardian Forces, or GFs in the game itself. Assigning or junctioning a GF to a character allows the player to use battle commands such as magic. Returning from Final Fantasy VII, Final Fantasy VIII characters have unique abilities called Limit Breaks that may be attack or support based spells. Characters' Limit Breaks become available only at low health. Also featured is a collectible card based minigame called Triple Triad, a concept that was derived from trading cards which is a popular hobby in some parts of Japan. Triple Triad was meant to keep the player interested during long stretches without cutscenes. Originally it was simply about collecting cards, but found that it was too disconnecting from the main game, so added an ability to transform cards into items. Do you play cards? Yes! Come on receptionist! Okay, Triple Triad, um, a brilliant little game, uh, I'm going to sort of try and do my best to explain to you how the game works. I'm obviously going to take my Ifrit card, uh, I'm going to take my Caterpillar card, uh, ooh, is that a good card? That's a fairly good card. Um, uh, he's a weak card. Uh, he's okay. Uh, Red Bat is a good one. He's got a good sides on him, yeah. Uh, no. How do you put him back? Right, I cannot remember. Right, there we go. And put him back. We'll go with the bug. Uh, put the bug in him. See how. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I gotta go first. Okay, so so you've got this diamond of numbers uh, in the top left-hand corner of your card. Uh, if right there's got nine, eight, six, and two, so nine, eight, six, and nine, eight, six, and two. The idea is that I'm gonna put a card down, and he's gonna try and put a higher number card next to my card. So I'm gonna go with uh, which is my fairly. You. Okay, I'm going to put you here because you've got a 1, so you're going to be taken over on your left hand side, but he's obviously going to put a higher card, which is obviously he has done, uh, because his 4, on his lower part of his diamond, beats my 3 on the upper part of my diamond. I don't know if that necessarily, I don't know if I'm doing a good job of, of, uh, of making sense of how you play it. So I need 1, 7. Hmm. I ideally want to take mine back, so let's. You. I think I'm going to lose this to be fair because I'm really out of practice. Ah, bugger. Uh, I need. I got anything to That's got a 4 on it though, so that could work. Yeah. Uh, put that 
select one of his cards. I think the most obvious one to go for is uh, the Marlboro. Before we begin, I just want to say a big thank you to YouTube channel Dan Tails who helped out with this video. There's a link to his channel in the description down below and there'll be more information about him at the end. Ah, <sighs> what a lovely day. Hello? Meow, meow. What's that, Tiger Tom? Helicopter crash? Thousands injured? Meow! Meow, 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 Leave it with me. I know just who to call. I know. I'll try. Gex 3, Deep Cover Gecko, developed for the Sony PlayStation, Nintendo 64 and Game Boy Color. It is the third installment in the Gex video game trilogy and 1999 sees it turn 20 years old. Before we look at Gex, it should be noted that the series itself has something of an interesting past. Originally developed by Crystal Dynamics for the 3DO, the first game in the series saw the titular character Gex, voiced by American comedian Dana Gould in both the North American and European releases. Gould would go on to voice Gex in all three games in the US. The second game, however, saw a tonal shift with the European release having Leslie Phillips voice the anthropomorphic Gecko, and then shift again by having Danny John Jules, better known for his role as the cat in British sitcom Red Dwarf, voice him in Gex 3. The character himself has been both Crystal Dynamics mascot, the PlayStation 1's mascot, sort of, and has sadly now fallen into obscurity. Even amongst retro video game fans, I don't often come across people who have either played the games or even heard of the series itself. While Gex 3 was the last game in the series, Square Enix, who currently hold the rights to Gex, did put the series in its Square Enix Collective, a program in 2013 that gave hopeful game developers the chance to develop a new game in one of three different series, Gex, Fear Effect, and Anachronox. So then, to Gex 3. Welcome to Hills and Jelly Spoons to Gex 3, Deep Cover Gecko. Yes, this is the part of the game where I play a little bit of the game in question and give you my live reactions to it and relay any uh, stories I can remember from when I played it not 20 years ago. And with Gex 3, Deep Cover Gecko, uh, the story is very much start on the uh, main menu here in the demos because I unapologetically bought Gex 3 Deep Cover Gecko to play the Soul Reaver demo. Yes, yes I did. But that's not what we're here to talk about today. We will be covering Soul Reaver on the retrospective review at some point, but today is not that day. Let's get straight in with a, uh, a new game 
and watch possibly one of the cheesiest yet very very late 90s-esque because it was from the late 90s cutscenes you will have seen for a while hopefully and that's how the mayor got his pants back what's this ladies and gentlemen i've just been handed some late breaking news Special Agent Extra, head of the TV Terrorist Defense Unit, and star of many of my private dreams, is apparently missing. Judge Jerry Springer! Agent Extra was last seen wearing eight-inch pumps and a red bathing suit. Her current whereabouts are unknown. Gex! Gex! Agent Extra! You poor kidnapped minx. Hey, Tiger. Guess where I am? Trapped in the media dimension. Rez is back, and he's kidnapped me to get to you. He's attacking your secret island cave. Hey, speaking of secrets, you want to see my... Gex, quit clowning around and get me out of here. This place is giving me the creeps. Just dial me in. You are now being so connected, though. Gex, listen up. Keep your watch on at all times so I can call you. Meanwhile, get me out of here. I need you. Yeah, you and every other beautiful government agent I'm on my way. Slamil, Slamazin, Hey, that tingles. Let's get ready for the ultimate gecko weapon, baby. Yeah. Yeah. See what I mean? Very, very nineties. <laughs> you kind of. Watching that again, because to be honest, it probably is about 20 years since I've played this game. Uh, you kind of forget like how much Austin Powers really, really ended up in the pop culture of, of the time. Like, uh, yeah. <laughs> anyway, for all you uh, English, sorry, UK watching uh, folks with uh, eagle ears, you will have noticed that Gex there was voiced by Dina Gould and not Danny John Jules as he was in the English edition of the game. Uh, that is because I cannot find the English edition of the game. Um, uh, it wasn't in my box of PlayStation 1 games, which is behind the curtain there. Um, so I'm not entirely sure. So this is obviously uh, an emulated version of the game. Um, and it runs, runs beautifully. Anyway, so what else could you say about that uh, that, that cutscene? Um, well, I liked the the sort of Roger Rabbit esque nature of of the um, of the cutscene, the whole kind of thing that I'm gonna fly. Woo uh, the whole idea that like Agent Extra seems to be the only real life character in the Gex universe because obviously the news broadcast was also excuse me also animated um yeah but it's very very cheesy now what i'm trying to do is find the training level Whew. Uh, there it is the wreck the rec room uh, because i need to remember how the hell you play this game welcome sir please come on in Entering the training area should allow you to... Yeah, well, wow, thank you, feet. Alfred. Let's go. Let's enter a big gecko's mouth. Not a narcissist, not at all. Oh, bit of clip in there, bit of clip in, bit of clip in. Oh, bad. Gameplay is not too different from Gex Enter the Gecko, the second game in the series. Gex 3 combines a lot of the aspects of the first game with the 3D platforming of the second. Levels are accessed via a hub, with areas unlocked as the player collects remotes from each of the levels. Players can unlock and control alternative characters, Rex, Cuz and Alfred, during bonus stages. New additions include vehicles such as a tank, a snowboard and a camel, as well as the ability to glide in certain costumes. Gex can spit fire and ice, as well as swim. Much like the first game in the series, Gex collects bugs in all levels, and collecting a hundred earns a remote and access to a secret level. Unlike Gex 2, when losing a life, Gex retains only the amount of bugs collected up to the last checkpoint. Since there are 100 per level, collecting bugs gets significantly more difficult as you play on. While watching television, Gex discovers that his partner and lover, Agent Extra, 
played by actress Marlies Andrade, best known for starring in the TV show Baywatch, now head of the TV terrorist defence unit, has been reported missing. Extra herself manages to contact Gex and inform him that Rez, the antagonist from the first game, has returned once again and kidnapped her to lure him out. Through his secret lair, Gex returns to the media dimension and circumnavigates numerous television channels with help from his butler Alfred, and in the process frees and befriends Rez's prisoners, Rex and Cuz. Together they find Rez and challenge him to a final battle. Take it Tom! Are you in here? Take it Tom! Mio! 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 Hang on, don't try and get you out. Crystal Dynamics wanted Gex 3 to be more of a story-based game, as well as wanting to develop the character of Gex himself, but at the same time wanted Gex to harken back to the series' roots as a 2D side-scrolling platformer. The developers of Gex 3 wanted to push the limits of Sony's original Little Grey Box further than they had with Gex 2, and they found a way to increase the level size by one fifth, include more enemies per stage and maintain high frame rates. But across gameplay, graphics and plot, Crystal Dynamics really wanted to improve the game's 3D camera system after it had been highly criticised in reviews of Gex 2. For all its efforts, Gex 3 only reviewed averagely. Running on the less powerful PlayStation, Gex 3 was rated higher due to less 3D platformer competition and impressive graphics. The harshest criticism was for the N64 version of the game that suffered stuttering frame rates and was up against such titles as Super Mario 64. Uh, Alfred, the uh, tortoise, twi 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 butler. Press the attack button to tail whack those hideous dummies. Oh, are hideous. Yeah, Alfred, the uh, tortoise butler there, uh, voiced by Mark Silk, who uh, both American and English audiences should recognise as the uh, American voice of Bob the Builder and the UK voice of Johnny Bravo. Uh, yeah, a fairly, fairly well well known voice actor. Him, I thought. Crops, crops up all over the place as you go, Mark Silk. Right now, <clears throat> uh, I've pretty much worked out this is the jumping puzzle. I don't need to talk to Alfred to. Uh, maybe I do need to. That's a bit lame if I do. So yeah, apparently you do jump have to. Okay. I love the fact I, I don't know if you have to hit him with your tail to get him to speak, that's just the way I've always done it. Also, realistically, we are just going to play through the training level because Gex 3 Deep Cover Gecko is one of the few games that makes me suffer from motion sickness a little bit, so I don't want to get madly into the into the game. I don't want to be spending 20 minutes or I don't want to be spending an hour of midday with bloody Ed down the toilet whilst I recover from motion sickness. Oh hello. Oh, I forgot to get up there. Oh this was always the one that got me now what's cr that that's crouch yeah. No, 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 Okay, let's go. Let's... Right, so you got to run, be running, press crouch, and then jump. There you go. Oh, no, but I'm going to go down the hole to get the health thing anyway. There we go. That little wavy hand health thing. See? No, no, no. I did that deliberately. I totally did do it. These weren't secret doors, were they? Yeah, the other thing is if you press crouch too early, he uh, he just goes into crouch mode. No, oh, missed it again! Bloody hell! No, oh, I'm going to miss it again. Right, okay, I'm going to have to take this seriously. Jesus Christ, I'm being trumped by a fucking jumping puzzle. 
Okay, let's run forward uh, again if you press the run button too quickly. <gasps> Son of a bitch! Right, okay, we can do this. <laughs> I'm too old to play video games now, that's it. This is this is the sign. This is you can't fucking do a jumping puzzle on a basic 90s platformer. You are too old to be playing video, video games anymore. Oh, fuck off! Ugh. Right. Also, why am I going the long way around? There we go. Right, okay. I've lined up. And I'm across. Excellent. Right, okay. I've lined up. And I'm across. Okay, excellent. Right. Final one. This is it. This is the moment, chaps. This is... Oh, come on, Gex. It's you and me. Let's do this. Yes. Small things in life. There we go. Now we've got the remote. And that portal sends us straight back to uh, the... Uh, I always call this like the, the mission control room or whatever it was called. And you know what I was saying about um, motion sickness? Yeah, definitely kind of getting it a little bit now. So that's where I'm going to leave it, ladles and jelly spoons. Uh, if you want to see me play more of Gex 3, Deep Cover Gecko, then by all means comment on this video down below if you'd like to see me more and maybe I'll do a little bit of a series on it, who knows? Um, I actually playing it now, like I say, this is the first time I've played it in easily 20 years since the actual game came out. Although I'm not particularly brilliant at it, it is quite a fun little game to play. Um, yeah, so there we go, that's uh, Deep Cover Gecko for you. Got any fives? Along. No. You could have got out of the cell whenever you. Look, the door's open. Quick, let's get out of here. No, no, no. I don't know, but I hope we get to thank him someday. Meow, meow. What's that, Ninja Chloe? Helicopter crash. Thousands injured. Meow, 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 meow. Uh, hold on, Ninja Chloe. Yeah, thank you. Meow, meow, meow. Charlie's a bit of some kind of jewel. Yes, I know. I've. Just got the letter. May 1999 was a very quiet month in terms of video games. Back then, May was reserved for E3, the Electronics Entertainment Expo. So not many companies put out new releases because they were too busy getting ready to show the world what they would be working on and releasing very soon. May 1999 saw Nintendo confirm that it had started work on a new console codenamed Project Dolphin that would eventually be the GameCube. Sony Computer Entertainment Japan released Ape Escape for the PlayStation. Japan Arts Media released Luna Silver Star Story Complete for the PlayStation, a remake of the Sega CD 1992 game, Luna the Silver Star. Microsoft released the first Midtown Madness game for the PC. And I could be found in the West End Arcade playing Street Fighter 3 Third Strike. Actually, if I'm honest, I didn't actually play it properly until the Japanese release for the Sega Dreamcast in June, July of 2000. Third Strike is the second release of Street Fighter 3 that was released in 1997. Third Strike adds five new playable characters, most notably Chun-Li and Akuma. It also added some improvements to the rules and mechanics of the game over its original 1997 and later Second Impact release. As well as bringing back series favourites Chun-Li, Third Strike introduced us to new characters 
Yurian and Hugo. Separated up the twins Yun and Yang and gave Yang his own moveset to distinguish him from his twin brother Yun. And lastly Akuma became a selectable character rather than being hidden as he was for most of the Street Fighter series to that point. Right and Hills and Jelly Spoons, so this is the part of the video where obviously I play a little bit of the game, throw some uh, facts at you and give you my impression of the game. But this time I'm going to do it a little bit differently. As you can see I've been joined by Dickie. Yes! From Richard York's Wargaming where no war game remains unplayed. Heard it here first. <laughs> <laughs> Ever played Street Fighter 3 Third Strike before Dickie? Can you guess the quick answer? Play Street Fighter no, not, no, okay. no, I, I... Alright then, okay fair enough. So, Third Strike, the third game came out, 97. They tried to re they tried to do a direct sequel to 2, um, give you a completely new rostrum of characters. They kept originally kept Ryu and Ken from the original rostra. This one introduced Chun-Li back into the actual oh. rostra. Uh, and had Akuma as a selectable as a proper selectable character. So we are playing the 30th anniversary edition of the game because it just made more sense than to faff around trying to emulate it. So we're here at the character select, uh, sorry, the stage select screen, which we'll just go for random. Uh, and I'm player one, Dickie is player two, so I will go with... I'm finding the most sexiest lady on here. I knew that's what you were doing. Oh, Chun-Li. Give me a chun -Li. Fine then, I shall go for Akuma. How do you pronounce this lady's name? Uh, Ibukai? Ibukai, yeah, Ibuki. Ibuki, Ibuki. Ibuki. Let's get limber. Ibukai looks angry. Yes, he's very angry. Ooh. Right, so first fact. Ah! Well, well, Dickie owns me. Because <laughs> because he doesn't have to like reiterate facts <laughs> is that uh, when your uh, bar at the bottom there gets full and you're, uh, you'll hear the, the oh! ah, you'll hear a um, announcer say let's go interesting fact that let's go sound sound clip was taken from the 1960s Batman Chaps, I can't fight. A chicken Nugget has got more chance of defeating Otto than I have. <sighs> Mio, 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 Mio. Who? Well, game mechanics were altered to a degree in Third Strike. Players' super arts were given a booster with the addition of the EX specials, a slightly more powerful version of super arts. Players could now escape throwing attacks by using tech throws. Each character was given a taunt or personal action as the game describes them that had additional benefits if completed successfully. And some characters gained new moves and improved animations that in turn changed the game frame data. Gameplay on the other hand was only slightly changed. Players faced 8 opponents with the final opponent being character specific. Players also had the chance to face off against a character specific rival if the player met certain requirements. And if another set of requirements is met, instead of the character specific final opponent, players would face Akuma. Second match, how do you think it went? The first match. The first, sorry, how do you think the first match oh, went? Poorly. Poorly, <laughs> poorly. Okay. I've, I've learned the, the technique now. Okay. It's called button bashing. Okay. Is that a solid tactic? That is indeed a solid <laughs> tactic. Let's go. Second, second time looking. I think it's Chun Li time. Oh, he's going to get Chun-Li. I should probably go a little bit fairer on you, Dicky, and play a character I don't really know. Uh, you are very good at this game, yeah. I'm going to say. Uh, I'm going to go Hugo, because my next fact is actually about is Hugo. That, is that Sylvester Sloan? It's not, but it is based. Um, obviously, Hugo... <laughs> so, Hugo, if you don't know, is obviously uh, based on a background character from Final Fight, if you ever played the Final Fight series, which I'm guessing you didn't. 
Um, but he's but he's also based on Andre the Giant. Oh. And I don't know any of his moves because he's not a character I play very often. So this could we could be seeing Dickie's no. comeback. <laughs> I mean, that just looks a little bit inappropriate, what he's doing there. No! Oh! <laughs> he hand-clapped her. Yeah, hand-clapped you to death. So how do you do your power-up? Your... Um, well, that's the thing you were picking at the beginning, when it tells you, when it gives you those three options, you need to remember... Uh... He bummed me! I know, I bummed you. Oh, you know what they say, bummers are death. Ah! <laughs> it's about the only move I actually know. <laughs> yes! Go on! This is so oh, cool. It's a little bit of a whitewash, Dicky. <laughs> Where'd she come from? <laughs> yeah, and obviously that's poison also from the Final Fight series. Wow! There you go. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to this, the very first annual Very Deadly Martial Arts Competition. I'm your host, Alan Doctor, and tonight we're going to see Otto the Ocelot versus Guy Mathy. The rules are very simple. Otto has laid down the challenge of single hand-to-hand -hand combat to Kai, and he must accept or forfeit his life. This challenge goes back many, many years, you know, to when all this was just fields. To a time of... Meow. Meow, meow, meow. Meow. Meow, meow. Meow. Meow, 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 meow. Round one, fight! Street Fighter 3 was made to be a direct sequel to Street Fighter 2, with only Ryu and Ken making it through as playable characters, and introducing an all new roster and new antagonist, Gil, in place of M. Bison. Hence the tagline, a new generation. Alex was originally supposed to be the main character in Street Fighter 3, but was changed because he wasn't recognised as a hero character compared to Ryu and Ken. As with all Street Fighter games, each playable character has his own unique storyline. And no, I'm not going to go through them all now. Retrospectively, Third Strike is remembered fondly with fans of the Street Fighter series. Many people now think of it as a lot better than people gave it credit for back then. Back in 1999, people did review it positively, but it was called an unexciting edition of the game by some reviewers. While the original release of Street Fighter 3 back in 1997, I think missed a few beats by overhauling the whole roster of characters, I think it was brave of Capcom to try something so daring as I don't believe you'd get any fighting game developers these days trying something so bold. Second Impact and Third Strike did a good job of writing the original game's wrongs. I personally was desperate to play as Chun-Li in Akuma again, but at the same time I warmed quite quickly to Alex and the new generation of Street Fighters. Okay, so final battle, Dicky. I'm not going to lie, it's been a little bit of a whitewash. <laughs> um, I think my problem is I'm, I'm, I'm choosing women. Yes, this, I think this, that's the problem. This is, this is your problem, you're choosing the ladies. Uh, okay, so let's see if I can indeed whitewash it, or if Dickie's gonna bring it back. Pull it back. So I'm gonna pick. Since my final fact is about Chun Li, I'm gonna pick old Chunners. See, that's what you're picking. See, so special, your, your ultra special. What movement. does it mean? The little. So that's up and that's half a semicircle and plus the kick or plus a kick button. Ah. Oh. He's going for Yang. So my final fact about Chun-Li is that one of her uh, quotes in the game is that she says, I was it, hey, leave me alone, I'm a fighter, not, uh, not a reporter. And it's meant to be, I believe it's meant to be a direct link to um, the fact that she plays a reporter in the Street Fighter movie. Oh, well, that's, what a lot of, like, that's what the fans basically, there we are. What's the legs? Look at the legs, guys! Eyes of steel! No! <laughs> I cannot remember how to do any of her, her other moves. I don't think she's still, she's still got a spinning bird kick. Oh! oh. No. <laughs> the white one. This is embarrassing. It is a little bit embarrassing. Oh, 
No way! Uh, right, I didn't even kick you for the last half of that battle. I was like, I'll stay off the 100 pack. The, the, uh, the, uh, I don't do fighting games. Clearly not, clearly not. But good game, sir. Good game, good game, good game, good game. Yes, good game. Good game. Right, mm -hmm. okay, back to the video. Yeah. <laughs> Finish him! Uh, that's the wrong franchise. I, I mean, meow. Meow, meow. Look, Ninja Poo. Watson's using a weapon. That's cheating. Meow. Meow, meow, meow. I've got an idea. Meow! Ooh. Oh. Man, I've i got to stop eating cheese before I go to bed. <laughs> before we begin, ladles and jelly spoons, I just need to say a big thank you to Red Scott's Gaming Dinosaur Boob Tattoo for allowing me to use clips from his own Dino Crisis retrospective in this video. If you want to check out his own Dino Crisis retrospective, he covers the entirety of the series in much more detail than I do but there's a link in the description down below and there'll be a link at the end of this video but once again thank you very much and uh, yeah enjoy this video <sighs> hey who used the last of the milk what the hell's going on meow 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 Looks a lordy quick, what do we, hang on a minute, since when do we have a dinosaur, or indeed the facility to keep a dinosaur? No, no, no. You know what, I'm not entirely sure I've ever been into the spare room. Dino Crisis is a 1999 survival horror come panic horror video game, developed and published by Capcom for the Sony PlayStation. The game follows Regina, a special operations agent sent in with a team to investigate a secluded island research facility. Finding the place overrun with dinosaurs, Regina must fight through the facility to discover its secrets and ultimately escape alive. Developed by the same team within Capcom that brought us the early Resident Evil series Oh Barry! Jill Sandwich! Including director Shinji Mikami, Dino Crisis shares more than a passing resemblance to Resident Evil, with one major noticeable difference, its use of 3D environments instead of pre-rendered backgrounds that were seen in the Resident Evil series. Featuring traditional Capcom survival horror mechanics such as action sequences, puzzles, ammunition rationing and tank controls, Dino Crisis was developed to have a more constant visceral terror, with the dinosaurs being quicker, intelligent and more violent than zombies. This led Capcom to label the game as panic horror as opposed to survival horror. Dino Crisis was a critical and commercial success, with the PlayStation version selling 2.4 million copies back in 1999, a sequel was released a year later, and Dino Crisis was ported to the Sega Dreamcast and PC in 2000. It was re-released for the PlayStation Network in 2006, and two different versions for the Game Boy Color were in development, but were ultimately cancelled. The series also includes comic books, associated merchandise, and as of 2018, the game has sold 4.4 million units worldwide. Look at that beautifully rendered moon there. Yes, hello ladles and jelly spoons, it's the part of the video where I play a little bit of the game that we're looking at today, and give you uh, my thoughts. Uh, my experiences with it the first time I played it way back in 1999 and possibly drop a few facts about the game as we go. Although I can't seem to remember I have that many facts about Dino Crisis, not the first one anyway. That's it, assume the position Gale. That is Gale isn't it? Or Gale, 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 Gale. Okay, so the first thing I adored about Dino Crisis, the first one, is the 3D environments. Coming off of Resident Evil 1 and 2 with their pre-rendered backgrounds, this just 
I wouldn't exactly say that it blew my mind, but I just loved the fact that everything was so much more cinematic. Dino Crisis, interestingly enough, is one of the few games that I didn't acquire the American version first through my uh, contact. Um, I seem to remember, as I've talked about in the past, I used to know a chap that could get uh, imported games from Japan and America, and he would um, occasionally have periods where he'd go out of business. Uh, they usually lasted like a couple of weeks, but I couldn't ever get, you know, he was effectively shut down. And um, I think around about the Dino Crisis Resident Evil 3 time was the time that he got shut down down permanently I don't think not wanting to allude to any more than that but yeah uh, so they were shooting at came in through there I had to I had no option but to wait until October uh, because Europe was the last region to get Dino Crisis um, I had to wait till October to play it but on the plus side it did make the Halloween weekend which because I think this came out just before Halloween or like on Halloween weekend um, I just I remember that this is what I spent my Halloween uh, weekend doing. I was at my grandparents. I'd taken uh, my hard-earned cash to W. H. Smith's because we'd been out during the day, um, and I was like, I desperately want to pick up uh, Dino Crisis, pick up the key, Regina. Oh, this is the one fact that I uh, I know about Dino Crisis, or the one fact that I have for you. Uh, Regina's portrait in this or in the inventory screen um, is different in the Japanese version to the European and American version. I'll put an example up on, on screen. That is the only fact I think I have about Dino Crisis 1. Uh, it's a more anime style portrait. portrait. Um, where am I going? Oh yes, the classic push puzzle. Um, now bear in mind I've not played this game for probably about 10 years so excuse me if I'm a little bit rusty. Um, I'm not gonna lie, I am gonna be rusty. Uh, yeah. Is everything, everything full? Yeah? Oh, okay. Is there more than one? Okay. As I was saying, Halloween weekend of 1999, uh, I spent it at my grandparents playing Dino Crisis pretty much by myself. I um, can't remember if my cousin was with me or not. Uh, I think we had half a dozen trick-or-treaters uh, come around to the house. Again, England in the sort of like late 90s, we didn't really do Halloween. Uh, not properly, anyway, so this was got, like my Halloween treat to myself. Why can I not open the gate? Why can't I open the gate? Use. Yeah. It says it, this says it's the key I need. Um. Sure, that's the right key. <sighs> Do I have to talk to Gil or somebody or to sort of say I've got the key, or maybe I'm just trying to put it in the wrong, wrong door, wrong gate? Oh, I think I'm waiting on a cutscene. <laughs> Now, Dino Crisis came out between, for us over in Blighty, came out between Resident Evil 2 and Resident Evil 3. Resident Evil 2 irritatingly came out in November uh, in the US, and I was so good that I couldn't get an early copy of it. Uh, I had to wait until the February of 2000. I was like, Ugh. But Dino Crisis sort of filled the gap for me a little bit. There are things about it that are... Very Resident Evil 1 and not my preferred Resident Evil 2. Uh, 
the lack of ammunition in Dino Crisis 1 definitely started to bug me. Um, yeah, it was... It was a harsh taskmaster. It was, <laughs> it was Dino Crisis. But like I say, I, I adored the 3D environments. They, they just made everything feel so much more advanced, which is why it was a little bit of a shame in Resident Evil 3 that we sort of jumped back to pre-rendered cutscenes. Um, not, sorry, not pre-rendered cutscenes, pre-rendered backgrounds. Um, hey, yeah, you see. Oh, no, this is the way I've come. Yeah. Don't tell me I'm lost already. Another thing that uh, I really particularly liked about Dino Crisis, the UK edition, let's call it, was the box art. The box art is oh so much nicer than the uh, American box art. Ooh, dead body. That's disgusting. This guy's been a brushing that off a little bit something casual there. Yeah. Regina. Look at those tooth marks. It had to be some sort of animal. Like a okay. dinosaur, possibly. I always remember this. Yes, I will take the medical pack off the dead body. Hey, he ain't gonna need it. Stop going out again and making some real friends, or at least ones that aren't trying to defy the laws of science just to win a rosette at a dinosaur dressage competition. No, dinosaur. No, dinosaur. No, dinosaur. No. In a fictional location known as Ibis Island in the year 2009, the secret Operation Raid team, SORT, sends in Agent Tom to investigate a research facility. During the recon mission, he learns that Dr. Edward Kirk, a world-renowned scientist who was reported dead three years ago, is leading a secret weapons project within the facility. SORT sends in four agents, Regina, Gale, Rick and Cooper, to acquire Kirk and return him to custody. The team arrive on the island under the cover of darkness, Dropping in via parachute, Cooper is blown off course and lands in the jungle, away from the others. Lost in the dark, he is chased down by a T-Rex and eaten. The other three agents, unaware of his death, proceed with the mission. Directed and produced by Shinji Mikami, along with the development team that would later become part of Capcom's production Studio 4, Dino Crisis is a pseudo-sequel to Mikami's Resident Evil series, as Mikami and his team wanted to move away from the fantasy element and make something more real. Citing the Lost World, Jurassic Park, and Aliens as influences, That's it, man. Game over, man. Game over. The game was made to have more constant fright, with the dinosaurs being bigger and faster. They could chase the player from across the room and into other rooms. Dino Crisis utilizes an original 3D engine with real-time environments. Mikami chose the real-time engine to enable better cinematic action and more dramatic character depictions that would have otherwise been impossible. However, due to the hardware limitations of a real-time engine, the team couldn't create detailed environments and had to forego jungle scenes because of this issue. This is, in part, why the game takes place indoors and in an enclosed environment. That and Mikami wanted to keep the claustrophobic feeling, thinking that it would better build fear. Since it is unknown how dinosaurs moved in real life, the team had to use animals such as crocodiles and dogs for reference, as well as their own imagination and used lions, tigers and other carnivores that aren't afraid of humans for the dinosaur's artificial intelligence. Lion! 
lions and tigers and... A dinosaur? Oh my! Although Mikami wanted to include a more complex dinosaur AI that would have given the dinosaurs individual personalities that could understand the player's condition and ambush them. Right, this is the this is kind of like the first puzzle, which was this puzzle is so uh, so Resident Evil. It's it hurts. Um, I seem to remember I've got to make the tubes behind the glass match the match the levers. I think that's right. Let's see if I get this right. So it's that one first. Then this one. Then the right again. Then cancel. Red, blue, green, white. Yeah. I have started the motor. Now, uh, also, this I think this is where things start kicking off a little bit. Gail? Quick, get out there, Regina. Come on, get out there and see what the hell's going on. I'm not looking away. <laughs> oh god, blood! <laughs> Gail! Gail! You, you do a thing, Gail! Um. I'm busy. <laughs> I couldn't remember where I put the box. My copy of Diamond Crisis, the box. Right, hang on, whoa, whoa, whoa! Hang on! <laughs> Run away, run away, run away. That was a stupid time to get the box. Just to prove a point that I really like the box of um, of the UK edition. Um, okay, I only have a pistol uh, this, with some parabellum rounds in it. So it's me, my pistol and that foppin' dinosaur. Where is he? Hi! Hoo -hoo! A quick dodge there. Lettuce potatoes. It took me so long to basically work. Oh shit. This as well, this bit also blew my mind. Oh my god, suddenly you couldn't just go through a door to get away from dinosaurs. They were like, shit, they're gonna follow me. Does he, does he follow you through this one as well? Oh yeah, and there's frickin' dinosaurs running around! Frickin' dinosaurs! He was attacked by some kind of dinosaur. that's a good one! So, who was it? Barney? This isn't a joke, you idiot. We were just attacked by Also, the Barney joke um, doesn't really land... I don't think it really landed in the UK. I mean, obviously, it's like just... It's a quick quip. Um, but in the UK in the 90s, I, we, didn't, we didn't really have Barney the Dinosaur. I don't even think we were really aware of him. Some people might have been. I, I definitely I wasn't. So I can't remember if I got that joke. Maybe I did get it. Maybe I was, maybe I was aware of him. 
back in that. I've got to remember, I was about 16, 17, so I was probably aware of him. But yeah. there were definitely people I spoke to that weren't that played this game. <laughs> Oh shit. More freaking dinosaurs. Yeah, the very fact that the dinosaurs could suddenly jump over fences and could follow you from room to room was again one of those like, oh my god. I, I think Resident Evil started to do um, started to do this a little bit in Resident Evil 3. Um, like zombies could follow you through uh, through doors. And like follow you through rooms, like the the nemesis was a, a perfect example of that in three. Like just to follow you, and you're like, shit. So this was in some cases actually like good um, good practice. Uh, I'm not gonna lie, I can't remember which one of these I have to go down. Just go down one and. Get on with it! Yes, yes I will. Brilliantly sinister music, classic, classic. Capcom in the late 90s, very, very late 90s, uh, survival horror music, well sorry, panic horror. More blood, excellent. Uh, code disc. Okay, this is one of the things that I disliked about the um, the game. This HDC, is it H, it's hard disk drive or RDR. I can't remember exactly what it's. Oh, that DDR. That's it. Just sort of as I close the men, uh, as I close the inventory there. Um, yeah, the DDR disk system is the one thing that I just. Well, not the one thing, but one of the few things in this game that just, yeah. Oh my god! Also, do we not think this room looks a little bit like the uh, Star's office little side room where you f find Marvin for the second time in Resident Evil 2? A little bit, it's kind of got that feel to it. Just the design and layout of them, yeah. In fact, there, there are a lot of design similarities. I mean, obviously, it's the same freaking team that, that worked on it, so there's obviously going to be, even in this 3D uh, rendered world, they've obviously got a, a design aesthetic that they stick to. Yeah. Yes, DDK, yes, insert the code disk and the input disk and then there's two things you can work out what the code is to activate the disk and yeah, it's a right bun bunch of willies. So I think we'll leave it there, um, ladles and jelly spoons. I hope you've enjoyed this little look at Dino Crisis, the first game, and uh, yeah. Back to the video. Dino Crisis features what is now considered classic Capcom survival horror gameplay and is very similar to early Resident Evil titles. Regina can walk, run, turn, backpedal, push and climb objects and perform a 180 degree turn. A map is available which shows Regina's location, destination, save points and locked doors. Regina's inventory may include key items, weapons, ammunition and medical supplies. Save points are rooms in which will prompt the player to save upon exiting them. If Regina becomes injured, she will hold her arm or struggle to walk. Med packs can be used to heal Regina's health, but sometimes a trail of blood may appear, indicating that Regina is bleeding and will continue to lose health. Hemostats can be used to stop bleeding injuries. There are force fields of red beams throughout the complex which can be activated to block access to intruders. The player can move with weapons drawn and use an automatic targeting function, but enemies can knock weapons out of Regina's hand, at which point she will have to retrieve them. The word danger may flash on the screen in perilous situations, at which point the player should push all the controller buttons rapidly as possible to survive. And if Regina dies, the player may continue from the room that she died in, but after five continues are exhausted, the player must continue from their last save point. Dino Crisis was positively reviewed, mostly. 
Critics obviously compared Dino Crisis to the Resident Evil series, but reviewers found the game enhanced and altered the Resident Evil formula with strength of its own merit. Critics generally praised the action and intensity of the game, which was heightened by the real-time engine and soundtrack. IGN described the game as a vicious, flesh-tearing fright, noting the fast-paced gameplay during the action sequences. Some praise was directed towards the realism of the game with the dinosaur behaviours and the bleeding mechanics. The real-time graphics were generally liked, with critics describing them as sharp, sterile and clean. While some found the variety of dinosaurs to be lacking, despite the game being 90% raptor, which IGN found to be not as scary as the monsters from the Resident Evil series, they found that the dinosaur sound effects were well done, and also noted comparisons to Jurassic Park thusly dubbing the game Resident Evil with Dinosaurs. Dino Crisis spawned four follow-up games. Dino Crisis 2, an action shooter, was released for the PlayStation in 2000. Dino Stalker, a light gun game for the PlayStation 2 in 2002. Dino Crisis, Dungeon in Chaos, a mobile game in 2003. And finally, an action-based game, Dino Crisis 3, was released in 2003 for the Xbox. Protagonist Regina has also been featured as a playable character in the tactical role-playing game Namco X Capcom for the PlayStation 2, and her outfits are also available to wear in Resident Evil 3 Nemesis and Dead Rising 3 via DLC. Look, we've been all over and there's no sign of it. Her. I say we call it quits for today and start afresh in the morning. Meow. 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 Uh, there's, there's no milk. Oh yeah, you got the club card points for that. We can rebuild him. We have the technology. Meow, 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 meow. Oh god. Stay with me, buddy! <sighs> Bloody hell, you're quick, I haven't even called you yet! Tiger Tom, cooking show host. A tiger barely alive. Gentlemen, we can rebuild him. We have the technology. We have the capability of making the world's first bionic tiger. Tiger Reginald Tom will be that tiger. Better than he was before. Better. Stronger. Faster. None of that. He's covered on his insurance. Released in 2009 for the PlayStation 3 and the Xbox 360, Prototype is an open-world action-adventure game, and 2019 sees Prototype turn 10 years old. Players take on the role of Alex Mercer, who must stop a plague that turns ordinary people into hideous monsters. Alex must not only try and stop the plague outbreak, but must also try and uncover his past while confronting the US military and a shady black ops organisation called Blackwater. The game takes place in a medium-sized open-world version of Manhattan, with all its famous landmarks, including the Empire State Building, Chrysler Building, Trump Building, and the One Chase Manhattan Plaza, to name but a few. Alex's primary superpower is his ability to shapeshift, but he also has the ability to consume others, absorbing them entirely, allowing Alex to quickly regain health by absorbing the biomass of his enemies and take on the forms of the human enemies he absorbs. Alex can perform various melee attacks without shapeshifting and has incredible physical strength, as well as gymnastic moves such as air combos and a high-speed rolling cannonball attack. Welcome, ladles and jelly spoons. Uh, this is the part of the video where I play a little bit of the game and reminisce. And is there much to reminisce about with Prototype? Well, for me personally, yes, there is. This game came out in 2009, uh, which is the year that I went off to university. And this is the last game that I played before I went to university. Uh, now, that's not to say I went to university, didn't play a video game again until I'd finished university and then resumed my uh, video gaming passion. This just reminds me of it. This was like the last game I played before I knew I was shipping out and 
and heading away from home. Uh, and and what a game to play! Oh, this game, uh, as probably a lot of people know, came out came out I should say around about the same time that Infamous came out for the PlayStation. Obviously, Infamous was a PlayStation exclusive. This game came out for the Xbox 360, PlayStation 3, and not the Wii. Uh, I can't remember where I got that little pun from, but uh, if anyone can remember, please feel free to put it down in the comments, because it always makes me laugh when I get to say it. Uh, this introductory cutscene, I think, is brilliant because it gives you uh, a nice little introduction into the game that you're about to play. Um, you've uh, obviously you've sort of got oh oh military oh no there's there's a, a lady in trouble oh my god it's all right the military have got her oh my god there's clearly the villains <sighs> definitely getting left for dead vibes uh, from from the horde there like oh no are they going to be able to like stop the horde of they didn't call them zombies in this game I can't remember what they did call them like the infected oh it's okay. It's the military. Everything's going to be all right. Upstanding military chaps. No, not upstanding military chaps. Private military mercenaries is what they are. And there's our badass protagonist, Alex Mercer. And sorry, I've just remembered I probably should have warned you, this particular part of the cutscene is quite visceral. But as I was saying, it gives you a good uh, idea of the game you're about to play. Obviously quite a, a violent game. And you've got two sets of uh, enemies. You've got the private military mercenaries and you've got the infected. And it gives you a little bit of a look at some of Alex Mercer's abilities. Obviously, pretty much guess what's going to happen here. Oh, no, it won't be necessary to call for transport because Alex Mercer is a shapeshifter. Oh, yes. I was never too keen on that little animation of how he shapeshifts. It always kind of kind of got me. But also, you know, it gives you an idea of like some of Alex Mercer's abilities and, and powers. And here we go with a bit of gameplay. <clears throat> Kill all the military personnel. Bashi, 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 bashi. Uh, you've probably guessed um, I'm playing this on the PC at the minute. Um, it just it looks a little bit nicer than the uh, original PlayStation 3 version, which I do have somewhere knocking around. I should really have brought the box in, but I didn't. Uh, I think it's a, did it get a sort of re a remaster on the PlayStation 4? I can't remember. I think it did. Uh, but what I was going to say is, this game comes from that era of gaming where it was very common to basically, in the tutorial level, which this is, give you all of your abilities and all of your powers right at the very start. And teach you basically how the game works, let you have a little bit of a play. Uh, you are effectively like a walking battle tank. Uh, kill all the military personnel. Uh, it's not really changed the uh, objective there, but there you go. And then through things that happen, th through the way they want to tell the story, they manage to quote unquote convincingly uh, remove all your powers and basically have you start with very minimal powers like you can't do that in the in the next level you can't like make spikes suddenly appear from the ground uh, to be fair this game does it quite well uh, i've just realized they're not military personnel they are innocent civilians that i'm meant to be sort of protecting um, yeah th this game does it convincingly in the fact that it Tries to, it basically sort of is, you're working back to this level, if that makes sense, in the rest of the game. Like it'll, I think it takes you back like a year or something, like a year earlier, and it's 
to when Alex Mercer was first infected. I've got to deal with the tank. Oh, bloody hell. Again, another thing that I think really... I'm not going to say sets this game apart, because it was, a, it was another thing that a lot of games in the early 2000s was... Were, was the little bit can't speak. Can't speak, focus on the game. <laughs> a lot of things... <laughs> another thing that a lot of games... This... Sorry. Another thing that a lot of games were doing at this period in gaming. Uh, sorry, that was just really amusing. <laughs> Woohoo! Uh, I will get this point out. Something that you saw a lot of during the so early 2000s in video games was protagonists that weren't necessarily good, but they weren't necessarily evil either. They were this kind of weird grey sort of area. And this is a, a fine example of it, like Alex Mercer sort of realises that he's kind of the bad guy um, but he's, you know, he's effectively out for himself. I am going to apologise because this is my favourite weapon in the whole freaking game. Love this kind of like sphere lance. Whatever you want to call it. It's a bloody awesome. Uh, bloody awesome game. <laughs> bloody awesome game, bloody awesome game, bloody awesome weapon as well. But yeah, so Also, the nice thing about this, another a nice gameplay element, which I have just been reminded about just there, is that because you've got two enemies that are also enemies of themselves, you can a lot of the time just get like the infected and the military to like fight amongst themselves and just go in and polish off whoever's left if you get into a sticky situation. Like like this bit. Although this Oh, there's going to be a strike team. Oh my god, what's Alex Mercer going to do? He's going to pull off something amazing. I should say something badass. Uh, come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on. I, think, I think this is the last thing you have to do. That's it, leap. Destroy one helicopter. It's alright, I'm about to destroy all the helicopters and all the tanks and... And I'm not paying attention because I just get hit by a mortar. Let's see, kill this dude. Well, I say kill him, I'm actually going to consume him. That's it, I've got all my power and boom! <laughs> so, like, final, kind of like, final super attack ability. It was awesome. And there we go. So yes, uh, that was a little bit of a look at prototype. Uh, definitely go and check it out. It is, it is it's worth playing today. I think it's a, a fun little violent romp. Published by Activision and developed by Radical Entertainment, who people might remember for developing a disappointing set of Crash Bandicoot games for the PlayStation 2, but I will always remember for Independence Day on the PlayStation 1, prototype was a commercial and critical success. Reviewers praised the game not only for its intriguing storyline and protagonist, but also for its massive arsenal of moves and abilities. The Daily Telegraph gave it 8 out of 10 and said it offers an action-filled experience that few games can match. The array of attacks on offer is almost unparalleled in both its variety and ease of accessibility. The pure adrenaline-boosting entertainment value of the finished product is enough to push most visual and gameplay niggles far enough to the background so as to eradicate them as concerns in all but the most snobbish of gamers. Personally, I think it was a bit of a dig at Teletext Game Central, who gave it 5 out of 10, concluding the initial feeling of power and freedom hides another badly designed and unimaginative superhero sim. Prototype was released two weeks after Sucker Punch Productions Infamous, a game with many similar concepts, including a character with superpowers, a large open world environment that players can travel by climbing up buildings and gliding about the city, and this led many games critics to compare and contrast the two games. You'll be pleased to hear that the operation was a complete success, and the patient is doing very well. We're going to be putting him on an experimental drug for his recovery, uh, called Blacklight. 
experimental drug. But that sounds dangerous. Oh no, you've got nothing to worry about. The chance of him becoming a shape-shifting serial killer are very low. But just tell me, you don't live with any small children, do you? No. Why? Oh, no, no, no reason at all. It's just sometimes uh, patients in recovery can occasionally go through a short maiming small children and animals phase. C can we see him? Ah, feel free to go in now. Just don't excite him too much. Ah, oh, how are you feeling? <coughs> meow. Meow, meow. I should have warned you, he's not a big fan of Mondays. So you're on the mend then. Thanks very much for checking out the retrospective review of Prototype. Be sure to let me know what you thought of it by leaving me a comment and uh, telling me if you have played Prototype yourself back in the day and what did you think of it. If you enjoyed this be sure to follow me for more videos just like this one every week. Tear off and out. For those of you that have been with me long enough, you might remember that I attempted to do a Soul Reaver retrospective before, and... Link's of Change Soul Reaver was released on the original PlayStation and Microsoft Windows in 1999, and I was a mere 16 years old when I played one of the many games that permanently cemented in place my love for video games. Yeah, I think I can do better. Fifty-nine, please, love. Look, look, I can barely hear you. I'll have to call you back. Meow, 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 meow. I don't know. He doesn't look too friendly. Maybe let's get out of here. Normally, I like to keep my retrospective reviews to the 20th anniversary birthday month that the game came out. But Legacy of Kane Soul Reaver is definitely the exception to that rule. The Legacy of Kane series is one of my all-time favourite video game series. The characters, the plotline, the gameplay, to me it's just brilliant and it came to me at the right point in my life. That's why, even though the game came out in August 1999, and here we are in September, I still wanted to talk about it. If you've got any fond memories of the Legacy of Kane series, in particular Soul Reaver, I'd love to hear about them in the comments down below. Legacy of Kane Soul Reaver is an action-adventure video game developed by Crystal Dynamics and published by Eidos Interactive. At the time, Eidos Interactive was best known for publishing the early Tomb Raider games. Soul Reaver was originally designed and published for the Sony PlayStation, but would make the leap to the PC later in the year and would be ported to the Sega Dreamcast in early 2000. Legacy of Kane Soul Reaver is the second game in the Legacy of Kane series. Soul Reaver tells the story of vampire turned Wraith Raziel, who is killed by the vampire lord Kane, but then revived by the Elder Gods to exact revenge. Welcome, ladles and jelly spoons, to the part of the video where I play a little bit of the game in question, or that we're, sorry, that we're talking about today, and, uh, well, reminisce, uh, I guess, for this particular game, because I don't have too many facts about it. The main fact about this game is, obviously, the game went through a, a period of development hell, uh, and is exactly why we get to look at that lovely screen, Blood Omen, Legacy of Kane developed by Silicon Knights and Soul Reaver was developed by Crystal Dynamics right at the very end. Um, both development companies sort of fell out for various reasons uh, and prolonged the release of the game. Uh, some people that I've spoken to have said that actually that might have been a good thing um, because if they tried to cram all of the elements, all of the gameplay mechanics that they'd want to do into this one uh, sole PlayStation game, it might have suffered because of it. Um, I sort of see that argument, but I also sort of say, yeah, the game, unfortunately, though, finishes at a really weird cliffhanger. And you just go like, hang on, there's no way they can have planned that to have been the end of the game. However, we did get a very nice sequel out of it, so... Swings and roundabouts, uh, I guess. Um, apologies, as always, for the squeaky chair. Uh, until I have the honour yeah. of surpassing my lord. 
it's not it's not too bad today. I'm saying that it's going to probably let out the world's worst squeak in a minute. Now, now personally, I played Soul Reaver before I played uh, Legacy of Cain. Um, yeah, <laughs> I. I, I don't mind Legacy of Cain. It's obviously a, it's a harder game to play now, and it's a harder game to play if you've oh played this first. Um, I a new but kind of still, still a, still a decent game. And you know something bad's about to happen. There he goes. Oh dear. Poor old Raziel had the uh, had the audacity to grow wings before Cain, and Cain got a little bit cross about it and has decided to cast him into the uh, the abyss. There was only one possible outcome. Uh, you're all going to die. Damnation. Now, um, one thing I always remember the first time I, I played this game, if you look at, we're going to get a close to Kane's face in a minute, his obvious hairline there, which is kind of like coming, coming down here, like right there, isn't it? I didn't realise that was his hairline. I thought it was, I genuinely thought it was like his skull. First time I played it, it took me ages to realise, oh, it's his hair. Because obviously his sort of like eye brows have gone like, or like this bit has grown over the top of it. Now, I played this game obviously back in 1999. It's one of the few games I played around at my uh, grandparents' house. I used to take my PlayStation over there at weekends. And we used to have a. Uh, I used to play it in the evenings. Back from the precipice of madness. The descent had destroyed me. Sorry, I'm waiting for the uh, the voiceover because I just again one of one of my fond memories. He sort of he wakes up, he realizes, oh my god, he's still alive, but he's not. He's not vampire. He's not human. of a free steak dinner courtesy of the Elder God Enterprises, I guess. No. <laughs> yeah, I play this game uh, round at my grandparents' house. I now, I think it is testament to the writing of this game that my grandparents what understood what was going on. What this is one of the few of games that they didn't like have. it because there would be a release that's the God-fearing Simple folk. That sounds really cruel. I don't mean it to sound that. I don't mean that to sound like an insult. But yeah, um, they obviously they they never understood like the storyline of Super Mario or Sonic because that was back in the days when the storyline was in the manual. You had to read the manual to understand kind of like, the story behind the game. This game is probably one of the first games I ever played with them or in front of them where they. It understood that like that this was a story of sort of of revenge and like uh, you know they understood, oh, okay there's this bad guy he's just thrown our protagonist into a pit and he's gonna get his, his revenge and I was like wow that says a lot about the writing for of early or sort of, I guess the late uh, PlayStation games. Um, and they, that is one of the main reasons why this game has sort of like stuck uh, in my memory. Um, this, scene, this scene, actually, in particular, is also kind of one that sort of stuck, always sticks in my memory. Whenever I think of Legacy of Cain, I think of this particular scene. Walks towards the camera, and he does this weird kind of like. Yeah, yeah, weird. Uh, right, let's go. Okay. So, uh, this uh, opening bit is very much like the tutorial uh, of the game. You'll, um, it sort of takes you through some various things you can do. Uh, obviously, it's introducing the, the gates. Uh, to, the game, uh, to the game. My grandparents didn't necessarily understand everything about the game. Like I think the like the actual gameplay elements of it, like the level design, that sort of confused them. They wondered why there was so much 
uh, why they had to wait so long or you know they didn't really understand what I was doing when I was trying to tra traverse a level or solve a puzzle they just sort of understood the cutscenes and uh, some of the voiceover, uh, voiceover slash uh, exposition I, they didn't particularly enjoy the the violence in the game. I think they were a bit sort of. I think I think I'm right in thinking. I think I'm right in remembering that I played this game before I played Resident Evil in front of them. They definitely didn't like that. Uh, yeah. But obviously, compared to today's standards, the. You are weak. The violence in this game is, is, has left me. is quite comical. I don't think it was designed to be comical. I think that's just kind of like the way it's aged is just quite, quite humorous. But, you know, when this game first came out, they were like, oh, God, you're... This bit in particular, I remember, I remember my grand making a comment about this bit. So, yeah, consume the souls of your enemies. And she was like, why do you have to consume the souls of, of the lost souls of the underworld? They're like, that was just, that was, that's Marjorie. That was poor, uh, poor Derek from the Cash and Carry. And that was, uh, here we are, consumed another one. Debbie from uh, the WI and, uh, and Sandra from Two Doors Down. I'm like, well, they don't, why do they deserve to be sucked up? Like, <laughs> okay, it's just, just a mechanic. No need to, no need to lose your shit. I didn't say that. Uh, we'll hopefully get to to a um, to a to a combat scene, a proper combat uh, scene, and you sort of see what I mean about about the, uh, the quote unquote comical violence. Jump and hold to glide. Oop, there we go. Ooh, boom. Again, this game was built as I think I've, I, I have, I will talk about it uh, in, Scabrous, are they in the actual industry? video. Was built on the Gex Three engine, the and yeah. when I found that out, I was yeah. genuinely quite, yeah. quite surprised because that game was quite sort of, it's a family sort of friendly, light, quite bright game. This game is very dark and gothic and, and has actually just shown its age quite amusingly uh, because it says press hold, hold R1 to auto face or as we probably call it now lock on or target. Yeah the, uh, the term auto face definitely uh, definitely aging this game. Yeah, one of the first games I think to have an auto, an auto face or a lock on uh, function. Here we go, explaining the gates, so we're going to head to the mortal realm. The spectral and material realms. With their aid, you may gather matter. Legacy of Kane Soul Reaver began development alongside a direct sequel to the first Legacy of Kane game in 1997. Soul Reaver focused more on puzzle solving, whereas Blood Omen 2 focus was more on action. Crystal Dynamics staff aimed to develop gameplay similar to Tomb Raider by using an upgraded version of the Gex 3 game engine to generate the three-dimensional game world. For the story, Soul Reaver is based on the research of vampire mythology that Silicon Knights did for Blood Omen, as well as drawing on inspiration from the epic poem Paradise Lost. They also aimed to combine gameplay with storytelling, in a similar manner to Legend of Zelda a link to the past. The game's director, Amy Hennig, likened the technological advances from Blood Omen to Soul Reaver to the evolution of the Legend of Zelda series from the Super Nintendo to the N64, bringing the franchise into 3D while maintaining a similar 2D style. Now, it's true, you can't really talk about the Legacy of Kane series without talking about Amy Hennig. From starting out as being a games artist for the original NES, to being the director and scriptwriter at Naughty Dog and working on the Uncharted series. Amy Hennig has been called one of the most influential women in the games industry. She believes that the creative direction of the script holds more importance than the graphics of a game. She also considers her work on the Legacy of Kane series to be her greatest achievement. While development seemed to be going well, just before Soul Reaver's release, Silicon Knights filed an injunction to stop further promotion of the game. 
because they were unhappy with Crystal Dynamics' use of their research. This in turn forced Crystal Dynamics to dramatically cut the game down, as they now had a much smaller development team, and original, much larger plans were cut into two, meaning that they had now over-designed the game. Given the constraints, this explains Soul Reaver's cliffhanger ending. Many of the elements that were being talked about for Soul Reaver would show up in later games. Music for the game was composed by Kurt Harland, who is best known for his work on the Legacy of Kane series, but has also composed for many other video games over the years. Harland said in an interview that Amy Hennig wanted the music to change based on the current gameplay situation, and worked very closely with Harland to make sure the music fit. Each vampire tribe has corresponding music. One tribe of vampires was associated with a slow, thumping theme to convey a sense of working machinery. Music from both Soul Reaver and Soul Reaver 2 were released in a promotional soundtrack in 2001. Voice acting in the game was covered by a rich cast. Michael Bell, who is best known for his youthful voice despite being 81 years old, was brought on board to voice Raziel. I am your creation, Cain. Now, as before. Tony Jay, best known as the voice of Judge Claude Frollo in Disney's The Hunchback of Notre Dame, voiced the Elder God. Use your hatred to reave their souls. And Amy Gunn, Simon Templeman and Richard Doyle reprised their role from the first Legacy of Cain game as Ariel, Cain and Morbius. Hey, isn't that the guy from outside the corner shop? And will yourself to become manifest in the physical world. <laughs> will yourself to become manifest Your in mortal realm. be fully restored. You require no conduit to return to this place. No, nope, you just need you to get beaten up enough physical body and you'll be sent time. back in, back to the spectral realm. Get cast. There we go. Sustain your strength to prolong your manifestation in the physical world. Keep eating world. souls and you can stay if you in, fail the, to feed in the mortal realm. Absorb too many wounds, this get beaten up enough will and you will be sent back. <laughs> you will be sent back in, back to the spectral realm. Don't go you in water. Young yet, Raziel. You still retain many of your vampiric weaknesses. Emerging also, I like the fact that this is one of the one of the few games I think I've played in uh, in a long time, where actually they take the time to do a bit of a voiceover and sort of tell you what what's, what the crack is with the game. So many games now, I think they try not to take you out of the immersion, so they just flash up sort of something on screen, and so often I miss it. I dipped my toe in. Sorry. I'm just thinking I've, I've played some of uh, Red Dead Redemption 2 uh, recently and, and that what game and GTA 5 annoyed the shit out of me. Uh, like, they it'll mention the, the game mechanic briefly and I miss it. It's impossible. These foul scuttling beasts could not be kin of our high blood. No, oh, but they are, as they are. They definitely are. Time stood still for you, Raziel. So this is the first proper combat bit, and I'll sort of hopefully get to show you uh, what I mean by don't fall in the water. Christ. I knew my opponent's weaknesses, having suffered them myself. I like, Physical I like the wounds are fleeting. The vampire's immortal the flesh begins to close as soon like as it is like. Vampires need only. I will quite happily admit that. Um, flame. Water scorches uh, like acid. I think I definitely Fledgeries preferred the, the Dreamcast version of the game, but I do have a soft have spot for the, the PlayStation the version, which is why that's the version we're playing today. That and see, I can get in the CERN, bitches. Uh, that and I didn't want to have to spend ages trying to work out how to rig up the <laughs> rig up the Dreamcast. I was like, today is not that day. Come on, come on. Come on, come on. I know you know you're not allowed to come into the sunlight, but come on, try and attack me. Come on, try and attack me. Come on. Yeah. Oh. Need to be up here. Be up here. Come on. Oh. Oh. Ah. Bang. Bang. See what I mean? It's... Wait for his time. I don't, I, I understand why my grandparents were a bit, ooh, 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 
exactly. Draw it in quickly, Raziel, or you will be compelled to follow. Right. Oh. Physical prowess surpasses what you knew in life. Yes. Even massive obstacles can be moved effortlessly. This bit itself, uh, this this kind of also had a um, a very uh, like a very Tomb Raider feel to it. I think once you get through here, we get a nice little bit of a nice little exposition dump. Oh my God! <gasps> the sanctuary of the clans reduced to ruin. Beyond these walls lay the pillars of knowledge. As much as you can show ruins in uh, sort of PlayStation style old, graphics, again, collapsing into the dust. The, former magnificence. the PC uh, and yet, version and the Dreamcast version were. In the instant they looked a little bit prettier. Uh, resurrection. Centuries had apparently passed. This world is wrecked with cataclysms. The earth strains to shrug off the pestilence of Cain's parasitic empire. The fate of this world was preordained in an instant by a solitary man. Unwilling to martyr himself to restore Nosgoth's balance, Cain condemned the world to the decay you see. In that moment, the unraveling began. Now it is nearly played out. Nosgoth teeters on the brink of collapse. Its fragile balance cannot hold. And there we are, have a little bit of exposition dump. Uh, and that sort of sums up pretty much what happened in the first game. Obviously Cain refused to sort of martyr himself used to die and set the balance, he was like, I want to live forever! Uh, and it also, in my eyes, sort of signals the end of the tutorial. Uh, so you're kind of left in this, quite, for its time, sort of open world... Right, I cannot grab this fucking... There we go. Buff, buff, buff. Come on, come on, you bastard. Come on, come on. And impale! Three! Right, that's the other thing, <laughs> a nice little uh, bit there. Because they didn't get time, I don't know if it's because they didn't get time or uh, they always had it planned, they didn't animate the bending down to pick something up off the floor uh, sort of animation, so every time you, you go past something you want to pick it up, you just sort of get zapped to your hand uh, instantly. Uh, but that was... A, uh, we're going to stop right there. Uh, that was a brief look at Legacy of Kane Soul Reaver. Genuinely is one of the, the gems of uh, early, sorry, late 90s uh, PlayStation gaming. It, it's not without its flaws, I'm not going to lie. But it, yeah, it's a, a terrific game and I uh, hope you've enjoyed watching me play through a little bit of it. As the game begins, Raziel approaches Kane's throne and extends his newly grown wings. In an act of seeming jealousy, Kane tears the bones from Raziel's wings and throws him into the Lake of the Dead. Raziel is resurrected as a wraith by the Elder God to kill Cain, thus restoring the land of Nosgoth that Cain has left to rot following the events of Legacy of Cain Blood Omen. With the Elder God's help, Raziel adapts to his new form. Raziel confronts Cain who does not appear surprised to see him, apparently having expected to see him, and implies that he has destroyed Raziel's vampire clan. Cain quickly overpowers Raziel and attempts to strike him down with the Soul Reaver, a powerful sword that absorbs its victim's souls. However, the Reaver shatters when it strikes Raziel, and Cain escapes, strangely satisfied. Right, if I go any further, I'm going to spoil the game for you, and I can highly recommend that you seek out this game and try it for yourself. If you're a fan of vampires and vampire stories, I genuinely do believe that 
this game series is one of the better vampire stories out there. If you're wondering, playing the game for the first time, it will probably take you a good, I'd say 12 hours to complete, which for a 1999 video game is no bad thing. Once you know what you're doing and you've played it a couple of times, you could probably get through the whole thing in about 8 to 10 hours. The player controls Raziel, a disfigured and ghostly vampire come Wraith. The gameplay relies largely on shifting between material and spectral planes of existence to progress through areas. Interaction with objects in the spectral realm is limited. Blocks and doors and switches can only be manipulated in the physical realm. Because Raziel can phase through the realms, he can often find ways through impassable sections in one realm or the other. Many puzzles are based on the differences between the two realms. Combat is a hack and slash system, involving the use of combinations of various different attacks before a finishing move. Enemies in the game are most commonly vampires, as well as human enemies such as vampire hunters, vampire worshippers and peasants. Human enemies can be killed by Raziel's melee attack or with any weapon, but vampires must be bludgeoned into a stunned state and either impaled, set on fire or thrown into sunlight or water. In the spectral realm you'll fight minor enemies called Slaug, and the souls of dead vampires who have become wraiths. Defeated enemies will leave behind souls to replenish Raziel's health, which decreases automatically in the material realm. Possession of the Soul Reaver Sword will stop the automatic degradation of health in the physical realm, but Raziel loses the sword instantly if he sustains damage, and can regain it only by restoring his health to full. At the start of the game, Raziel can jump, glide using his torn wings, move blocks, and pick up and throw objects and enemies. He fights using his claws, but can alternatively use weapons such as rocks, torches, spears and staffs. Raziel can freely shift to the spectral realm, but he can return to the material realm only through the use of portals when at full health. Raziel will automatically return to the spectral realm if he runs out of health. As the game progresses, Raziel gains the powers of his brothers after killing them, such as the ability to phase through gates in the spectral realm, climb walls in the material realm, constrict objects and enemies with a band of energy, and whilst initially vulnerable to water, he gains the power to overcome this weakness and is able to swim. Players can also find relics that give Raziel the power to fire bolts of telekinetic energy, transform the Soul Reaver into the Flame Reaver by baptism in the Holy Flame, as well as find magical glyphs at glyph altars that allow Raziel to expand his magical energy and attack groups of enemies simultaneously. Mio! 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 Shit! Quick, Tiger Tom! The house keys! Uh, come on! Come on! Thank God I caught up with you. You forgot your change in the corner shop. Here you are. 49p. Thanks. You know what? I think I might have preferred it if you were out to kill us. You know, speaking of Wartons, I've had one of these. Mm. Meow, meow. What is it, Tiger Tom? Meow, 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 I thought I told you no more experiments. Meow, 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 meow. Okay, do I need to bring the hunting rifle? Meow, 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 meow. Resident Evil 3 Nemesis, a survival horror game developed by Capcom and released for the original Sony PlayStation in Japan in September 1999, but it didn't make its way to European shelves until February of 2000. As the title suggests, it's the third instalment in the Resident Evil series, however, it wasn't intended to be the third game in the series. Originally planned as a spin-off featuring a different protagonist, Resident Evil 3 was designed to have a more action-orientated gameplay than previous Resident Evil games. While it sold more than 3 million copies worldwide, and critics praised the nemesis as an intimidating villain, it was criticised for its short length and story. Resident Evil 3 Nemesis was ported to the Sega Dreamcast and PC in 2000 and the GameCube in 2003. September 28th, 1998, 24 hours before the events of Resident Evil 2. Freeze! 
Who are you? What are you doing here? Jill Valentine, formerly of the Raccoon City Special Tactics and Rescue Service, STARS, tries to escape an outbreak of the T-Virus, a biological weapon secretly developed by the pharmaceutical company Umbrella in Raccoon City. With most of the city transformed into zombies. As Jill tries to get out of the city, she is forever being hunted by a new enemy, the Nemesis, a bio-organic weapon programmed to target surviving STARS members, witnesses of Umbrella's experiments. Jill encounters three surviving members of the Umbrella Biohazard Countermeasure Service, UBCS, Carlos Olivia, Mikhail Victor and Nikolai Zenevi. Nikolai explains to Jill and Carlos that the rescue helicopter can be contacted if they manage to reach the city's clock tower and ring the bell. Would you like to know more? My recommendation as always is if you can get yourself a copy of the game and try it for yourself. Chances are if you like Resident Evil 2 or if you're a fan of 80s zombie movies, this game is probably right up your alley. First time playthrough, I reckon you could probably have it done in about 6 to 7 hours, but as with all Resident Evil games, once you sort of know your way around the city and know what key opens what door, you can have it done and dusted in under 3. Resident Evil 3 Nemesis, or just Nemesis as the fans tend to refer to it, is your classic survival horror game where the player controls the protagonist from a third person perspective and uses tank controls to explore the city and either fight or avoid enemies. You can open doors, push objects or climb obstacles. Parts of the environment such as explosive barrels can be shot causing them to explode and damage nearby enemies. The game also introduces the ability for players to dodge attacks or perform a quick 180 degree turn to evade enemies. Once again the player has a certain amount of health which decreases when attacked and you must either use first aid sprays or herbs to regain health. The player has access to a range of firearms to defeat enemies such as pistols, shotguns, automatic weapons and a rocket launcher. Resident Evil 3 also introduced an ammunition creation system that allows players to create new ammunition from different varieties of gunpowder. Throughout the city, weapons, ammunition and other items can be collected and put into the player's limited inventory, in which case the player must keep items in a storage box, usually located in a save room, and only take what they need to fight enemies or solve puzzles. In certain situations, usually when the nemesis appears, the player is given a prompt to choose between two possible actions. These choices affect how the story unfolds and goes towards which ending is achieved, as well as affecting the location of some boss battles. Once you've completed the main story, the player gets access to a minigame called The Mercenaries Operation Mad Jackal. The player gets to control one of the three members of the Umbrella Biohazard Countermeasure Service that Jill encounters during the main story, with the aim of getting from one side of the city to another in a set time, and with a preset inventory. Due to the time limit given at the start of the minigame being insufficient to complete the level, the player must extend the timer by defeating enemies, rescuing civilians and exploring hidden areas. The mercenaries mode was so popular that it made its way into most Resident Evil games after this, and even had its own spin-off on the Nintendo 3DS. Depending on rank received and difficulty chosen, completing the main game may unlock alternative costumes for Jill and epilogue files that detail the activities of different characters following the events of the game. Developed by Capcom and produced by series veteran Shinji Mikami, Resident Evil 3 began its development being set on a luxury cruise liner and had a general plot where Hunk was attempting to bring back a sample of the G-Virus featured in Resident Evil 2. However, Capcom realised that the game would not be complete in time for the original PlayStation due to Sony's announcement of the PlayStation 2, so the project was cancelled. Resident Evil 3 was developed in tandem with Resident Evil Code Veronica for the Dreamcast. Code Veronica does take place after the events of Resident Evil 2, but Capcom wanted Nemesis to be the third numbered game in the series to keep titles of the PlayStation games consistent. Capcom chose Jill Valentine as the protagonist of the game because she was the only suitable character remaining, noting that Resident Evil protagonists Claire Redfield and Chris Redfield were previously chosen for Code Veronica. Capcom was working on multiple Resident Evil projects at the time and did not want fans to wait some years for a new game. The company promoted one of its other projects as the third main canonical game. The project was a spin-off that had been in development by an inexperienced team under director Kazuhiro Ayama, and was originally intended to introduce a new character who would have to escape from the infected Raccoon City. Due to its sudden promotion, Capcom decided that Resident Evil protagonist Jill Valentine would be the main character and that Raccoon City would be destroyed. Writer Yasura Kawamura, who had very little experience with the Resident Evil series at the time, had to play the original game to familiarise himself with the series' fictional universe immediately. To avoid continuity errors with the other instalments in the series, monthly meetings were held between all directors and producers. 
as with Resident Evil 1 and 2, 3 uses the same game engine. The environments consist of 2D pre-rendered backgrounds, whilst moving objects such as enemies and some interactive elements consist of 3D polygon graphics. But improvements were made so that the player could have better interaction with the environment, such as shooting exploding barrels and adding more variety of zombies, as well as making it possible to have more enemies on screen and improving the zombies AI. Resident Evil 3 takes place in Raccoon City, a choice made by the developers so they could have more varied environments, and Capcom wanted the game to be more action orientated, which resulted in the 180 degree turn and the introduction of a dodge feature so that players could avoid enemy attacks. The Nemesis creature was inspired by the T-1000 Terminator from Terminator 2 Judgment Day. According to Mikami, he said he wanted to bring a new kind of fear into the game. Um, you sure you haven't just brought me here to buy you a car? Ah, do lad. You want to buy a car? Meow, 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 meow. Oh, Bob. Bob. Ah, Bob Nemesis. Best goddamn second hand car dealer I ever have done gone hired. Every person I send to him ends up buying. On account I think they're too scared to say no, but he gets a five star rating on every transaction. Ah! Goes again, well done Bob! Look, he's not Bob, he's a biologically engineered walking killing machine and we really need to get him into a safe space before before he hurts anybody. Oh, well, aren't you a judgmental Judy? Just because he's not going to win any beauty contests, you think you can just lock him in a cage. He's the best goddamn employee I've got. And if you're not here to buy a car, my son, I'm going to have to ask you to leave. Music from the game was composed by Masami Ueda, Saori Maeda, and Susukuchi Uchiyama. A double soundtrack of the album was released in September 1999. It can be found on Spotify, Apple Music and on YouTube. Physical copies aren't hard to come by, but they might set you back a few quid. Published in 2000, a novelisation of the game was written by S.D. Perry. As I did in my last Resident Evil retrospective, albeit in the form of an editor's note as I was going through my final cut of the video, I'd like to give a bit of a shout out to Zombie Duck Productions. I think he has changed his name to Big Fox now. He's been producing his own audiobook versions of the S.D. Perry novelizations of the Resident Evil series for a while now. And whilst if you look up on YouTube Resident Evil audiobooks, you will find a slew of fan-made audiobooks of the S.D. Perry novelizations, I have yet to find another person doing a fan-made project with this level of detail and production value. Please check him out, there is a link in the description down below and I'll have put a card up here somewhere. Also, he's a really nice guy as well, if you ever get chatting to him in his comment sections. Capcom featured Resident Evil 3 Nemesis at the Tokyo Game Show in March 1999, and a playable version of the game was available at E3 in 1999, as well as including a brief demo of Resident Evil 3 in the US shipments of their earlier game Dino Crisis, which had had a successful launch in Japan. Resident Evil 3 received very positive reviews from critics at GameSpot, official UK PlayStation magazine Edge, and CVG, computer and video games. The game's pre-rendered backgrounds were praised for their high level of detail and the 3D modelling of Jill Valentine was greatly improved when compared to the blocky models of the original game. Sound effects and music received similar praise, however both Games Revolution and official US PlayStation magazine pointed out that while the game encouraged replay value, the length of the game was rather short and lacking, whilst also pointing out that the voice acting was poor, as well as criticising the dodge feature for being impractical and relying too much on timing, resulting in doing more harm to the player than the antagonist opponents. After the release of Resident Evil 2 Remake in 2019, Capcom producer Yoshiaki Hirabashi has said they may consider remaking Resident Evil 3 if fans are vocal enough. Meow. Meow, 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 meow. Look, if your plan is for me to buy you a car off of the Nemesis, meow. whatever, then no. I've already told you, if you sold all your lab equipment, you'd have enough money to buy a car. Meow, 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 meow. We've already done that storyline. Maybe we just let him be. <laughs> How long have you been there? I expected this reaction. All men hate Bob Nemesis. I mean, hate is a strong word. How then must he be hated? 
again, I, I don't hate him. You, his creator, detest and spurn him. Okay, technically he's Tiger Tom's problem. How dare you sport this with life? Do your duty on towards him, and he will do his duty on towards you and the rest of mankind. That want a second hand car on finance. He is thy creature, he ought to be thine Adam, but rather he is the fallen angel whom divides us from the joy of new misdeeds. Everywhere I see bliss from which he alone is excluded. The second hand car dealership is his refuge. He has sold many cars. The finance paperwork, which he does not fear, is a dwelling unto him, and the only thing which stand the owner does not grudge. Mwow, 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 mwow. Yeah. Cheers, Otto. Yeah, that seems to have sorted itself out. Oh, and look. My bagel's still warm. Right, Tiger Tom, are they anything to do with you? No, 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 no. Help with what? Hostile takeover of Tesco's? Can I give you a hand, madam? All right, love. I'll see what I can do for you as well. Tesco's, it really helps. helps. Released in June 2000, Shogun Total War is a real-time tactics and turn-based strategy game published by Electronic Arts and developed by the Creative Assembly for the PC. Shogun Total War's main focus is samurai warfare of the Sengoku period of Japanese history. This period lasted from the mid-15th century to the beginning of the 17th century. The player assumes the role of a Japanese daimyo from one of seven factions, each one of Japan's historic clans. Shimazu, Mori, Takeda, Oda, Imagawa, Uesugi, and Hojo. Independent factions are represented as rebel clans and ronin that the player cannot control, although fans of the series did release a mod allowing you to play as them. Each clan has a specific advantage in a particular area. The player may use military might, diplomacy, espionage, trade and religion to ensure dominance and take the position of shogun. The turn-based aspect of the game focuses on a map of Japan, whilst battles are fought in a 3D real-time mode. Shogun Total War was the Creative Assembly's debut solo developed game and it was seen as a big risk product back in 1999 when it was first announced because the Creative Assembly had previously been linked to EA Sports. Whilst the game was first conceived as a 2D RTS, the jump was made to 3D as 3D graphics cards were becoming more popular in response to the success of such titles as Command and Conquer. As development went on, Shogun Total War evolved into a real-time tactics game with a focus on historical authenticity. The Creative Assembly brought on historians to advise in the game's development, as well as adding a turn-based campaign map to give context to the real-time battles. Shogun Total War was well received by consumers and critics alike, but it did come under some fire regarding the game's glitches. The game would receive a Europe-only expansion pack in 2001, The Mongol Invasion, and the game's good reputation and sales paved the way for the development of successive Total War releases, set in different times and regions. What are we going to do with them? Meow, 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 meow. Maybe we should send them to Dicky, force him to watch Dictatorial season two. Meow, 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 meow. 
The idea for Shogun Total War was thought up by Michael Simpson, a microchip designer who was working in the Creative Assembly under Electronic Arts, producing games for the EA Sports brand. According to Simpson, the idea for Shogun Total War came to be when the Creative Assembly established a second development team to work on alternate low business risk products for the company. At the time, EA was seeing massive success with the Command & Conquer series. and the games industry was seeing the creation of a number of similar real-time strategy games. This inspired Simpson to put his own new team to work on a real-time strategy game. As the game development went on, 3D FX video cards were becoming more and more of an industry standard, so the Creative Assembly decided to move with the times and move to 3D computer graphics over the initial 2D. While unsure if this was the right move, Simpson was surprised when a 3D rendered landscape turned out to be feasible for gameplay. Now that the game was being developed in 3D, other gameplay elements went under revision, such as the battlefield camera, that was now moved into the general position on the battlefield rather than a static, top-down perspective. However, this did limit how far the player could see across the battlefield, and in turn fundamentally changed the nature of gameplay. Now the game would take a far more historical approach for its units and tactics. However, as an RTS, the game was coming up short. Simpson recalls that, The problem was that the battles themselves were very short and we needed something to tie it together and make people care about the battles. The answer was to introduce a campaign map to provide the player with a broader strategic perspective and a context for the battles. With the introduction of the campaign map, the feudal Japanese and Sengoku setting were chosen, not just because they were cool, but also because of the ability to have different factions that could have potentially won the conflict. Also, the Joidegeki films of Akira Kurosawa also proved as a source of inspiration. Excerpts from the famous Mount Fuji castle scene from his 1985 film Ran even feature in the opening credits to the Warlord edition of the game. The Creative Assembly wanted to make the setting as authentic as possible. To start with, The Art of War by Chinese military expert Sun Tzu is central to tactics and the game's artificial intelligence, to provide more authentic decisions by the computer-controlled factions in the real-time aspect of the game. The Creative Assembly enlisted the aid of Stephen Turnbull, a military historian who specialises with samurai warfare. With the decision to move to 3D graphics also came the business move from a simple low-risk product to a big-risk product. The game was first shown to the public at E3 in both 1999 and 2000, where it gathered interest from the video games media. Not long after E3 2000, the game hit shelves on the 13th of June 2000. In June 2010, 10 years after its debut, the Creative Assembly announced a direct sequel, Shogun Total War 2, which released in March 2011. I'm sure it will come as a shock to you, dear viewer, to discover that this video is not sponsored by Raid Shadow Legends, a graphically impressive gacha mobile game with really bad UI that's not free to play friendly unless you plan on spending all of your free time playing it. And I do mean all of your free time. Just remember, you never liked people anyway. Why waste your time socialising? Raid Shadow Legends has no live PvP, and having social skills is overrated. You could be grinding for your next character, but the game will do absolutely everything in its power to try and convince you that it might be an epic legend, but in reality, it won't. Enter code Skyrim now into any internet browser to discover a game that is far better and much more worth playing. Not only that, but it's now been ported to so many systems that you can play it on an Etch a Sketch. If you like sketching, then I'm for you. I'm Etch a Sketch and I'm fun to do. Try it. If you wanna have fun, try Etch a Sketch with me. I might not be sponsored, but what you can do is subscribe to this channel, click the notification bell, like this video, and say hello in the comments. This normally would be the part of the video where I play a little bit of the game and waffle on about my experiences playing it 20 years ago. However, there's already quite a lot of Shogun Total War on this channel. And it's called 
Dictatorial. Please be sure to check out my Dictatorial playlists at the end of this video. The campaign of Shogun Total War sees the player choosing a clan, removing their enemies through fierce battles, and ultimately becoming the Shogun of feudal Japan. I feel like I'm just doing very well and I'd leave it there and hopefully on a, on a high. Each clan starts with control of various historical provinces. Each province can be farmed to produce a harvest and built upon to expand your army. Let's build a bit of a farm there. That will just get a bit of farm going. Ooh, there we go, twenty percent in there. Why not? Some provinces have natural resources that can be mined, as well as coastal provinces where you may construct a port to increase trade. Castles can be built in each province, and with each castle, there is the ability to expand with a variety of military buildings and dojos. These buildings enable specific army units and agents to be produced. Castles can be upgraded to increase their defences and resilience to a siege. The production of anything in the game is limited by the amount of koku the player has. To generate koku, your faction must have a strong economy and harvest. Most of the game is based on the turn-based strategy map of Japan. Each turn, players can move army or agent units around the map, but can only move one bordering province at a time unless you have access to a port. Army units are made up of archers, cavalrymen, spearmen, heavy infantry and riflemen. These units are reproduced in the game's RTS tactics mode if they are entered into a battle. Each army unit is led by a general, who has an honour score. That honour score will rise and fall depending on the general's success or failure in battle. If the general repeatedly endures defeat, they may commit seppuku. The player's chosen faction daimyo not only has his own personal guard of 11 cavalrymen, but can also have heirs, that will be represented as generals when they come of age. If your daimyo is killed in battle, his heir will take his place if they are of age. If they're not of age, or your daimyo has no heirs, the faction is eliminated from the game. Agent units are made up of emissaries that can be used to bribe enemy or neutral armies to join the player's faction, as well as negotiate alliances or ceasefires. Ninjas can attempt to assassinate enemy generals and agents. Shinobi can spy on enemy provinces or perform counterinsurgencies in home provinces. Both the ninja and shinobi agents have an honour rating that determines how successful they will be in any particular mission. Geishas can assassinate enemy generals as well as bribe enemy or neutral armies. If the player adopts Catholicism after coming into contact with European traders, they will be given the ability to produce Jesuit priests, who in addition to acting as emissaries, convert the population, therefore making rebellions in regions less likely to convert. The battlefield screen and battle system are the second area of gameplay. This controls in real time, but players can opt to have the battles automatically resolved on the campaign map. 311, they've got 212. This is going to be a good battle because... Question, are you defending the river there? No, I'm. A, they're, they're defending. They're always in defence because I've moved into their territory. The computer will take into account factors such as the strength of numbers, weapons used, terrain and even the weather to decide a winner. Units in the battlefield screen and battle system come in the form of Samurai and Ashugari. Each unit has its own intrinsic advantages, disadvantages, costs and overall level of effectiveness. Uh, Yash Yari Ashigaru, waste of time. Oh, three units of Yari Ashigaru, not a chance. To beat the enemy, the player must use contemporary tactics, formations, as well as taking into consideration the terrain of the battlefield and the weather to ensure success in battle. As previously mentioned, the game's AI was programmed with Sun Tzu's The Art of War for its teachings and tactics. Units on both sides have morale, which can increase if the battle goes well for their clan or decrease in cases such as heavy casualties or the death of a general. If the unit's morale is broken, then they will rout. In certain circumstances, however, routing units may be rallied by the general. Victory in battle is achieved by causing every enemy unit to rout or by killing the opposing army. Armies can lay siege to castles, replacing open land battles with close quarter combat within the confines of castle walls. No. Yeah, hi. On your way back, could you pick up some milk from Tesco's? Then unleash ungodly hell, the likes of which the staff at Tesco's have never seen before. Pillage the freezer section, because we're also at Fish Fingers. Decimate the deli counter and raise the store to the ground. 
then maybe try the Sainsbury's, you know, the one on the high street. <laughs> I like the Sainsbury's, making life taste better. For Powerful drop. Hello, Emma Stone speaking? It's okay, you can drop the disguise, it's intelligence here. Ant and Deck have gone missing. We think they've defected. Oh, surely not. Maybe a little bit overweight. Get over to HQ right away. The Chief wants you to go after them. Right away. Mill, 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 mill. Not yet, sir. Mill, 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 mill. Yes, sir. By the way, the PM's on the scrambler. Mill, 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 mill. Released in July 2000, Final Fantasy IX is a role-playing game developed and published by SquareSoft for the Sony PlayStation. And surprisingly, it is the ninth game in the main Final Fantasy series. Critically acclaimed, it is considered by some to be one of the best Final Fantasy games to date. As of March 2016, it has sold more than 5.5 million copies and has been re-released several times. It is currently playable on PlayStation 1, 3, PSP, PS Vita, PlayStation 4, Xbox One and PC. A journey begins. The fantasy returns. Rated T for Teen Square. The game was in development at the same time as Final Fantasy VIII that released a year earlier, and was planned to be a retrospective of sorts of the series, as the setting was a return to the medieval style of previous instalments, unlike the settings of Final Fantasy VI, VII and VIII, and was heavily influenced by the original Final Fantasy. The plot centres around a war between nations in a medieval fantasy world called Gaia. The player follows Zidane Trabal, a bandit who kidnaps Alexandrian princess Garnet Till Alexandros XVII. As part of a gamble by the neighbouring nation of Lindbalm, he joins at Garnet and a growing cast of characters on a quest to take down her mother, Queen Bran, who started the war. The plot shifts when the player learns that Bran is a pawn of a more menacing threat, Kuja, who shares a mysterious history with Zidane, spanning two worlds. Work on Final Fantasy IX had started before Squaresoft had finished work on Final Fantasy VIII, and was developed in Hawaii as a compromise to the developers living in the United States. The development team was fully aware that Final Fantasy IX was going to be the last instalment of the series on the original Sony PlayStation, and so envisioned a reflection on the games that had come before it. Producer and writer Hironobu Sakaguchi said during development it's closest to his ideal view of what a Final Fantasy should be. The development team wanted to make the game's setting more fantasy orientated than its PlayStation predecessors, and thusly reintroduced a medieval setting. With inspiration taken from Norse and Northern European mythology, it was, according to game director Hiroyuki Ito, because of European history and mythology's depth and drama. A move away from the sci-fi futuristic setting was also due in part to other developers of the game as well as fans of the series. Additionally, the team wanted to create an understandable story with deep character development, as both Final Fantasy VII and VIII had come under some criticism for their convoluted plotlines. Sakaguchi began writing the story for Final Fantasy IX in July of 1998. With its return to its fantasy roots, the creator put a lot of time and thought into the aesthetic of the playable characters. This in turn resulted in the characters looking far more comic book-like than their realistic character designs of Final Fantasy VIII. Whilst the game was being conceptualised, the devs made it clear that the game might not necessarily be a main series entry entry, as it was breaking from the realisms of Final Fantasy VII and VIII. The team were worried that it might alienate audiences. This got fans theorising that it might be released as a Gaiden side story, to the main series. However, Square confirmed in late 1999 that it would indeed be published as Final Fantasy IX, despite developers making several last minute adjustments to the game and changing the ending several times. By early 2000 the game was almost ready for release. Why should they want Anton Deck? Saturday night took away. Of course. With Anton Deck out of the picture, the British way of life is finished. Saturday night took away. And the news hasn't broken yet. Well, 
It's an old trick, but it might just work. Final Fantasy IX is set primarily on the world of Gaia. Most of Gaia's population resides in one of four main nations, Alexandria, Lindbalm, Bermensia and Clyra that reside on the mist continent, named after the thick mist that blankets the lowlands. Alexandria is a warmongering monarchy that controls the eastern half of the continent. Lindbalm is a hub of airship travel and is nestled on the plateau to the southwest. Both countries are populated by a mix of humans, humanoid and anthropomorphic animals. Bermensia, a kingdom showered in endless rain, is to the northwest. Clyra, a neighbouring region that seceded from Bermensia due to the latter's appreciation of war, are both inhabited by an anthropomorphic rat-like race with a fondness for dance and spear fighting. Along with the main continents of Gaia, players will also get to explore the outer, lost and forgotten continents that include Condopeti, the home of the dwarves, the Black Mage Village, a hidden settlement for sentient magical drones, Medain Sari, once home to a near-extinct race of horned humanoid summoners who could conjure magical entities called Edilons, and the Life Tree, which dispenses a mist to other continents through its roots. This mist stimulates the fighting instinct in humanoids and contributes to Gaia's bloody history. Players take the role of Zidane Trabal, a member of a group of bandits called Tantalus, who are masquerading as a theatre troupe. Whilst in Alexandria, they kidnap Garnet Till Alexandros XVII, alias Dagger, the Princess of Alexandria, by order of Sid Fabul. There's always a Sid. Garnet does not resist, for she was always planning on fleeing to warn Sid of Queen Bran's increasingly erratic behaviour. Vivi Ornita, a young, timid black mage with an existential crisis, Albert Steiner, a brash Alexandrian knight captain and loyal servant of Prince Garnet, joined the party during the escape. En route to Lindbaum, the group discovered that Bran is using a village to manufacture a soulless black mage soldiers that looks similar to Vivi. In Lindbaum, Sid confirms that he hired the group to protect Garnet from Bran's newfound aggression. After learning that Alexandria has invaded Bermensia with the Black Mages, Zidane and Vivi team up with Freya Crescent, a Bermensian dragoon searching for her lost love to investigate, whilst Garnet and Steiner secretly return to Alexandria to reason with Bran. Other members of your party include Kina Quen, a Q whose master wants him, her to travel the world so that he, she, will learn about cuisine. Eco Carol, a young girl living in Medain Sari, and along with Garnet, one of the last two summoners. And Amarant Coral, a bounty hunter hired to return Garnet to Alexandria. Other characters of note, other than Sid, the charismatic regent of Lindbaum, there's always a Sid, are Queen Bram, Garnet's mother and the power hungry queen of Alexandria, General Beatrix, the powerful leader of the female knights of Alexandria. Garland, an elderly Terran male tasked with saving the world, and the antagonist Kuja. Hey you! Can't be bothered to learn how to code your own website? The idea of spending hours learning Ant Tapner, Dreamweaver or Composer just not interesting to you? Plus you've told that really cute girl in marketing that you know how to make websites? Just fake it with Squarespace! Squarespace is a website building platform that aims to simplify web design. Do you like unexpected changes? Squarespace makes changes to make the website creation experience better for their customers. Unfortunately, those changes may change your website in ways that conflict with your past design choices. Without advance notice, you may also find yourself scrambling to fix what wasn't broken before. Want a multilingual e-commerce experience? Multiple languages isn't a feature offered by Squarespace. Very few SEO options, the inability to automatically optimise your images, and the ability to filter blog posts. All these features and more could keep you up at night rather than going for a drink with that cute girl from marketing if you'd only just spent a few hours each evening learning how basic coding works. I might not be sponsored, but what you can do is subscribe to this channel, click the bell, and leave me a comment down below so that I know people are watching. In Final Fantasy IX, much like the Final Fantasies that had come before it on the PlayStation, the player navigates through the game world, exploring areas and interacting with non-playable characters on pre-rendered backgrounds, representing towns and dungeons, known as the field screen in Final Fantasy IX. Final Fantasy IX introduces the field icon, an exclamation mark appearing over the lead character's head, signalling an item or sign that is nearby that the player can interact with. To save you game progress or restore life energy, rather than a static animated icon from Final Fantasy 7 and 8, players speak with Moogles, where they can also purchase items. Moogles can be contacted on the world map with an item called a Moogle Flute, and Moogles may request that players deliver letters to other Moogles via MoogleNet. Players may also receive letters from non-playable characters. Final Fantasy IX offers a new approach to town exploration with the introduction of Active Time Events, ATE. These allow the player to view events unfolding at different locations, 
providing character development, special items and prompts for key story altering decisions. ATEs are occasionally used to simultaneously control two teams when the party is divided to solve puzzles and navigate mazes. The players move from location to location on the world map. This is a three dimensional downsized representation of Final Fantasy IX's world represented from a top down perspective. Much the same as the world maps in Final Fantasy 7 and 8, players may freely move around the world map unless the terrain restricts them, such as bodies of water or mountain ranges. To access these areas, players can either ride a chocobo, sail a boat or ride an airship. As in all previous Final Fantasy installments, travel, be it on the world map or field screen, is often interrupted by random enemy encounters. When the player encounters an enemy, the game enters the battle screen, with the player on one side of the screen and the enemy on the other. Each battle uses active time battle, which was first seen in Final Fantasy IV. The character's command list is presented in a window opposite the ATB gauge at the bottom left of the screen. While all characters can physically attack the enemy or use items from the player's inventory, they also possess unique abilities. For example, the thief Zidane can steal items from the enemy, Echo and Garnet can summon Eldolons to aid the party, and Vivi can use black magic. As each character sustains damage, the gauge fills up, and when it's full, that character will enter trance mode, similar to the limit breaks used in Final Fantasy VII. The character's strength is amplified and the player can select a special attack commands. Also in the configuration screen, players can change the battle style from normal to custom, which allows two players to control any combination of characters during the battle. However, two controllers must be plugged into the PlayStation, giving something of a two-player mode. At the end of each successful battle, the player is rewarded with experience points. These accumulate until the character gains experience levels. When characters level up, the player's party of characters' statistics for their attributes permanently increase. Winning battles also awards the player's money, gil, Terra Master playing cards, items and ability points, AP. Unlike the previous two Final Fantasy entries, Final Fantasy IX revived the concept of character classes. These classes designate the character's role in battle. E.g. Steiner is a knight and is the only character that can use sword skills, and Zidane is a thief and is the only character that can steal from enemies. Also, weapons and armour include special character abilities, and once the character accumulates enough ability points in battle, the abilities become usable without having to keep the item or armour equipped. Additionally, as well as granting abilities, the equipment in Final Fantasy IX determines the statistical growth of the character at that time of levelling up. Abilities are classified into action and support categories. Action abilities, magic, spells and special moves, and support abilities provide functions that remain effective indefinitely throughout the battle. What have we got to go on? Excuse me, Cornish passerby, could you direct me to Phil's Fish and Chip Shop? Aye, lad, you go down this street until you get to the trout shop, then you take a right, until you get a Cliff's Cream shop, then you take a left, and you go right down there, and there you'll find Phil's Fish and Chip Shop. Thank you, here, take this for your troubles. Oh, oh, kick at the ankle, oh, just what it always wanted, oh. Hello, I'd like to try the local delicacy. Certainly, sir. Mm. Delicious. What is it? It is a drink made from local fruits, processed to a syrupy sweetness by adding herbs and spices. I like to call it Phil's Special Syrup. What would I call it? Syrup of figs. Ooh. It wouldn't be a Final Fantasy game without a minigame, and Final Fantasy IX's minigame is Terra Master, a card game that can be played with various non-playable characters NPCs, throughout the game. Players assemble a deck of five cards, which they gather by finding them in chests, given as a reward or earned by fighting monsters. Each card has various arrows, which point to the four sides and four corners of the card, and various stats that vary between cards, with rarer cards being more powerful. 
players take it in turns to strategically place cards on a 4x4 playing grid, based on the available directions. Battles can occur when a player places a card next to another card, depending on where the player places it. If the defending card has no arrows, whilst the attacking card has an arrow pointed towards it, that card is placed under the player's control. When two arrows meet each other, the cards do battle, based on their points value, with the losing card coming under the winning player's control, sometimes triggering combos that put multiple cards in the winner's control. After all the cards are played, the winner is the player who has the most cards under their control with a draw occurring if they have the same number of cards. The winning player may choose a card from the opponent's deck out of the ones that they put under their control. If the winning player scores a perfect win, however, in which all 10 cards are put under their control, they win all 5 cards from the opponent's deck. And finally, the music of Final Fantasy IX. It was written by series regular Nobu Uematsu, and Uematsu is said to have spent 12 months producing 160 pieces for Final Fantasy IX, 140 of which ended up in the game. Umatsu cited medieval music as a great influence on the score of Final Fantasy IX. He aimed for a simple and warm atmosphere that incorporated unusual instruments like the kazoo. During discussion with the game's director, Hiroyuki Ito, Umatsu was asked to compose themes for the eight main characters, along with an exciting battle track, a gloomy danger invoking track, and around ten other tracks. Umatsu was prone to travel breaks in Europe whilst writing the music. To gain inspiration, he is said to have spent time admiring ancient architecture in places like Germany. The high fantasy undertones in Final Fantasy IX allow for a wider spectrum of musical styles and moods, unlike the stark realism of its predecessors 7 and 8. Umatsu incorporated several motifs from older Final Fantasy games into the score, such as the original battle music intro, a reworked volcano theme from Final Fantasy, and the pandemonium theme from Final Fantasy II. Tantalus's band is also heard playing Rufus's welcoming ceremony from Final Fantasy VII near the beginning of the game. Umatsu has stated on several occasions that Final Fantasy IX is his favourite score. Melodies of Life is the theme song to Final Fantasy IX, and it shares its main melody with pieces frequently used in the game itself, such as the Overworld theme and the lullaby sung by Garnet. filming it's not difficult to get a copy of Final Fantasy IX and if you're new to the series Final Fantasy IX is a brilliant place to start although I will admit it's probably not the best place to start if you're new to RPGs or indeed JRPGs. Final Fantasy IX remains one of the series most loved entries and just like the entries that came before and after it its soundtrack is one that can be enjoyed both inside and outside of the game. Final Fantasy IX tells a solid story, although I will say that if you are a fan of the series you'll probably pick up on some story threads that they've borrowed from previous games. In true JRPG fashion, a standard playthrough of the game will take you around about 40 hours, and if you're prone to doing side quests you can expect to spend about 54 hours in the game. However, if you're a completionist, expect to spend at least 80 to 84 hours in the game. Ah, so, Special Agent, we meet at last! Oh, where am I? Halfway down page four. Oh, thank you. In a disused fish shop, five miles outside of Luz. You'll never get away with this, you unscrupulous twit. What have you done with Ant and Deck? They are downstairs in my private laboratory. I'm conducting an experiment with them, you see. I'm going to take their brains and remove them, and then replace them with brains of chimpanzees. I'm going to send them back to ITV. Superficially, they will be the same, but they will be incapable of human thought or reason. It'll never work. It works with Laura Whitmore. You're mad. I'm not mad. You're mad. I'm not mad. Don't call me mad. That's what they used to call me at school when I went to the Monmouth School for Girls. Isn't that a girls' school? Yes, I'm not that mad. But I was different from the other boys, you see. I was good at science. I dreamt of crossbreeding species. I once crossbred a goat and a budgerigar. They said it couldn't be done, but I did it. I called it a budgery goat. Great yellow airy thing it was, used to flat round the place, headbutting people. There you all laughed at me. Except the budgery goat, no sense of humour, those creatures. And I sought revenge, so I thought I'm going to change all of the world's highest entertainers into chimpanzees. Oh, you've made a good start from what I've seen then. But you can't do it with Ant and Deck. Ah, and who's going to stop me? I am. Within this innocuous looking sword I have in my hand, in fact, contains a walking stick. 
one false move and I shall hit you on the knee with it. All right, all right, I know when I'm beat. But you haven't heard the last of Dr. Otto. M.A. failed. Goodbye! And with that, he leapt out of the window, signed a contract to appear in his own series on BBC Three, and was never seen again. Now, ladles and jelly spoons, may I welcome you to the 19th episode of Retrospective Reviews. Here in Middle England, we aim to bring you an epic tale that will bring a tear to your eye, a lump to your throat and a pain to your neck. Shudder at scenes of naked violence like this. Say that. No. Say that. No. Now say that. No. No, 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 no. Oh, please. I insist. No, no, no. Yes, all human life is here, and Dickie from Richard York's Wargaming to boot! It's not a bad idea, actually. For those of you that are new, here is the story so far. In last month's episode, we left winsome, curvaceous Kai Mathy held captive by the mysterious gynaecologist Otto the Ocelot and his gnarled, gritty bodyguard Ninja Chloe. Inch by inch, the ceiling is descending, whilst a drink-crazed crocodile, played by Tiger Tom in a skin, snaps at a rope that holds Kai Mathy above a vat of tepid chicken fat, played by Terry the Terrier. Suddenly, the door creaks open, and in the doorway stands a ghastly apparition, a monstrous nightmare creature of hideous aspect. It shuffles forward and speaks! Hello and welcome to another of Dickie's videos. So come with us now down memory lane as we bring you this month's retrospective review. <laughs> Tenchu 2 Birth of the Stealth Assassins is an action-adventure stealth game for the original Sony PlayStation. Developed by Acquire and published by Activision, it was released in North America on the 15th of August 2000, the 8th of September in the European territories, and November in Japan. August 2020 marks its 20th anniversary. A follow-up to the 1998 game, Tenchu Stealth Assassins, the game's story is a prequel to the story told in the first game. Tenchu 2 received favourable reviews and is held by fans as one of the better games in the series. Jim Preston reviewed the game for Next Generation, rating it 4 out of 5 stars, stating that Tenchu 2 doesn't surpass the original, but does succeed in capturing its smooth gameplay, and despite some minor weaknesses, the game is without doubt exceedingly cool. If you'd like to know more about the first game, Tenchu Stealth Assassins, then please do check out my retrospective review that I did when the game turned 20 years old back in 2018. There'll be a link in the description down below as well as at the end of the video. Tenchu 2's basic gameplay remains much the same as the first game. The player controls one of two ninja, Rikimaru or Ayame, as well as a third ninja, Tetsumaru, who can be chosen as a playable character once you've completed both Rikimaru and Ayame's missions. Whilst the stealth part of the first game was what made it so popular, one of its main complaints was that it was far too short. Tenchu 2 certainly can't be called that. Both Ayame and Rikimaru have 11 individual missions, and Tetsumaru, once available to play, has an additional 7 of his own. While some of Rikimaru and Ayame's missions take place at the same location, objectives, boss and enemy layouts, and even some level layouts are different, as well as being set at different times of day. Players once again use a range of ninja tools and equipment to complete missions and eliminate enemies. Once again you begin a mission with your trusty grappling hook, that has seen a few improvements, most notably that it will only hook onto the edge of objects this time, to stop you from accidentally grappling onto the ceiling. Ooh, ooh, ooh. <sighs> How did she not see me? As well as the grappling hook, you now begin each mission with a bamboo reed for you to breathe underwater with, as you can now not only hide in water but you can also swim. This gives you the opportunity to sneak up on shore, dock and boat dwelling enemies, although you still need to be aware of the amount of noise you make whilst wading. The key meter returns at the bottom left hand corner of the screen to help you identify how close an enemy is to you, as well as indicating if you have been spotted or have alerted enemies. If the enemy hasn't seen you, you may sneak up on them and perform a silent one hit kill. Manage to remain unseen for the whole mission, and your score upon completing said mission will be much higher. And you once again earn extra items. Ninja armor, the resurrection leaf, fire arrows, gas bomb, a sleeping potion, and a special dust to blind your enemies, to name a few. And finally, you now have the ability to search dead bodies as well as drag them away, so they won't be discovered by other patrolling guards. Ah. I was going to go to Cornwall for a few days rest. 
and I wanted to take some reading matter with me. You know, there's nothing worse than being in loose with nothing to read. So I went into my local bookshop to see what they had. Come in, sir. Have a look around. Ah, thank you. Are you looking for something between hard covers or something you can slip into your pocket? We have an enormous selection of livres de poches, that is, your actual French for posh books. Uh, how about a classic? Can I interest you in Spencer's Fairy Queen? I don't think so. He's not interested in mine. How about a nice Moroccan-bound Poe, featuring such masterpieces of the macabre as the Telltale Heart, the Fall of Usher, or his masterpiece Poe's Raven? Is he? Never listen to gossip, dearie. Any Shakespeare? Oh, I've done my own edition of Shakespeare, you know, but I've, I've rewritten it and updated it. Uh, here, here it is. Uh, as they like it. Shouldn't that be as you like it? Not really, but live and let live, I say. In 16th century feudal Japan, the Azuma ninja have served the House of Goda for countless generations. Now, three young ninja, Tetsumaru, Rikimaru and Ayame, must protect Lord Goda Matsunoshin against a coup d'etat attempt and a mysterious ninja group calling themselves the Burning Dawn, consisting of their leader and four lords of the Burning Dawn. To make matters worse, the recently made leader of the Azuma ninja, Tetsumaru, goes missing during a battle with Lady Kagame. It is later revealed that Tetsumaru has lost his memory, and as a result of this has now took on the mantle of Serayu, the Blue Dragon, and allied himself with the Burning Dawn. Okay, spoiler warnings, I am going to spoil the end of the first Tenchu game, you have been warned. At the end of Tenchu Stealth Assassins, Rikimaru makes the ultimate sacrifice so that Princess Kiku and Ayame can escape a collapsing mine. This gave developers one of two choices when coming up with ideas for the second game. Either create a prequel, or do something that comic books have a fondness for doing, and looking at the afterlife as some kind of revolving door. The developers decided on the latter, and we find ourselves with a younger Ricky Maru that is not the voice of a 25 year old, and Ayame, as they complete their ninja training. The first game had an okay plot, true, it didn't really have a connecting narrative other than foiling the plans of Onikage. The first game focused more on standout moments. In comparison, the story of Tenchu 2 is impressive and quite compelling. It is told through in-game and CG cutscenes. Also, you won't be rewarded with the whole story until you complete the game with all three playable characters. Graphically, the game is a step up from the first instalment. The first big graphical improvement, come change, is that much more of the game takes place outside and during the day. Adding little visual touches such as the rain effects in the war camp and motion blur effects found in the silent kill sequences were a nice touch, not to mention the levels are much bigger. Although this does show up the limitations of Sony's little grey box, the first game was set entirely at night and conveniently that hid the PlayStation's limitations. Interesting then that the PlayStation's limitations were one of the forces behind the game's playstyle of sneaking and being careful. When Tenchu 2 was released, the PlayStation 1 was in its golden years, the Dreamcast had come out a year earlier and the PlayStation 2 was only a month away in European territories and already available in Japan. Whilst character models were given more detail in Tenchu 2 with fully animated mouths and facial expressions, and once again characters were well represented in their choice of traditional clothing as well as displaying the correct human form and movement, motion capture, unlike the first game, was entirely done by one man returning from the first game to Somo Kitagawa. It has been noted that environments look kind of rough around the edges, making the game look somewhat unfinished. Coupled with bad draw distances and occasional slowdown do drag the game down tab. Another one of Tenchu 2's drawbacks are the camera controls, as they were more suited to sneaking, assassinating and fighting in close quarters. When it comes to fighting outside, the camera does often undercut you at critical times, especially during boss encounters, and Tenchu 2 has far more of them. Not only that, but the boss battles were a big step up from the first game. Be it the monstrous mission of killing every enemy on the level before heading off to face the end level boss, or fighting one boss after another. The difficulty curve of Tenchu 2 is probably a good sign of why the series was sold off to From Software of Dark Souls fame, and also why Sekiro Shadows Die Twice was not only originally planned to be a game in the Tenchu series, but what got fans thinking it would be a Tenchu game from its initial teaser.
talking of From Software, I actually discovered whilst researching this episode that back in 2014, From Software allowed Tenchu to be made into a stage show. Please do excuse this bad translation of the plot. The story takes place after Ricky Maru became head of the Eastern Ninja clan, with female ninja Ayame by his side. During a fight between assassins Rin and Ricky Maru, a ninja whose shoulders a painful past, Ayame goes missing. The country begins to shake when the Goda clan is faced with a dilemma. The Goda clan sends an emergency message. Where is Princess Kiku and what is she thinking? What will she do as the princess of an entire country? Do you need to shave, but the idea of buying shaving supplies from your local supermarket fills you with fear and dread? Oh no, what will Mildred at the checkout think if she sees me buying a razor? Get a Harry's subscription! Oh, brilliant. Now people will never know that I'm not actually a wizard that can make unsightly hair magically... Oh! Back in the day, men couldn't always shave. Back in another day, men had to shave. Somewhere in between is a very nice thing. A choice. Oi! Piss off out of my bathroom! Just a little. Harry's. One of the game's most acclaimed features in Tenchu 2 was the level editor. It gave players the tools they needed to create their own levels. It also had 15 extra missions that people could not only play, but also use to help them understand the level editor and use it as a starting off point for their own missions. Whilst basic, this feature had been present in the second release of the first game in Japan, and it was so popular that it led to a third re-release of the first game with a hundred of the best fan-made levels. The level editor was also popular in the West and apparently spawned a tournament in North America, although at the time of writing I still can't find any hard proof of that. Sadly, the mission editor did not become a stable of the series, and its last inclusion was on the PSP installment Tenshu Time of the Assassins. Finally, music. Once again, Norayuki Asakura returns to compose the soundtrack for the game and has done another stellar job. Although there are some subtle differences, gone are the soft, subtle backdrop pieces that made each level in the first game so recognisable. Instead, each mission is presented on the backdrop of ambient sounds of crickets and arrows flying through the air. Asakura's soundtrack comes in only at certain points in the game. Asakura has gone for a far more traditional soundtrack that in a lot of ways is far more dramatic and in some cases a little bit loud. Because of this I don't think the soundtrack has the same impact as the first games. That doesn't stop it being an absolute joy to listen to. In fact I'm listening to it as I'm writing this. Fans wanted a new Tenchu and that's exactly what they got. Not only more of the same brilliant gameplay, but more missions, and more story and more features with the level editor. Whilst it certainly wasn't perfect, was much harder and did unfortunately make the ageing PS1 look its age in light of the Dreamcast and the PlayStation 2, with 11 missions for Rikimaru and Ayame along with 7 missions for Tetsumaru and 15 in the level editor giving players 44 missions and the ability to make their own, Tenchu 2 was an unprecedented amount of value for a console game that you just don't get today. Well, not for 40 quid. An average playthrough of the whole game will probably take you about 9 hours, however if you're a completionist you're probably looking at more like 20 hours. If you've never played the game and are given the opportunity I highly recommend checking it out. Or you can watch myself and Tiger Tom play through Ricky Maru's campaign here on this channel starting next week. I've recently been thinking about going on holiday and I thought well if I'm planning on going abroad I really should brush up on the languages. And as I was perusing my copy of the Cumberbund Inquirer that I buy for the word searches, I saw an advert for a language teacher on the high street, so I popped down to see what they were all about. Ah, bonjour, François. Eh, S'il vous plaît, uh, how nice to value a jolly old liquor encore? Ah, so you're a French teacher. Yes, how can I help you, visage de cure? That is your actual French for heart face. Well, I, I'd like to brush up on my Greek. Well, don't let me stop you if it gives you any pleasure. The Greek language. Ugh, 
I'm not really too hot on the Greek. I don't really know my alpha from my omega. All I really know is kebab and the Acropolis by moonlight. Sorry. Yes, I had an experience up the Acropolis. I'd, I'd rather not talk about it, but I could tell you a few things. But I'm not really a dab and at the Greek. Well, what do you specialise in? Well, I concentrate on the modern foreign languages, you know, your French, your Italian, your Spanish, and of course I do all the Chinese dialects. You've got your Cantonese, your Cochinese, your Pekingese. Pekingese? How does that sound? Would you believe woof woof? Greetings, ladles and jelly spoons. Now, before we get started, the answer to last month's questions. Question one was complete the title of the following horror films. The first was Creature from the Black. Well, of course, the answer was Lagoon and not Pool Pleasure Beach, as a certain Connor Ramsden of Scarborough suggested. <laughs> Part two of the horror movie question was The Cabinet of. Well, of course, the answer was Dr. Caligari and not, as one of you suggested, Boris Johnson. But nice try all the same, Mr. M. A. Gove of Aberdeen, Scotland. And finally, the classic film title was Gone with the Wind, and not Cricket Club Money, Mr. 237 of West Bridgeford. Or even Gone with the Lodger, suggested by Dicky from Richard York's Wargaming, when no, Today no game is made in the Can't help but feel there's some personal deep-seated grievance there. Now, for something even more revolting. Take it, Tom. Stop flaunting your calves at Ninja Clary and get on meow. with the announcement. Meow! Meow, 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 meow. <laughs> the year is 2020. The world is going through some pretty rough things right now. But here I am, still reveling in the joys that is retro video games. Since I've been gone for a while... Yeah, sorry about that. Since November 2020 marks a significant date in the video game lover's calendar, I thought that instead of looking at a game this month, we would look at a console. The PlayStation 2, a Sony home video game console developed and marketed by Sony Computer Entertainment. Whilst the console was first released in Japan on March 4th, 2000, it would see its final release in Europe and Australia in November of that year. It would be the second PlayStation in the Sony console lineup, a sixth generation system, and it would go into competition with the Sega Dreamcast that was already out in shops having been released in 1999. But not in India, who didn't see the Dreamcast release until December 2000, a full month after the PlayStation 2. The Nintendo GameCube that released worldwide late 2001 and mid 2002. And finally, Microsoft's original Xbox that would release worldwide in a smaller 2001 to 2002 window. It's pretty, uh, pretty close to cinematic quality. It's, it's unbelievable. Most notable, the PlayStation 2 is the best-selling video game console of all time, having sold over 155 million units worldwide. Before we go any further, there are people in the retro community that wouldn't consider the PS2 a retro console yet. I know the age of a game slash games console is a highly talked about topic as to whether it can be considered retro. Should we count it from the date the game slash console came out, or when it was discontinued slash out of print? Personally, I'm on the fence. I certainly wouldn't say that the PlayStation 2 is retro yet, because the last game that came out for it is only eight years old in 2020. That depends on the market. In Asia, it was the Seekers of Adulin expansion for Final Fantasy XI, launching on March the 27th, 2013. In South America, it was FIFA 14, 
which released on the 24th of September 2013, and in North America and Europe, it was Pro Evolution Soccer 2014, launching just one week before the PS4 on the 8th of November. This then was the last PlayStation 2 game ever released. But it's definitely not the new hotness anymore, or even the new hotness's older family member. It's rocketing into the video game archive vault as time thunders on. I know there are video game fans out there that will have never played on one outside of a retro booth at a trade show slash convention. But since this series is all about celebrating the 20th anniversary of all things video game related, and since I was a bit miffed that I missed the Dreamcast 20th anniversary together with my PlayStation bias, let's continue looking at the Sony PlayStation 2. After years of speculation that started sometime in 1997, Sony officially announced the PlayStation 2 on March 1st, 1999. At the time, its development was one of Sony's best kept secrets, as they had been working on the system since late 1994, just a few months after the release of the first PlayStation. The PlayStation 2, or PS2 as it's often shortened to, offered a built-in DVD player, internet connectivity, and most importantly, backwards compatibility for all of Sony PlayStation's software, as well as for its predecessor's DualShock controller. One has nice graphics, you got the people on the sideline chilling, you see them drinking their Gatorade while they're playing, and that's, I mean, how can you get any realer? Backwards compatibility is thought to be one of the factors in the PlayStation 2's initial selling strength. Because the first Sony PlayStation had sold so well, this allowed the PS2 to tap into a large install base. The PS2's main competitor was first the Sega Dreamcast, that was the first 6th generation console to be released. Ultimately, the main rivals of the PlayStation 2 were Microsoft's first Xbox console and Nintendo's GameCube. Will it take the lead in the console wars? Stick around to find out. It's game time. Sony unveiled the PlayStation 2 to the public at the Tokyo Game Show on September 20th, 1999, with a fully playable demo of Gran Turismo 3 A-Spec, at the time under the title Gran Turismo 2000, and Tekken Tag Tournament that showcased the graphical power and abilities of Sony's new console. On its dev release in Japan, sales of the console, games and accessory pulled in $250 million, and for a while it was hard to find the PlayStation 2 on retailers' shelves, as there had been manufacturing delays, leading to surge pricing on online auction websites such as eBay, that saw people pay over £1,000 for the console. How's it changing games? We sent a team to Japan for a closer look. Keep in mind that we're giving you sneak previews of games that are very early in development. Later, Sony released development kits for game developers and more PlayStation 2 units for consumers. The PS2 also started to appeal to other audiences, as its debut pricing was the same or less than a standalone DVD player, making it an affordable entry into the home theatre market. At the end of 2000, the success of the PS2 was causing problems for Sega, both competitively and financially. This was due in part to Sega deciding to continually throw money at the Sega Saturn, that was the first PlayStation's main competition. So Sega announced the discontinuation of the Dreamcast in March 2000, just 18 months after its launch in North America and Europe. This made the PlayStation 2 the only 6th generation console for over 6 months, before its first main rival, the Nintendo GameCube, would show up in shops. Shortly after, Microsoft's original Xbox was on shelves, and many predicted a close three-way battle for console dominance among the three consoles. The Xbox was the most advanced in terms of hardware, the GameCube was the least expensive, and Nintendo had amended its company policy to entice third-party developers over to the platform. The PS2 had the weakest specifications of all three. Yes, it had a head start due to its install base plus strong development commitment, not to mention the built-in DVD player that the Xbox also boasted, however, it required an adapter. But the PlayStation 2's initial games lineup was considered mediocre at best. Until late 2001, Sony has secured some exclusives for highly anticipated games, such as the Grand Theft Auto series, and Metal Gear Solid 2 Sons of Liberty. This maintained the PS2's sales momentum and held off its rivals. Over its lifetime, over 3,800 game titles have been released for the PS2. You're an efficient killer. I like that in a man. In 2002, Sony cut the price of the PlayStation 2 by $100 in the US, making it the same price as the GameCube. It had planned to cut the price in Japan as well, but waited, and eventually cut the price twice in 2003. Then globally, Sony cut the price of the PS2 again in 2006, in anticipation for the PlayStation 3. Working with Toshiba, PlayStation 2 was powered by all new technology. Whilst the PS2 did have online capabilities, Sony placed little emphasis on online gaming during its first few years, unlike the Sega Dreamcast that had very much pushed it as a feature. Initially, Dreamcast owners will only be able to use the Dreamcast network for chatting, message boards, and previews. That mindset changed with the release of the Xbox and the release of Xbox Live. Welcome to Xbox Live. I'm Matt, but you're going to know me online as Dark Master. 
I'm here to tell you all about Xbox Live. The PlayStation Network adapter was released in late 2002. Sony also advertised it heavily, and its online model had the support of Electronic Arts, who didn't release any online titles on Xbox until 2004. Playing games. So really, Xbox Live is a whole new ballgame. Come 2004, people were already talking about the next console generation, and we started seeing the PlayStation 2 enter its golden years. Stores quickly. In time for the release of Grand Theft Auto San Andreas, Sony unveiled a newer, slimmer PS2 that would be the final two models of the base PS2 to be released. The SPCH-700XX-9000X and the SPCH-3000X-500XX, if you're a nerd and you want to know. Whilst they had a bumpy release across the globe due to several issues including Sony reportedly underestimating demand resulting in a shortage in more than 1,700 stores in North America on the day before Christmas, a Russian oil tanker became stuck in the Suez Canal blocking a ship from China carrying PlayStation 2's bound for the UK, and more manufacturing issues. The final base model of the PS2 still saw sales of more than 70,000 units. Even with the release of its successor, the PlayStation 3, the PS2 remained popular well into the seventh generation, and Sony continued to produce units until 2013. In 2010, Sony introduced a TV with a built-in PlayStation 2, and new games for the console were being produced right up until the end of 2013. Repair service for the system ended in Japan on September the 7th, 2018. <laughs> Bouncer. Or simply Bouncer in Japan, a 3D side scrolling beat em up video game co developed by Squaresoft and the Dream Factory and released for the PlayStation 2 in December 2000. Not to be confused with the 2018 French Belgian action thriller film The Bouncer, starring Jean Claude Van Damme. The Bouncer was highly anticipated upon its arrival back in 2000. Not only was it Squaresoft's first game on the next generation of games consoles, Plus boasted having Shinji Hashimoto, Takashi Takita, Toetsu Nomura, and Noriko Matsueda of Final Fantasy fame working on it. It also had Sony's hype machine behind it, showing off its stunning visuals, superior gameplay, and with a truly cinematic presentation, it was in many ways perceived to be the true first next generation fighting game on the PlayStation 2. As one of the marquee titles in the first batch of PlayStation 2 games, it was met with poor sales and mixed reviews. The Bouncer tells the story of three bouncers in the fictional Edge City, on a rescue mission to save their young friend from the Mikado Group, a solar technology megacorporation owned by a megalomaniac Duragon C. Mikado. The plot unfolds differently depending on which character the player chooses for specific gameplay sequences. When it was first announced at the Tokyo Game Show in 1999 that Square was working on three PlayStation 2 titles, it was assumed that the bouncer was going to be Ergies 2. Early footage showed three main characters, a woman and two men, fighting a gang of ninjas in a cafe. Later that year it was reported that the game was not a sequel but an original story that would be one of the PlayStation 2's launch titles. Later in the year Square showed off Square's seamless action battle system that would allow players to go from adventure sequence to fighting sequence without the intermittent cutscene or FMV. Adventure elements would flow effortlessly into street brawls with as many as 10 other characters. If we're not doing anything, it means a bar's doing just fine, right, Sion? 
The gaming press at the time were clearly very enthusiastic about the look of the game, saying that it had the look of something straight out of Hollywood. The Bouncer was the first game to use Dolby Digital 5.1 surround sound, not only for the FMVs but gameplay itself. And whilst gameplay was partially derived from Dream Factory's Urgies and the Tobal games, graphically the atmosphere was developed with the use of filters and lighting. Personally I've always thought the game had a very Final Fantasy look to it and you can see how the game has influenced later Final Fantasy games on the PlayStation 2. Go today you first came to this bar and started that giant brawl fest. Then that means today's your first anniversary as a bouncer. Here. The selling point of an action game is the feeling of oneness with the characters, but on the other hand, action games lack characterization and story development. RPGs cover most of these narrative factors, but command input RPGs sacrifice the tempo, thrill factor and feeling of intimacy. The bouncer system is a combination of the best elements of these two genres. You ready? The game would have three available modes of play, story, versus and survival, and would expect the story mode to take roughly seven to eight hours to complete thoroughly. Uh, uh, no. Whilst I will say that if you're a completionist then yes you could well be looking at seven hours of playtime, a standard playthrough of the game will take you a good one and a half hours at best, three hours, let's say three and a half hours if you're exploring all the other available modes. However, after Square only showed a 10 second clip at the Spring Tokyo Game Show only months before its intended release, some journalists rumoured that there may be a problem behind the scenes. This was made worse at another trade show later in the year where Square showed off new footage but did not provide a playable demo. Finally, in late 2000, co-developers Dream Factory reported they were having difficulty working with the PlayStation 2 hardware and that the game had been pushed back to January 2001 in North America. Square announced a Japanese release date of December 23, 2000 and on December 18th they confirmed a North American release date of January 30th, 2001, although this was quickly pushed back to March. Combat controls in the Bouncer are not unlike those found in the Tobal or Urgis games. Buttons signify high, middle and low attacks, whilst others are used for blocking and special moves. It's a simple set of controls that is easy to feel out if this is your first time playing this type of game. During gameplay, players have a health meter, which if drained means the player dies. Players often have a limited number of guard points at their disposal, but the on-screen HUD does not show this. The number of guard points diminishes as the player blocks, and if they are utterly gone, the player can no longer block oncoming attacks. Combat in the game makes use of ragdoll physics, which allows characters to be thrown a few feet into the air, making it easy to juggle enemies by hitting them repeatedly. Enemies may also be hurled or otherwise hit against each other, causing both of them to take damage at once. I feel like it didn't feel like I was actually doing anything. <laughs> I wasn't fighting anyone. Oh, these are the, the black shirted uh, security guys. They are tougher. Yeah. The Bouncer is structured as a series of short gameplay segments interspersed with cinematic cutscenes that tell the game's story. One of the game's biggest selling points was the ACS system, Active Character Selection System, that gives the player the choice of protagonist to play in the following gameplay segment. Whoever you choose, the other characters are controlled by the AI. For the most part, combat in the Bouncer is made of you, the active player, in hand-to-hand -hand combat with a group of enemies using various basic and special moves that the player has unlocked. Every so often the AI controlled bouncers will do a taunt, alerting the player to press the right buttons to activate a team attack that damages all enemies on screen at that time, although this does not work in boss encounters. In some sections of the game, however, you are tasked with objectives that does not involve fighting, such as finding a keycard, running through hallways to avoid being caught, and even one section dressing up as a Mikado soldier learning a set of weird signals to get through undetected. This encounter is hilarious and one of a kind. Gameplay sections end when the player has either defeated all of the enemies in that area, achieved a set goal, or defeated a boss character. Yeah. Carry a soldier. At the end of each engagement, the player is awarded BP points, bouncer points, for that character. It can be used to level up the character's health, power and defence stats, as well as unlocking new fighting moves. The more points you spend on each character allows them to level up, with levels marked out of grade G to grade A, and finally an S rank. Ever wanted to know why so many video games rank up to S? Well, Game Ranks have done a video that's well worth watching on the subject. There is a description in the link down below. Please go and give it a watch and tell them that I sent you.
As the story mode is quite short, there are two other modes to sink your teeth into. The first is a single player survival mode. Every time you survive a round, the game gets more difficult. If you took damage in the previous stages, at the start of each new stage, your health bar remains depleted. In total, there are 10 stages in survival mode and a total of 50 enemies to fight through. Lastly, there is multiplayer versus mode. The bouncer supports the PlayStation 2's multi-tap and can allow up to 8 people to play on one console. However, the bouncer only supports up to 4 players to play the Battle Royale mode. The mode can also be played in single player with AI controlled opponents. At its core, the bouncer is a multiplayer beat em up. You fight against gangs of enemies on screen at the same time, which don't get me wrong is fun, but maybe just not as incredible as the Sony hype machine was painting it out to be. I'll happily admit that I was at the time blown away by the graphics and gameplay, but coming back to it now has made me realise that the bouncer is just a very pretty 2.5 brawler with some bells and whistles and questionable storyline. Yeah about that. The main focus of the game is its story mode, which is really just a third of the whole game. The game tells the story of three friends who work as bouncers at one of the city's bars. Sion, Ko and Vault appear as very fabulously dressed with very distinct styles, but rather slack bouncers. And whilst the game tries to paint them as low key, Vault looks like this. I'm not sure if those horns are real or some type of body modification, but it's not like you're going to miss this guy in a crowd. Also working at the bar is Sion's roommate slash girlfriend, Dominique. Hi, sorry, me again. Okay, according to the game's manual, it says that Dominique is 15 years old. Not only does that bring into question how she's able to work in a bar, but also how is she living on her own with Sion, who, according to the game's manual, is... Uh... 19 years old! Suddenly, out of the blue, Dominique is kidnapped by an equally fabulously dressed group of Special Forces goons, who drop from the sky, run, jump and fight like they are straight out of Naruto. At the time the game came out, Naruto wasn't really a thing. I remember a lot of reviews at the time liking the Mikado Special Forces to the characters from the movie Crouching Tiger Hidden Dragon. So, rather than calling the police like normal people, the three friends set out to rescue Dominique. The story mode is at least unique, and the ability to choose Sion, Ko or Vault for each enemy encounter is an interesting way to tell the story. It isn't until you've played the game a few times that you notice a rather staged setup for each section. Watch a cutscene, fight, save, watch another cutscene, fight, save, and so on until you complete the game. And play the game a few times is exactly what you'll have to do to get a full conclusion to the story. One thing the developers had on their mind when making this game was replayability, which was very much the order of the day for video games developed back in the 90s and early 2000s. They wanted you to play the game over and over again and get every bit of content out of it, whereas today they would just sell you that content at a premium price. At the very least you'll need to play through the game three times to get the whole elaborate story, once for each of the playable bouncers, Vault, Ko and Sion. Whilst I'm sure that in development meetings that sounded like a good idea, and may have sounded cool at the time, after your first playthrough you'll know about 95% of the whole story, and getting the last 5% from two full playthroughs of the story is really just excruciatingly tedious. This thing's probably carrying rocket fuel for that shuttle launch everyone's been talking about. As a closing note on gameplay, let's talk about those camera angles. For the most part they're fine. The smooth, tracked, isometric camera perspective isn't a problem for about 90% of the game, but that 10% is infuriating and horrible, mostly because it's when you're in a boss fight or in a small, tight space, and worst of all, when you're in a boss fight in a small, tight space. The camera angles are the one thing that stick out as a reminder that the game was rushed to market and is not only irritating, but something that you wouldn't expect from Squaresoft. For its time, The Bouncer was indeed the best looking game on the PlayStation 2. Beautifully polished and elaborate environments coupled with classic Squaresoft character design, you really notice the inspiration they'd taken from the Final Fantasy games, but on a far larger scale. From Vault's horns through to Ko's tattoos to Sion's spiky hair, the Bouncer's trio of heroes are elaborate unto themselves. This was by far the most detailed and realistic game that Squaresoft had ever done before. Hair and clothing moved with a sense that they are abiding by real physics, something that console players had not really seen before. Baggy clothes bounced and swayed, and long hair flowed and moved, rather than looking like it was gelled solid to the characters' heads. Guess there's no point in hiding. The overall look of the bouncer isn't just down to Squaresoft's powerhouse of talent behind it. The Dream Factory added a glossy filter that smooths everything out. Whilst you could say that it makes the game look like it had a Vaseline filter on it at all times, back in the early 2000s this look was very much in fashion. 
the bouncer was certainly the first game to pull this look off with success as it eradicated any aliasing or flickering from the game. It also made it almost indistinguishable to tell when the game jumped from in-game graphics to CG. Sure, by today's standards you can tell the difference in a nanosecond, but back in the day this wowed the game playing public. If you want to see what I mean, and you don't have a PlayStation 2 and a copy of the Bouncer to hand, and worse still, you didn't get a chance to play this back in 2000 and witness the wow factor for yourself, fear not. Myself, Ninja Chloe and Tiger Tom will be playing through the whole game starting next week. Be sure to subscribe, click the bell icon to be notified when the videos go up, and let's enjoy this game together. A little bit there, because he's kind of right. It's like, wouldn't you just be trying to get out as well? Laden with guitar-heavy rock and Eastern-influenced songs, the music in The Bouncer is very good, and so it should be. Scored by Noriko Matsueda and Takahoshi Iguchi, it contains several vocal themes, such as the Japanese ending theme song Furthermore, performed by Leiko Noda. And the English language theme song Love is the Gift, performed by Shanice Wilson. Takashi Takita said that the lyrics of Love is the Gift heard during the closing credits signify the game's overall theme. The soundtrack is well constructed and can easily be enjoyed out of the game. There were two separate soundtracks released for the game, a North American version and a Japanese version, the latter being the definitive release on two CDs with a total of 29 tracks. Can I say Voice acting in the game is another matter though. Both English and Japanese voices and subtitles are featured in the game, however because originally the game was planned to be released in North America close to the Japanese release, the English voice acting was recorded first and set as the main default, with the Japanese voices incorporated later and could be changed in the menu. This was to give the game more of a DVD style and quality. Also because of this, this was the first game to feature Dolby 5.1 surround sound. For its time the voice work is okay, looking at it through today's standards though it is past funny and is quite painful to listen to, whilst you can in part blame the script for being very cheesy. Looks like he's got a heart after all, especially when it comes to her. <laughs> no kidding. The constant pausing between character interactions are not only very telling of the game's age, but just make the game even harder to take seriously. Despite the high profile team behind it, the Sony hype and its high anticipation from the game playing public, the bouncer was seen as a disappointment by many and considered mediocre at best. It was not a commercial success and only made it to the 53rd highest selling game of that year across all systems. It looked amazing but played poorly, it had a banging soundtrack but the script and vocals left a lot to be desired. Whilst it does have its fans out there, I don't see this game getting the remake treatment anytime soon or even a remaster. Personally, I do have a soft spot for the game, but only from a nostalgic point of view. It was one of the first games I played on the PlayStation 2 and I was amazed that games could look and sound this good. As for the gameplay itself, I actually quite enjoyed it. Whilst I did get frustrated trying to get the whole story, that was all put aside by the enjoyment I got out of playing the game with friends in three-on-one brawls in the game's multiplayer. If you've made it to the end of the video then thank you so much. The Bouncer is a game that I've been looking forward to covering on Retro Reviews and I hope that comes across. If you have enjoyed the video please be sure to leave me a like and if you're feeling inclined to say hello or anything else in the comments down below then do so. Check out the rest of the channel, subscribe and if you want to see what all the Bouncer fuss is about then come back next week to see myself, Tiger Tom and Ninja Chloe play through the whole game over the festive period. TGS!